Stop number four, final race of the virtual BC Cup presented by Cobotics as today the riders conquer the Mount Sequoia Road Race on land from the Joe Martin Stage Race, uh, part of the Echelon Racing League earlier this year. Going to be an interesting one as we get ready for our fourth weekend of racing, Ryan. Uh, this has become a little bit of a tradition for me here Saturday morning. It's uh, exciting to see a lot of our riders back uh, for our fourth race of the day today but this one gonna be a lot different I think this long road race uh, we had sort of three very different uh, stops on the virtual BC Cup and then I think uh, everyone kind of settled on this long road race is uh, maybe the most fun racing to watch so this one should be really interesting today yes absolutely we've had as you said a lot of different courses on this uh, in this series but this may be the differentest we're finally doing a point-to-point -point stage race. This is a 72-kilometer course with 1,000 meters of gain built, and it's based on the second stage of the Joe Martin Stage Race, an annual event in Fayetteville, Arkansas. So founded in 1978 as the Fayetteville Classic, Joe Martin was its long standing director, and after he died in 1989, the race was renamed for him. We can see the profile the uh, riders are going to be doing today. So we can see a couple of major climbs and 
and certainly we're to see how that'll play out in our first two races this morning, which will be the three and cap uh, events. Yeah, you see the first uh, big climb of the day comes pretty quickly, and uh, I think it's serious enough that it might split some riders up if there's a group of uh, a large group that uh, survives at the beginning. Maybe that uh, that first one will cause the break of the day. Probably not a question of if, but when, especially in the bigger races, you see a break. Uh, I think just on these long days, there's uh, there's so many opportunities for riders to find splits that uh, I think we'll see uh, multiple selections, especially in the bigger races later on in the day. Second uh, big climb comes, uh, I guess I guess there's only two climbs. There is one sort of in the middle. There's a little bit of an uphill grade you see there, but uh, and then the finishing climb at the end. But there's a, a one more little lump, about 20K from the finish there with a nice long downhill uh, run into the final climb of the day, which is absolutely decisive. Uh, I'm thinking ones and twos across the line uh, when they hit the finish today. Yeah. <clears throat> yeah, definitely going to be a uh, an interesting course, and the riders will have to be very attentive. I mean, unlike what you get with a uh, with a circuit course, they're not going to be used to any of these. Uh, most of these riders will be seeing them for the first time uh, each time uh, we roll through them today. But, so again, uh, multiple categories of racing uh, here at the BC Cup as uh, we start the day with our Category Four. Open field, uh, open to any new racers. This is sort of our uh, our beginning level of racing, if you will. Then the category twos and threes will be racing together later on today, 10 o'clock Pacific time on the West Coast. <clears throat> Excuse me, before our pro women, uh, along with the Cat Ones at uh, 11 o'clock this morning Pacific time. And then we'll wrap up with our pro men last race of the day at high noon on the West Coast. So four sets of races today, but a couple of them will have multiple categories that will be scored different, like uh, the category two threes, and this one, the category fours, and open first up today. Yes, indeed. So we'll be able to start off. These races will run over two hours for the earlier categories. Uh, it's the usual thing on this circuit. We can guess that the uh, cap fours will be running at just about 30 hour, which will uh, take them through to about uh, 10.30 local time here on the West Coast. Um, the Cat 2-3s will start a little before that, so we'll have quite a few races to show you at some, some points. Where Brad and I are taking bets on whether the Cat 2-3s will finish before the Cat 1, the Men's Pro Series uh, starts, uh, but we will find out. I guess like so any race... Showing... Uh, it... Also in virtual racing, the promoters have to figure out uh, the optimal timing, trying to time the, the distance and time of a race. So uh, sometimes we have big gaps, sometimes we have small gaps in between the start of the race. But I think they've done a pretty good job with the schedule, adjusted it uh, a little bit today. So uh, hopefully we can uh, uh, get as much racing in for, uh, for all our categories as we can. Obviously, we'll be able to cut back and forth between the two throughout the day if uh, we have any overlap. So uh, we're going to watch all of our uh, at least our uh, podium finishers through the finish line in all of our categories. And hopefully that four has got the memo about the uh, racing starting 30 minutes earlier today than it has in the weeks uh, so that uh, we'll have a full field in about uh, five minutes when we begin the first race of the day. Let's talk a little bit about the platform and uh, sort of the, the world of virtual racing for anyone just joining for uh, the fourth and final stop. Rogers are racing on a platform called RGT today. It's uh, a, uh, I guess, virtual racing platform is uh, the easiest way to describe it. They have their bikes hooked up to what are called smart trainers. Those are connected to the internet and they're able to measure the power that the riders are creating when they pedal the bikes. Uh, that power is then put into the game and uh, makes their characters go in time with the power that they're putting into their bikes at home. Now, the cool thing about RGT is that the course that they're riding on is based on real life roads. So you can input any course. This one, uh, as we said at the top of the show, on loan from the Joe Martin stage race. So this is a real life race course that uh, a lot of these riders will 
be hoping to do in the next couple of years, but uh, they're going to have a chance to preview it here on RGT. So the elevation responds uh, in the game. It gets uh, harder and easier to pedal uh, or the rider responds that way in the game. So uh, they'll be racing on again, the real life Mount Sequoia road race course today from the Joe Martin stage race. And uh, there's some serious climbing out there in Arkansas. So uh, it's going to be a big one today, Ryan. Yes, indeed. And it looks like we're going to revive some old rivalries on this exciting new course because I'm looking at the uh, start list that you can see on your screen now. And we're going to have all three of Ian Walker, Jimmy Arkang, and Shane Alfreds, um, trio that so activated our previous races in this series. So last week we saw Shane and Ian work over Jimmy Arkang after Arkang took an early lead followed by working over each other for an exciting finish. And I'm sure that uh, this week that uh, Jimmy will be ready to get his revenge. And let's not forget uh, Shelly Navin. Uh, she will be the only woman in the day. Um, she's a uh, rider from Illinois, from, probably from Chicago, I'm thinking. And she has she will be able to take the Cat 4 Open uh, uh, prize today uh, for... Uh, just by showing up. I think you still have to finish. I know Shelly will uh, will make it to the <laughs> line for sure. She is well-versed in uh, the world of virtual racing here, as uh, we've seen her racing uh, a lot in uh, some of our, our RGT virtual races over the last few months. Yeah, last week, or I guess two weeks ago, we had a, a week off this week. Uh, this uh, Category 4, I guess, men's field was... Uh, one of the more tactical races of the entire series. Normally you, you see tactics like that up at the higher level of racing, but uh, these guys were going at it last race on stop number three. Yes, indeed. Yes. Yeah. So it'll be exciting to see how the, um, how things break down, uh, as I say, in today's race. But uh, I think that these are, we've got three riders here who all really, really enjoy sort of attacking racing and we'll probably find a lot in this uh, rather rolling course uh, to spring their breakaways yeah if you like a breakaway you can uh, you can certainly make it happen on rgt but it's really hard to do alone so if you can uh, just find a few riders on the same page now today i don't think they're going to have much other battling to do so they won't really need to make that initial selection or the you know initially establish the break like they did on stop number three they can uh, they can pretty much uh, just pick up where they left off i guess so uh it's like they had a two week long coffee stop and now they're gonna finish the ride here keep hammering it out all right riders getting the countdown now you see the countdown clock in the bottom right corner Riders will be seeing uh, something very similar to what you're seeing on your screen right now. You can see the rider that we're following with the camera is uh, highlighted in gray on the left-hand side of the screen. The uh, list of riders shows the current uh, order that they're racing in, and then the uh, you see Walker is just a little bit darker right now. That means we're going to be watching Walker's stats up in the top left and top right. And uh, there's some big numbers coming off of Walker right now as these guys rock it off the line. Alfreds and Walker trying to get rid of our Kang early here. Looking uh, very similar to how this one played out at the end of stop number three. But Jimmy Arkang knows exactly what they're doing. So he'll get up here. And uh, I think this is going to be another good one to watch. I'm excited to watch these three guys uh, duke it out here. Meanwhile, Shelly holding on at uh, about 80 meters back on the group. And then the other names that you see on the list are our camera bots out on course. Uh, the ZMS cams are from ZMS Livestream. Damon running all of the live streams for the BC Cup. And then uh, Tammy Brimner in eighth place right now is our on-course photographer. I don't know if you've seen any of uh, Tammy's work over the last three races here at the BC Cup presented by Kabotics, but she takes some awesome pictures. It is amazing the way that she's able to get in here and uh, capture these riders up close. I know I've, I've tried to play camera guy like Damon does such an excellent job of for us here, and I can barely do it on video. I don't know how Tammy gets those photos. They're amazing. Yeah, she's a spectacular photographer in real life as well as in the virtual world here. 
We're, uh, I'm excited to see that our Kang, Alfreds, and Walker are resuming the same battle that they've been uh, prosecuting in previous events. Uh, we can see that our Kang is lashing out, going for a hard and fast attack, trying to drop those other two riders as quickly as he can. No dice, Shane Alfred's right with him. Ian Walker yo-yoing a bit off the back, but he's back with that pair. And you can see that they're keeping a steady pace at the moment. They're about 30 kilometers an hour for these three riders, sharing a bit of workload as they go up uh, a near flat section of the course here. I guess today it's really all about timing. I mean, uh, there's not much racing. Well, there's no racing for them to worry about behind them. It's really just these three guys that they need to worry about. So... I guess if you're trying to get away, it's uh, how long can do you try and drop one and get to the line with two? Do you try and go solo? Do you just wait it out and sprint? It's uh, there's a few different to try to win today. I think uh, we'll probably see these guys stick together through at least the first couple climbs, the first few times that the road pitches up, and uh, they'll just sort of feel each other out, kind of get an idea for you know if anyone's having a bad day, if anyone's having a good day, we'll. Uh, We'll get a good idea on the first lump in the road, which uh, is still 20, 30K away. So it'll be a little bit before that goes uphill. Until then, I think these guys just keep tempo. You see the power that they're in right now, the uh, power zone, that colored bar just below their name floating above their head. I wish they had that in real life. It would make it so much easier as a commentator to know how hard these guys are going. Our Kang up at the front into the red zone right now, which means he is getting close to his limit of maximum power. These riders have to input their, uh, basically their stats when they sign up for the game. And then it also tracks their power to update their, uh, you know, personal best. It also uses their weight in the calculations. And then uh, based on their personal range of power that they can create, in other words, what their maximum is, as they get close to that maximum, that's a color bar will get closer to red. So we saw our Kang there just a little bit ago at uh, pretty close to the max. Uh, I would say max power for a lot of these guys going to be like to hold a number is like maybe 300, 400 watts. You see the watts per kilogram. That's uh, the more important number that uh, we're going to be watching throughout the day today because that's how we measure the amount of power based on the weight that they have to move around. So uh, we'll be talking about the watts that they're creating up in the top left, but what you should really be watching is uh, the uh, the watts per kilogram ratio, which is uh, right around three for most riders. I would say uh, like the best virtual races in the world, the best virtual riders on a day like this would have, I don't know, 3.9. They would be approaching four watts per kilo. Uh, some riders would, would maybe go over four if they worked a lot on the day, but uh, that would be a pretty serious effort. So anything above uh, above three and a half. I guess I would consider a big day in the virtual world. I don't know if uh, I'm under inflating that or over inflating that because I'm a terrible virtual racer. So, <laughs> yeah, these guys, I don't think they'll be hitting an average of four watts per kilo, though. We'll certainly see their uh, peaks get up there. Uh, this will be an interesting course because you can see they're on a pretty flat section right now where really raw wattage will matter the most. Uh, where watts per kilo will come into effect though is on the uh, on the climbs on this course be fairly likely to be decisive today i mean we we talked about how we've got these three riders they're all sort of watching each other right now and i can see that we've got the uh, course profile showing up there so you can see their track they're on a, a slight climb right now and they'll continue to be climbing as they get towards the first major peak of the race which comes in about 10 or 20 kilometers i would uh, i'm guessing from the uh, profile map we've got um <clears throat> these three riders know that they're evenly matched these guys have raced against each other now for a couple of weeks as we've said so i think what's going to happen is that we'll we'll see one or more of them try to push the decisive attacks on those two major hills on the course so there will probably be a lot of testing and feeling each other out on the first climb that we're going to see coming up and then there'll be a lot if whatever happens after that we'll see a lot more action on the final climb which comes pretty close to the finish of this race yeah, i guess you can break this down into sort of two sections pre-climb and post-climb so 
We're in the pre-climb <laughs> section right now, and then uh, I, I, however this one ends over the top of the first climb is probably how it's going to stay until they get to uh, the last climb of the day, the, the uh, big climb that comes before the finish. That's probably the next opportunity for some split. There is that little climb before they get to uh, the penultimate climb of the day, but I don't think that's going to be enough to split it. So really two big opportunities on uh, this course today, and you can see them on the RGT profile right now. The white dots representing where uh, the riders are right now. See the larger white dot are the, uh, the riders that we're following right now. So still a little bit of time before they get to the climb, just like real life, kind of shake the legs out a little bit, get a feel for how everyone's doing. Maybe even have a little chat. The riders do have an in-game uh, chat feature on RGT. Not sure how well these guys know each other, but uh, even uh, at the highest level of racing, sometimes you got to catch up on some personal business at the start before you get to work. <laughs> I can see that uh, in terms of the uh, team jerseys they're wearing, I'd uh, like to uh, uh, greet uh, Jimmy R. Kang warmly. He may be from the great state of Illinois, but in fact, he's representing that lovely Echelon Cherie's uh, Cycling BC jersey um, along with Ian Walker. Uh, I don't think they're teammates in real life, and certainly we saw them work ride hammer and tongs to uh, try and drop each other uh, in the previous races of this series. Uh, Ian is a local rider, um, and the third rider that we have here, uh, Shane Alfreds, is uh, from actually very close to my own, uh, own home because he rides for the Lake City Cycling Club, uh, which is a new local club that uh, has formed just at the bottom of the mountaintop where I live. Excellent geographic descriptor. I feel like I could find it if I rolled into town. I'd know exactly where to go. Join the club. Find a good ride. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, Lake City is... Uh... Oh, sorry. Go ahead. Lake City is a lovely sounding place, which is actually a fairly scrubby industrial park. But uh, I grew up near it, so I have fond memories wandering around it, actually riding my bicycle through there as a child. But uh, it also has an excellent brewery there, so I still have fond feelings about it. It's amazing how much bike racing goes on in scrubby industrial parks. It's uh, sort of a, a key venue, uh, certainly here in the U.S. too. I know uh, on the West Coast, that's the, the, the home of criterium racing, industrial parks <laughs> on a Sunday morning. So obviously a little, yeah. little more affordable. Not quite as easy as putting on a virtual race, though. I think uh, booting up old RGT and loading up Mount Sequoia is maybe the easiest way to put on a road race if you're a promoter. Oh, yeah, absolutely. As someone who's had to run a few races in my day, I'm uh, really enjoying uh, doing two things. First, outsourcing all of the actual setup to our uh, esteemed technician, Damon Bates, here. We're waving to Damon. He can hear us, but you don't hear him. He's the guy who's responsible for making these beautiful camera views come to you. He's the guy who's responsible for setting up and prepping these races for Cycling BC, and uh, he makes us uh, sound so good. Isn't that right, Brad? He makes you sound good. There's nothing he can do for me. <laughs> I'm beyond hope. Uh, Damon at uh, ZMS Streams is uh, incredible on the RGT platform. Uh, does a ton of virtual racing. So uh, if you're looking for uh, you know a club event, I know a lot of people are putting on some of these. Uh, uh, you know they want to put their own course in. Anyone can upload an uh, an RGT course. Um, using a GPX file, uh, anything you would upload to like Map My Ride or Strava, anything like that. You can just punch it right into RGT. It'll create that. Uh, you won't have uh, the real life background. Uh, the, the game developers would have to create that individually for courses that uh, would have a, a customized scenery package as, uh, as they call it. But uh, anyone can update it. If uh, you want to do a ride, reach out to Damon. I know he's all over Facebook uh, at uh, ZMS Livestream and uh, get you set up with uh, your own virtual race or ride or Fondo or time trial or just hang out on RGT, just hang out at the finish line like me. Yeah, certainly this has been a fantastic introduction, I think, for a lot of riders to the RGT platform. I think it's uh, really charmed people with how it works and how it looks and, and some of the great features that it's got. Meanwhile, we're... Uh, 
give you a little update on Shelly Navin. She is continuing to turn the pedals. It's going to be a lonely race for her today, but we, we honor her. She's been persistent. She's been a, a, a regular who has shown up, I think, for every event that we've done so far. And it's just fantastic to see. So she's going to get to enjoy some of this lovely scenery that she's riding through right now as she taps through this virtual Arkansas that we've set up for her and all the other riders. And in case any of you are wondering whether or not, uh, whether or not uh, Damon and I get heckled as badly as... Uh, as we heckle these poor riders who are only trying to do a great job, I can assure you that the uh, in the chat, Damon is making fun of our accents right now. This is, of course, because Damon is from uh, jolly old England himself, and uh, that's why, for example, he's uh, giving you the British Standard Time uh, versions of the uh, start times for these events. Uh, so uh, this is how Damon, Damon is whiling away a Saturday evening over there. Meanwhile, it's bright and early, as all of you uh, West Coast, Best Coast types know for me here. Uh, we've got this race started off at 0800 Pacific Daylight Time. And uh, I believe that Brad is coming from somewhere around about the same time zone as Arkansas itself, although perhaps a little bit further north. Yeah, I'm, uh, I'm one over. They uh, are in central time. I am... Uh in the eastern time zone here in pittsburgh pennsylvania but uh yeah i guess uh, about an eight hour drive from arkansas if i wanted to go ride right now that america really is start. a big I, country I, it's pretty <laughs> pretty big <laughs> not that canada's you know small by any standards i always love telling the story of uh, a group of four german riders who came to race at uh, a race called tour of america's Dairyland that we have here in uh, wisconsin so uh, they looked at a map it, it's you know it, it's in milwaukee which is like let's say half the size of chicago uh they looked at the map and they thought oh this is perfect we're just going to ride our bike in between races because every day is in you know a suburb of the city it looks pretty easy to get to so uh, the first night they uh, came to the race, actually won the race, and then upon realizing just how far 25 miles on American roads was uh, at, as the sun was setting, they uh, reached out to the promoters and asked if they could get a ride back to the hotel. They were planning on riding for nine days just to and from the hotel, and then when they got to the U.S., they realized the insane scale of our roads and infrastructure. <laughs> So, uh, <laughs> needless to say, they, they very quickly learned it was not rideable, and uh, we had them hooked up with a rental van quickly. But, uh, yeah, Arkansas is, uh, there are a lot of great riding roads in Arkansas, I will say that. And uh, Mount Sequoia up on top offers some nice climbing up to the finish. Although, I don't know uh, if the riders will be calling it nice climbing after 72K of racing today. Yeah, and... Uh... Despite the fact that we've got some nice climbing coming up for them, it looks like Jimmy R. Kang has decided not to rate, wait for a climb. He's uh, set out and got himself what we might call a slight breakaway. He's about 30 meters up the road. Walker and Alfreds appear to be content to let that uh, gap settle in. Uh, while we've been chatting, I think that, that that sort of 20 to 30 meter gap has persisted for about a minute or two. So they're in no hurry to break, chase it down. Maybe it's just a test here to see Alfreds and Walker may just want our Kang to do a little bit of work on his own while they share the load and see if they can uh, get him to, to wear himself out a bit. Uh, that was certainly a tactic they worked on uh, pretty hard last time, and they may be trying to run the same playbook now. We see Alfreds go a little bit into the red, probably just taking over the uh, pacemaking duties there. I can't yeah, remember. Nice uh, maybe you. Yeah. Good job. Brad, can you remember back. what the? Uh... <laughs> you're getting uh, you're getting early morning crosstalk here. We we still haven't got our rhythm, but I, I promise you by the uh, by the uh, Cat Three race later into the day we'll be firing on all cylinders. They uh, just as with the uh, categories rising throughout the day, the quality of the commentating we we hold our best stuff for the uh, later events. So we apologize to, to our Kang, Alfreds, Walker, and of course, let's not forget Shelly Navin for uh, having to uh, deal with our uh, tier two commentating here. 
I was going to ask you though, Brad, uh, Shane Alfreds is wearing a lovely uh, blue and green kit. And I know we were talking about on our previous broadcast. Do you remember which team that, which virtual team that represents? I think it's called the herd e-racing. Um, <laughs> it's a, uh, a virtual racing group, I guess, if you will. There you go. Thank you, Damon. And then I know that on the back, you'll also see it heard so good. Yeah. Well, I, I can't resist a uh, I can't resist a team kit that uses a terrible pun. So uh, <laughs> we're sure that as he races along here, Shane Alfreds will not be cowed by the considerable competition. Let me read you uh, about the herd because uh, I think they deserve a little plug since they got him to wear the kit in game. We deserve a little promo. The Herd is a welcoming, inclusive, and supportive place for people within the virtual cycling universe. Virtual cycling is wonderful and can be challenging, especially in the beginning. We're here to help you. The Herd is a place to try new things like racing without the risk of just being destroyed and experience events such as tours knowing you'll be supported by the collective. When we host a ride, our ride leaders always hold to their stated pace, whether it's a 0.7 to 0.1 or 2 to 2.4. I assume those are watts per kilogram. The ride leaders take it seriously, and we want you to know that when you sign up for is what you will get. That's awesome. We need more uh, more yes. clubs like this in real life as well because uh, that's how you get into it. you got to have some great support. Good to see that uh, the herd is doing that in the virtual world. Sounds like a great bunch of guys and girls. Uh, who could have any beef with that kind of mission statement? Yeah. For real. I don't even, I, I'm, I, I couldn't even attack a kit like that on the road. You know, if you're stuck in a group, you got to be like, oh man, you're, you're from the herd. All right, go ahead. You're cool. <laughs> yeah. So Alfred's is continuing to uh, share the work with his, uh, with his uh, close personal frenemy, Ian Walker there. They're continuing to sit about 25 meters behind our Kang. And at this point, I have to feel that's a deliberate decision. They're climbing a gentle slope here. I think this is uh, one of the lesser approaches to the later major climb. Um, they're closing in on our Kang slowly, slowly, but I suspect that may be as much because our Kang doesn't mind them coming back either. Uh, you mentioned it earlier, but we can watch their little, uh, their little colorful stripes below each of their names to get an idea of the relative effort level. Our Kang is staying green, just flipping into yellow, you know, this is representing a range of somewhere between two and three watts per kilogram. And indeed, uh, oh, looks like Walker and Arkang decided to take that moment to attack as we get up to about a 13 and a half percent indicated slope. If you're following along oh, at home, man. you can see the slope is, yeah. Oh, and they are, this is the climb now. So you're seeing one of the decisive attack points on the, uh, on the circuit. And indeed, it looks like Walker and Alfreds are taking advantage. These guys absolutely knew what they were doing. They caught up to our gang, and as soon as they got there, they both simultaneously hit the red zone on the power meters, and our gang is left behind. Beautiful move from Walker and Alfreds here. Yeah, that looked coordinated. I think there may be, if there's not a back channel, then they simply let their legs do the talking. And our gang may be having nightmares right now because I believe this is a repeat of just about the exact tactics that uh, Walker and Alfreds used to work him in the previous race. It was a you know, slightly different point in the race, but a very similar tactic. They let him get out to an early lead. They reeled him back and you know, on the dirty river course. And then when they attacked, uh, the attack was decisive. So our Kang is now looking like he might be in a bit of trouble. He's at 58 meters behind and dropping back. Again, that'll be a bit a uh, bit deceptive because we're on the climb now, but uh, nonetheless, he's got his work cut out for him to sort of hold these riders within uh, within view and within a reasonable distance as he uh, manages this climb, and then he's got to desperately get hammer down to uh, catch back up to them uh, on the descent. And you can we're following along with our Kang. You could see his power, his heart rate was going up over 187, and I don't know what his max heart rate is but i'm pretty sure that's high meanwhile walker who we're also following is doing about 160 beats per minute and again they're producing similar wattage so maybe this just reflects different hearts in these two different guys but uh i think that uh 
I think that our Kang has got to be worried at this point. Well, they are just on pretty much the most difficult pitch of this climb right now. You see on the uh, profile at the bottom of the screen, they're just getting to the top of the red section, which uh, gets obviously darker as the grade gets higher. Alfred's into the red a little bit as it uh, looks like he has lost Walker's wheel here. Our Kang's still in this one, though. I mean, didn't get blown up on the climb, which is like your worst case scenario. Uh, but our Kang is hanging here. He would definitely like to be up with this group, but they, I'm, I think he might still have a chance. If, uh, if he can hold this to like inside 100 meters uh, up and over the top, I wouldn't be surprised to see our Kang be able to get back into this group. Oh, absolutely. I mean, we are only about, uh, we're not even 10 kilometers into a race that's going to be 70 kilometers long. So he's got to know that, you know, whatever happens here, there's a lot of time to catch up. But he also has to be worried because if we're all, Alfreds and Walker, I mean, they're actually, they're starting to gap each other a little bit, but we'll see whether or not they regroup once they get to the top. But if this race does split up here, uh, anybody who's left as the odd man out at the top of the hill may find it is a very long day in the saddle trying to play catch up. And, you know, if they're waiting around, if any of these riders is waiting around for the next major climb to, to execute a decisive attack, it's coming many, many kilometers away. I think they'll be about 20 or 30 kilometers down the road uh, before they see that second hill. So yeah, at this point, I don't watching. think there's really much incentive for Walker to wait up for Alfreds here. I mean, they're going to be into the top here pretty soon. It's not like he's killing himself up on the front. Alfreds is, uh, you see, dipping into the red zone there for a little bit. So uh, Walker and Arkang probably don't really need to work together uh, in terms of getting up to the top now. It's really just, uh, or uh, sorry, Walker and Alfreds don't really need to work together. It's really just up to Arkang riding his own race back here in third. Yeah, I, I wonder if Walker will try to keep that gap or if he'll be content to work with Alfreds when he gets over the top. Um, well, the way we will find that out is by watching the race, I guess. Meanwhile, our Kang is definitely not panicking. He's not going into the red. Walker is over the top and beginning his descent. Our Kang is just about got there, so we'll be able to sort of see how this race recomposes itself on the descent. I uh, don't have weight numbers for you on these three riders, so I can't really tell you which ones are the uh, big rollers or the real featherweight climbers. Um, actually, I've got to go back and look at my DMs because I, uh, I think that Shane might have had something to say to me about, uh, uh, about his relative uh, performance because I was teasing, about him, teasing him about this last week. Well, looks like he's going to get on to Walker here. And then uh, with our Kang up and over, I think this is going to settle in. Probably right around 250 meters, looks like, will be the gap up and over. Might hit up to 300. Our Kang going to keep mm -hmm. the pressure on, even on the way down here. Ooh, Alfreds and Walker are too, though, in the red zone up here at the front. Yeah, it's. Uh, I, w I was looking back at my uh, at my research, which by research I mean uh, Shane Alfred sending me text messages uh, after last race, and uh, he's probably the the roller of this race. So it's all the more impressive that he's executed an attack here on the climb. We'll probably see him do some pretty solid descending because uh, his claimed weight will be on his side. And indeed, if anything, it looks like he's stretching out his lead as he slides down this hill. Walker is 100 meters behind him. Again, uh, these these distances will rubber band as they go up and down the climbs and descents, but uh, nonetheless, that's not a trivial gap, and maybe even more telling, all three riders are on the climb now, and our Kang is now almost 500 meters behind, uh, is almost 500 meters behind our leader, Alfreds, here. Yeah. So. You see Shane Alfred's getting into an improved regular tuck, not a super tuck. I, I don't know if uh, super tucking has been banned from virtual racing, but uh, I don't see any of the riders going into a virtual super tuck. So Let's hope there's no virtual UCI. Because <laughs> uh, 
I think I saw Alfred's helmetless up at the front. That's that's got to be a bigger issue than the Super Tuck, first off. <laughs> and uh, Walker had some suspect socks we're going to need to check into. Yeah, yeah. They, they tend not to police equipment quite as strictly in, uh, in these events. We're seeing uh, Shelly Navin. She's now on the climb, hitting it at 11%. She's... Uh, Riding within herself, you know, she's got only herself to beat. Uh, maybe this is a bit of a training ride, but we salute Shelly. She's come out. She's seen off all comers. Um, she's uh, fallen behind the other three riders in this race, so it's going to be a little bit of a lonely event. But she's got the uh, challenge of this hill, so we salute Shelly and hope that she can hound, get a good ride out of this, and be ready to rip the legs off of all the people who didn't show up for today's event. Yeah, that's right. Shelly showed up, and that's what matters. Uh, what she's doing solo on the trainer like this, especially on this Mount Sequoia uh, course, takes a hard person to uh, to conquer a course like this alone. So my props to you, Shelly. Bravo. Yeah. You know, we were... And now we're watching uh, Shane as he continues. He's still on a slight descent here, leading out the group. These guys got to watch out because uh, he also has a pretty fantastic sprint. And I believe he actually won the uh, crit race that we did on Canary Wharf uh, from a sprint, if I'm not mistaken. I'll have to go and uh, do some research on that later. But right now, he's got to be fairly satisfied. He's shown a genuine gap. Um, we know these three lead riders, Alfred Walker and Arkang, have been pretty closely matched uh, throughout this series. So it's interesting to see a fairly robust looking attack and to see these three riders so completely split up already. So we follow along with Walker. He's the uh, meat in the Alfred's Arkang sandwich at the moment, and I'm sure he'd rather be uh, closer to the top slice of bread, that being Shane Alfred's, rather than having Arkang close on him from behind. But maybe the tactic will be for Walker and Arkang to uh, reunite and prosecute a little bit of catch up on Shane Alfred's. Yeah, I think that's what I would be doing if I'm Walker. And uh, if I don't start making up time soon, like if this gap doesn't get to below 500 real quick, I think I'm just waiting up for Arkang. You know he's good. You know he's got good power. You know he can work in a group. And uh, he's only, what, 170 meters back from Walker. So uh, maybe wait it out a little longer, 160 now. Uh, Alfred's mm -hmm. only at 300 up the road though so i think you stick this one in the middle let uh, let walker work on alfred's a little bit longer but if he doesn't start making up ground if it you know if it looks like he's losing the battle then uh yeah wait up for our tank here and see if those two can work together yeah absolutely this is a long race we're about 15 kilometers in they've got about 72 kilometers total so it's going to be about my little uh, totalizer there is showing me that Ian Walker has about 58 kilometers remaining in his race. That's an awful long distance. And Shane may be trying a big, exciting solo attack right now, but he's going to be on that big, exciting solo attack for 57 kilometers. Um, I rate his chances. He's proven to be a strong rider. He's a roller. He obviously likes this terrain already. Nonetheless, I'm not sure he's stronger than Walker and Arkane combined at least not for 57 kilometers uh, of rolling terrain based on, Arcan on Fayetteville, Arkansas. I wonder if uh, Alfreds was a little surprised that Walker fell off. I mean, I didn't really see a significant attack from Alfreds to drop Walker. It seemed like Walker just kind of slowly fell off of Alfreds as they got closer and closer to the top. So Alfreds looked like he was keeping it pretty steady and uh, wondering if now he's reevaluating the scenario here as well. Not that he would wait up for Walker for any reason. I mean, there's no reason for him to wait for Walker and Arkang, but maybe a little surprised that he's solo uh, this early in the race. Yeah, for sure. I'm under, he's, he's, putting, he's putting in a good gap. He's got to be happy that there's still 100 meters of separation between his two uh, major opponents here because uh, that means that they're not getting any aerodynamic drafting for excuse me, from each other it means they're not working together. Uh, Shane is probably pretty okay with trying to race one-on-one -on -one, uh, against these guys in what would amount to a virtual time trial. I think he's got the power and I think he's got the, uh, I think he's got the will to try that, but 
What he has to worry about is if those two join up behind him and then turn it up into a team time trial versus uh, Shane for an entire 55 kilometers. That might be not unique. And we can see that our Kang, who we're looking at on the right screen right now, is within sighting distance of Ian Walker. So he's got that rabbit to chase only 60 meters up the road now. So our Kang is definitely closing that gap. And you can see he's putting in the wattage too. I was watching peaks there of well over three watts per kilo. Uh, he's definitely keeping a very steady effort. Uh, given what we know about these riders, when we see them sort of sitting in that sort of high twos, low threes for watts per kilo, that's a that's a pretty killer tempo. That's probably these guys going just slightly over their all day pace. Like they're they're in a sort of a red line where it might be a bit exciting for them to time try to time trial home at three watts per kilogram. And indeed, we're we're watching our Kang. He's continuing to just bring that gap back 40 meters now as they roll over through this rolling terrain it's lovely virtual countryside you can see that the trees have leaves on them it's probably reflects reality in arkansas it's far enough south that i'm sure their spring is well underway yeah the the real joe martin race stage race is going to happen uh this year if all goes well in august It'll be uh, an event that you can all sign up for, um, and it'll happen August 26th to 29th uh, this year. You know, it's been a complicated, um, complicated year for racing events of all types. You know, we're still mourning, or at least I personally am definitely mourning the uh, cancellation of Super Week here in the Lower Mainland. Uh, uh, my own uh, personal racing club, Escape Velocity Cycling Club, is still talking back and forth with the powers that be both cycling bc via sport and the provincial health authorities about when it will be possible to to do some bike racing again but we're still cautiously optimistic by that by the end of the summer we'll put on a couple of races and i know there's other promoters who are definitely champions that I've mentioned my old buddy uh barry lister who uh, wants to run a couple of races out uh out uh, in the maple ridge area and I'm sure that our friends at the uh, Phoenix Velo Club are excited to do their mission racing series again when they can. I think they've been trying to set up a few time trials as well. And uh, United Velo is a very good club for doing master's races also in the Fraser Valley. And my old buddy Todd Hansen runs his, uh, his coastal racing um, series out in the South Richmond. So I'm giving, uh, giving Brad a whole bunch of name checks for nice regional areas within uh, uh, the south coast of British Columbia, which uh, he won't know about at all, but I assure you the, the listeners will think these are all great. I like it. <laughs> I, I like a, the little regional rundown of the area. It sounds like you guys are pretty lucky with uh, plenty of people ready to get racing back uh, back to normal when, when we can. So uh, sounds like when things open up again, you're going to going to be back to it pretty quickly it's nice to have yeah i think a lot of people are pretty excited for real racing i mean the virtual racing has been an, an incredible has been an incredible option to have during what we will call these uncertain times but uh nonetheless there's you know as good as it is for training and i mean i think it really is scratching the itch of racing Meanwhile, as we get back to the racing, it looks like our Kang and Walker have indeed reunited. Once again, they are best friends for now. And they are still about oh, 800 meters behind Alfred. So they got their work cut out for them. But now they've got 54 kilometers on the road in which they will be able to chase down Shane if they can. They'll certainly work together do a little pace line and they will watch that gap very closely as i'm sure shane will because all they've got to do is basically be about make up one kilometer in 54. so that's the work for these two riders they're wearing the same kit i guess they've become a virtual team at least for now and they will be chasing down shane alfred's Jimmy, you can forgive, but never forget what Walker did to you on that climb with Alfred's. 
<laughs> that's my advice. You got to work together uh, now. Yes. So uh, you got to you got to set your differences aside. But I don't know if you can ever forget the attack that Walker and Alfred <laughs> laid on Jimmy on the way up that climb. Well, of course, bike racing is an awful lot like international diplomacy. There are no, you know, eternal friendships, only eternal interests. And right now, our Kang and Walker are sharing the very acutely common interest of catching Alfreds. So they will be certainly allies, if not friends, for a good long while. But of course, if they do manage to make that catch, then it'll be only a matter of time before they betray each other, because that is... Of course, the tragic but also glorious cycle of bike racing. You just got to love it. Virtual or real, you know, that's the dynamic that so many bike racers come for here. You know, you have to have just a little bit of malice in your heart to be a truly great bike racer, I think. Nobody so, ever yeah, won out of a breakaway by being nice. That's for sure. <laughs> yes, as the classic phrase goes, no gifts. So we're, we're watching these riders and we pay another tribute to Shelly Navin. She continues to tap the uh, tap along with the pedals. She's still in there. She's about five and a half kilometers behind the lead of the race right now. But again, she's racing in her own category, in effect. Um, and the fact of the matter is that, uh, you know, she's, she's actually maintaining a pretty solid pace relative to these uh, other three. Um, you know, she has not been losing um, time at a steady or monstrous rate. She's just keeping that gap. She's keeping to her own pace. You can see her rolling along on this gentle section here, slight descent, and she's up to 46 kilometers an hour. You can see that she's keeping her, pe her uh, pacing pretty steady. She's doing a good, hard workout. You can see where the heart rate is, where the power output is. Power output and the heart rate will be flagging a little bit as she goes down this slight descent. She'll be taking advantage of that and as the uh, road flattens out in a few kilometers I'm sure right back on top of those pedals for all of those of you who've done actual bike riding and racing of course you know that there's a uh, there's a certain cadence to how you ride a real road which is that you ease off a little bit on the descents because you don't want to push against the increased aerodynamic drag you get as your speed rises but then when you're on the flats and the climbs you put in your steady or even your your peak efforts because that sort of gives you the fastest possible pacing uh, overall so Shelly's effectively riding this race like a time trial now which is she'll be putting in the deep efforts where it matters when the aerodynamic resistance is low and when the climb is high and that's what she's doing right now you can see that she's got a steady two watts per kilogram that she's tapping away as she goes over this little tiny rise and here we can see how the scenery is showing us the course profile pretty nicely as well she's got a little rise you can see the crest of it ahead of her and as she comes over the top of that then she'll be back on another little descent as she rides towards those three uh, lead riders in this event so this is a bit of a bit of a, a gnarlier little lump in the road than i previously noticed she's on a seven and a half percent climb here She's maintaining her effort. You can see if anything, it's climbing slightly. She's got a nominal road speed dipping below 10 kilometers an hour, which tells you kind of how hard that slope is at its peaks. But as she rolls over the top, she'll be back on pace. But she's just steady Eddie here, you know, keeping that two watts per kilo riding within herself and, you know, treating this, as I say, as a time trial now. Shows you how hard the other climbs are. Uh, that climb that she was just on, I mean, it barely shows up on the course profile at the bottom. You see, it's just a very light orange. She's the big white dot that we're following right now. So, uh, I, I mean, I, I wouldn't have even made a mark on that if I was doing recon on this, looking at to this course profile. But uh, you can see it was a, a pretty serious little kick up there. So gives you a, a little bit of perspective for how big the bigger climbs actually are. Yeah, and we'll have to put a little marker on that because sometimes when you get those little nasty steep pitches like that, uh, remember that when we when we see the bigger fields we'll have later on in, in later races, that they're going to be going up this first major climb that all the riders have now cleared. And then once they finish their descent, they're going to run straight into that 
little tiny 7.5% wall. And I wonder if one of the effects will be is that you'll see groups that will, you know, shred their way up that ma first major climb, um, you know, regroup to some extent on the descent, and then there'll be a few riders perhaps caught out by having one more lump. And if they aren't right on top of it, uh, they might find that they've managed to do a lot of work to regroup after the first major climb, only to get dropped on a little bump that barely appears in their course profile. So uh, for all you uh, cat three, two, and pro riders who are going to be showing up in later races, if you're watching this for some recon, uh, put, that in your, uh, put that in your race notes. I guess you don't have to mark anything on your stem anymore. I know some riders uh, use whiteboards to write uh, the important landmarks of the course so they can keep an eye on it. But the days of the stem tape are unnecessary <laughs> in the virtual world. Man, stem tape is going to skyrocket sales when we get back to real life racing. Whatever specific <laughs> tape they use, it's going to shoot through the roof. It's going to be like I'll lumber. Do, I have to ask uh, some of my buddies who are actually into, you know, preparing for races and setting up things like stem notes. I'm guessing that clear packing tape is probably the go-to, uh, you know, rainproof, uh, relatively removable, although I imagine there's more than a few uh, hardcore rider stems that have some paint damage from uh, one too many stem notes being torn off. I wonder if any you of them are into those... Use? What's that? I used some I used some mole skin one time. I was out on an adventure ride, didn't have any tape, but I needed to make notes of like these specific turns I had to make. So, you know, I'm like, I'm not getting any blisters. I'll be fine. Stuck some mole skin on there, made the notes on it, made all my turns. That the gum has been on my stem for like four years now, and I can't get it <laughs> off. I've tried everything. That stuff is amazing. I, you could probably repair a steel frame with it, too, based on the way that it, it held on to my aluminum stem. But, uh, yeah, whatever you do, don't use the stuff that you're supposed to use on your foot because there's something about the gum. It's not made for metal. Note to self, no moleskin. One of the dumber pranks I ever pulled on a friend is um, there's, a, there's a local rider who we haven't seen in these racing series. Come on, Wilson, you should be racing these. Wilson Tran. Uh, an old friend, and uh, he's famous for a couple of things, including really liking gold accents on his ta on his bikes. Uh, he actually went out and got gold anodized Nocon type cables uh, for one of his bikes, uh, which made him look like an insane Bond villain. So that was pretty great. But uh, as a tribute to him, uh, one of my more bizarre hobbies is crochet. So I actually crocheted a tiny gold yarn stem cozy and then at a bike race managed to surreptitiously sew it onto his bike while he wasn't looking and i'm pretty proud of that fact honestly so uh here's Spent here's to you bucks Wilson. on the cable 80 bucks on the cable housing and still ended up with a crushed knitted handlebar <laughs> that's right no no rider is safe from yarn bombing once uh in 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 vancouver so i hope i hope that we'll be doing enough real racing in the near future that I can yarn bomb a few uh, a few more local riders. But meanwhile, we can watch Arkang and Walker, their virtual stems completely pristine, riding together, both wearing that beautiful cycling BC kit, and they are continuing to try to put a dent in Alfred's lead, but Shane Alfred's has stretched it out to about 1.3 kilometers, so uh, Arkang and Walker have some work to do. Because that is not the uh, right way for that gap to be going. Um, they might be content to sort of leave Alfred's out to sort of just cook in his own juices for a while. But I don't think such a plan involves letting him stretch his lead beyond one and a half kilometers, no matter how far from the finish they are. No, I, I don't think there's any good strategy that starts with, we let him get a kilometer and a half ahead, and then... <laughs> There is no and then. 
in that scenario. So yeah, Kang and Walker, I mean, it's pretty simple math. I went to public school here in the United States, but uh, even I know you just have to go faster than whatever pace he's setting up front. Cool part about RGT that you don't have in real life is you can see exactly what Alfreds is doing. These riders are basically looking at the same screen that we're looking at now. Uh, they can choose their own view. A lot of them will have the first person view on there as well, but they can see the exact distance that Alfreds is. They can see the exact wattage that he's doing. So all you have to do is match uh, the watts per kilogram, do uh, 0 0.2 or 0 0.3 more, and over the next 50K, you hope that you did the math right to bring it back. Yes, indeed. We can see our Kang and Walker starting to, uh, I think they're starting to pick up the pace a little bit. We're looking at the numbers. You can see that they're sort of peaking out around three watts per kilogram, which is a pretty solid effort. Uh, Alfred's is contentedly right at two watts per kilogram. May also reflect that they're just on different terrain at the moment. So Walker and Arkang are on a slight descent. Alfred's is on a very slight grade. Might not even notice that. But uh, you can see that Walker and Arkang are taking a bit of advantage of the, uh, of the terrain. They're up over 40 kilometers an hour. But soon they're going to run into the same slope that Alfred's is, which is a pretty... It's not trivial. It's a little bit of a lump, but look at this. He's up at 15% grade. I think when we uh, when we took a peek at the uh, at the course profile, we focus on those two big climbs, and they are indeed big and long. But there's lots and lots of these little climbs that were are barely registering in this long 70 kilometer uh, uh, parkour. And yet, I'll bet you that Alfred's is kind of feeling that 14% at the moment. So we're going to see our Kang and Walker face that same thing. It'll be interesting to see if that has any effect on uh, their ability to stay together or if they deliberately try to hold together during those these little rolling uh, climbs and descents that they're going to be facing throughout the race. You got to think you want the other rider with you as much as possible. <clears throat> we talked a little bit about how you can work together on our GT. Uh, you do need to take turns at the front. There is an element of pace lining, but the game will take care of the placement. So uh, if you just drop in behind the rider and uh, you start putting in too many watts, it'll move the rider over to the side. This is also probably a good time to talk about the drafting indicator that the riders will see. Up in the top left of the screen, you see the three big numbers. That's the current power, their current cadence, and their current heart rate. And then below that shows a graph of the rider's pass power. Now, when these riders get into a slipstream or when they're in danger of losing a slipstream, that graph, you see right now it says saving 26 watts. That means that uh, the rider that we're following, which right now is... Walker Alfreds up at uh, at the front. <clears throat> that shows the uh, the amount of uh, waters that uh, they're saving by sitting in the draft. Now, right there, you saw it just briefly change. Whoa, Navin out in a field <laughs> doing some cyclocross racing here. Just briefly changed there to show that uh, the gap was opening too much, that uh, they were losing the draft. So the riders will get a warning when they're not maximizing their draft in the game on RGT. So that's really all that Walker and her Kang need to look at right now. It's about riding as efficiently as possible. Yeah, absolutely. I'm actually interested because uh, they seem to be riding uh, side by side uh, a fair bit. And I mean, it's a virtual race, but that does actually represent how the how the race is treating them right now, which is I think that it means that they're not maximizing draft. Now, looking at it, I see that they've just hit the climb. So it may be a matter of there's not much drafting that they're going to be doing or caring about until they get over this little lump. It's the same 15% peaking out grade that we saw Shane Alfred's ride over earlier. So they're just basically going to dig deep and do this. I think they've got about 100 meters to go before they get to the top here. But uh, there's a slight descent uh, on the backside of this slope. So we will see if once they get there, they sort of put themselves into drafting formation and get a little bit more committed to... Uh, to working together as they try to get to Alfred's. And in fact, the opposite of that seems to be happening as Arkane kind of rolled over there with great force and has managed to put a tiny gap into Walker. So we'll see if he eases up and lets that close up or if he's serious about this attack. No, I think Arkane like actually did, 
did that right. They say you want to attack over the climb or ride through the climb, ride through the top of the climb. I, I'm guessing that's what he was trying to do there. And uh, Walker just wasn't on the same page. Yeah, it looks right to me. And I mean, it's also a bit of a defensive move in that it, uh, if you are rolling over the top of the climb and riding through it, as you say, then uh, you're also not going to be the one who's caught flat-footed. Indeed, they have regrouped now, but having completed that uh, little lump in the road, they're now almost two kilometers behind Alfred's in the lead. So I think our Kang and Walker have to start paying attention to the draftometer and making sure they're getting a high degree of efficiency out of their uh, pacemaking because uh, they are going to need every trick they've got if they have any hope of catching up to Alfred's here. And I doubt that either our Kang or Walker will be satisfied with second place on the day. So we reflect no, once again. After, uh, I was going to say, especially after the last week. I think there's <laughs> yeah. still some, some feelings. Yeah, absolutely. They've had they've had an extra week. So we did three weeks in a row of racing, and then we took a week off before we had this big event. So all three of these riders have had that extra week to think about what they liked and what they didn't like about the previous races, plan their vengeance or plan their triumph, depending on how they felt that they were doing. Uh, you know, and certainly all three of these riders will take to heart the... Uh, the words of that classic Southern philosopher, Ricky Bobby, if you're not first, you're last. And I am positive that at this point, our Kang and Walker are thinking about how they can execute on a classic shake and bake strategy in order to work over Shane Alfreds, who is in fact taking on the role of Jean-Pierre here, the hated outsider who is come into the sport and is now making them look silly i'm sure that our kang and walker can't be liking that so they'll be looking to uh, take back this gap close it down and hopefully not have to admit to liking crepes in the process <laughs> i guess you could look at it from the glass half full perspective and say if you're not second you're third which is not bad <laughs> so <laughs> I guess well, not much I mean, to lose if uh, if they're not able to catch Alfred's up at the front. I, I think we can promise all three of these riders a podium position today, but I'm not sure how happy the guy in third place is going to be at the end of the day. It's, uh, you know, I've I, I've I've uh, won default podiums in my time. Is never feels quite as sweet as actually winning the race, does it? Now, <laughs> right, exactly. <laughs> It's like when you're forced to hang out with your little brother, you know, or big brother. You know, mom makes you hang out. It's not quite the same as just hanging out. Yeah, that's right. So, our Kang and Walker are playing each other's little brothers at the moment. I'm sure neither one of them particularly wants to hang out with the other, but it sure seems like a, a better idea than any of the alternatives they've come up with. So, they will... Uh, play their virtual bike race game together and pretend to be best friends just long enough for them to uh, shut down Shane Alfreds if they can. You know, it's the classic, the classic dilemma. I can assure you, I, I was raised in a family where I grew up with two younger brothers and the, the dynamic of three boys in the household was definitely that there was often a situation of two against one, but each day the two versus the one the names would change in who was the two and who was the one. That's right. Shout out to Mike and John. I still love you guys. <laughs> well, we have to figure out which one is the Mike, which one's the John, and which one's the Ryan in this group of three. I don't know who the <laughs> the uh, antagonist of the three of you was, but uh, today <laughs> it's Alfred's up here at the front. <laughs> yes, indeed it is. And Alfred's, well, we've been talking very randomly is just doing the work and getting the job done he's keeping that uh that uh, gap pretty steadily at about uh just under two kilometers as the uh, clock continues to tick on this race so we're now passing the 40 to go mark that means that we're getting very close to the halfway point already so these guys have been maintaining a good steady pace we started this race at uh 0800 sharp local time so we're now 55 minutes in on the clock you can see it 
There in your top left corner, 5526 and counting is our race time. Uh, so we're probably going to be at this pace another hour, just over another hour on the road for these guys. And Alfred's is continuing to just hold on. Meanwhile, our Kang and Walker have to be, they're still working together well and they have to know that, you know, every kilometer put, they put up, they're doing a little less work than Alfred's and hopefully for them, that will start to count for something before we get to the end. But, uh, you know, that's, that's the job. Everybody on this, in this race of three knows exactly what the work to be done is. And it's really just a question of how well they execute. Our Kang and Walker really only have one task at hand at the moment, which is work together, make the number that matters most go down, which is the gap between them and Shane Alfreds. It's a good point. There's a little element of uh, sort of having to trust the process for our Kang and Walker back here. Just believe that if that number is in the right place, it's going to end where you want it to. It's like investing in your IRA for retiring when you're 65. You're like, I don't know how putting five grand in here right now is going to turn into a million dollars, but you just got to trust that it's going to work. So just do the work, try and forget about it, and hope that you can retire. That's what these guys have to do. That's right. Our Kang and Walker in classic buy and hold strategy. They've got to just keep making those regular deposits into the wattage bank. And Alfred's is doing a similar job up front, except he's got a little less help. He's kind of like a day trader working all on his own while Walker and Arkane right. are, you know, riding the S&P 500. All they have to do is, you know, collect the market average and they'll probably be better than the average soloist. But uh, nonetheless, Alfred's is basically making a claim that he's an experienced trader and that he can do better than the market, which, as I said, is Walker and Arkang right now. So as we torture this, uh, this financial metaphor nigh unto death, meanwhile, the racing continues. And actually, we're thinking about that. Um, you know, Arkang and Walker have indeed been getting returns on their investments. They've got that gap down to 1.2 kilometers now, which is uh, a substantial shrinkage from where it was before. So uh, perhaps in their own way, Walker and Arkang are uh, vindicating at least the weak version of the efficient market hypothesis. All right. Good earnings call for Walker and Arkang here as we check in with them. That's beating it. estimates. They're beating the street. <laughs> that Oh dear, yeah, it's the the strange early commentary. Definitely, uh, chapeau to the Cat Fours. They are they've, they've had to uh, they've had to listen to all of our practice bits today. But uh, here we go, Walker and Arkang continuing to let their legs do the talking. Shane Alfred's maybe noticing that gap was shrinking because he's pushed it up slightly now, so it's up to 1.47 kilometers. You know, he's on a slight descent and he's cruising it at 60 kilometers an hour in the virtual world. He's probably had to turn his fan up to high to experience the rush of a virtual descent. You know, he's out there underneath that virtual Arkansas sunshine with his virtual helmetless head enjoying the breezes. Meanwhile, he wears his lovely virtual green and dark blue herd kit. So, you know, the, the pain is real, but uh, it's uh, starting to pay off. And again, he is opening up that gap. So it's possible that as we were chatting away, he noticed what was happening and he decided to put in the work. But uh, again, this is now kind of a time trial. He's got 38 kilometers left in his race. So he will certainly be keen on not going into the red line too often uh, as he tries to hold off these other two riders. A little gap back here for our Kang and Walker. Could probably be a little more efficient here to get up onto the wheel. Walker going deep on this little lump in the road. You can see how uh, the wattage has changed. Look at the graph up at the top left. You see that spike right there. Exactly where the road goes uphill as well. So you can see they had to increase their effort. <clears throat> Floating right around three and a half for our Kang and four for Walker. And it's going to give Walker a little bit of space here. 
Yeah, and I, I think they're both doing the classic move of just riding their own climb, right? You're you're seeing this little gap here, and I think that might be an indicator to both Walker and Arkang about what might happen in the future, which is Walker is sort of probably not trying to attack so much as just slowly and naturally riding away from Arkang on this slope. So, uh, you know, that sort of thing can count as a little bit of a test. So what I would expect will happen, though, is this is not a big slope. We know that there's another big climb coming up and that they've still got a lot of distance uh, in their future. So I think what might happen here is that uh, as we come over the crest of this hill, and I think Walker is just reaching it momentarily, these two riders will likely regroup so that they can continue to work together and see if they can close down a bit more of that gap. So I think they're, I think they're a little early for Walker to be thinking about a solo attack and breakaway here. Uh, that's a lot of effort if he's going to try and close up the uh, distance to Shane Alfred's all on his own. Yeah, I don't know that this was really an attack from Walker uh, as much as our Kang just kind of falling off the tempo. So not much Walker can do there. Uh, you know, if our Kang is struggling to, let's say, break two watts per kilo, it obviously doesn't benefit Walker to, to drop down to that level because that's going to put Alfred's completely out of reach. If Alfred's gets up to, let's say, three and a half kilometers away, then uh, even with 40K to go, there's probably no way that Walker uh, would be able to chase him back solo. So at some point, Walker has to say, look, if you can't keep up with me, I can't uh, can't keep waiting up for you. But uh, mm -hmm. I don't know if that moment is now or not at 230 meters back for our Kang. Yeah, we're going to have to a uh, fairly crucial moment in the race. We're going to see if Walker decides to wait, if our Kang can get back to that wheel. I think it's kind of on our Kang now. If he can catch back up on this descent, then I'm sure Walker will be glad to have the company. But I don't think that we'll see Walker slow his pace at all. Because as you say, we're now at the point where the work has to be done. If there's any hope of catching Shane up the road, uh, then they're going to actually have to start closing that gap pretty quick. Meanwhile, Shane is just riding within himself, you know. All the numbers look steady. He's on a nice flat part of the course. He's keeping a nice, solid pace. You know, uh, I'm guessing that he can pretty handily keep up this level of effort for an entire, for the whole event, which would be for him just over an hour, I'm suspecting, before he hits the finish line at this point. Yeah, I would say Alfred's mm -hmm. probably sitting right where he wants to be. And, uh, you can guess that this is his comfort zone, right? If you can ride at any tempo you want, you built yourself a two and a half kilometer lead. At this point, you can settle into pretty much any zone you want. So it seems like 2.2 to 2.4, that's right around where Alfred's is most comfortable on the day. And obviously that's reflected in his uh, relative FTP with uh, the power zone that we're seeing pretty much green and blue for uh, for the last 20 minutes or so. Yeah, that's right. So this archway represents the exact halfway mark on the course. You can see that it's 36 to go, 36 done for Shane Alfreds. And uh, I know from talking to him before that he is a, and, and as I was saying in, our, in my secret direct messages with him, uh, he's a he's a real roller. So uh, he'll be he'll be pretty happy to try and time trial this home, and I think that uh, he'll be pretty content with. Uh, attempting what may amount to a 36 kilometer TT with a two and a half K head start. Uh, that sounds like a deal even I would take. <laughs> sounds like even a deal I could screw up. <laughs> oh, hey. hey, we could all screw it up, couldn't we? <laughs> Meanwhile, Ian Walker, he's finding himself slightly solo at the moment. Uh, our Kang is still 200 meters back. Uh, we're watching those numbers carefully to see if our Kang is going to get back in contact, but uh, Walker may have to do this as a solo time trial as well, so he's going to find himself in the morose position of catching up to Alfred's after giving him a two and a half head start. And our Kang, I think, can just barely make out if he's got a real good screen uh, Walker in the distance on this long straight section, but he has to close every one of those 200 meters with his own hard done effort and we will see if he can manage that.
This is, like I say, probably a decisive moment in the race, is whether or not our Kang and Walker close back together and are able to work to the finish. And we can see he's, he's putting in a fair effort. Our Kang is kind of going, you know, blue, yellow, blue, yellow. This is sort of just... He's probably riding right on his threshold. He, he knows he's got to keep something in the tank for the entire rest of this race, which is far, far from over. But uh, he also knows that uh, he's really got to close this gap now or else there is, or else his race is decided. And it'll be decided as he'll be third place. So well, let's see what our Kang can manage. Numbers are maybe closing down a little bit it was over 200 meters to walker now it's about 185 again that could be vagaries of this rolling terrain we see there walker and meanwhile walker is looking at the gap between himself and alfred's and that's just ever so slightly closing down you can see that he, if he keeps up at this pace and at this gap closing he's about to take the gap below two kilometers that's still a lot but it is at least the numbers trending in the right direction ah but we see the reason Shane Alfreds is on a 12% grade, so I think that it's very natural that his uh, his lead is looking like it's closing down. But um, we'll get a truer picture of what uh, of what is going on once Walker and Arkang clear this same uh, this same grade. Yeah, it's tough to get a good read on a, a long stage profile like this because, uh, like you said, the elevation gain can uh, artificially inflate or deflate the gaps. But there's yeah. a nice flat section here that uh, we'll be able to get a good read on. Mm -hmm. Yeah, you see the same effect in real races too, where there's a, a um, tremendous amount of accordioning as uh, the peloton goes up and down over each hill. So. It's important not to um, to read too much into those fluctuations, especially as the road uh, goes up and down. So, you know, for example, right now we're seeing about a 1.6k gap between Alfreds and Walker, but Walker has a very large hill in his future that Alfreds is now on the descent of. So, meanwhile, Harkang is uh, maintaining. Actually, he's about 200 meters behind Walker still. So, as we watch Ian Walker. Crossing through the halfway banner. Mm -hmm. We're sort of seeing the uh, sort of seeing the race develop here. I probably should have taken a time check at the halfway split. We're still programming the virtual officials into the game to relay that information back to us. That is uh, still in development, as I understand, over at RGT headquarters. <laughs> so we see our Kang is also just cleared through the uh, halfway mark. He's going to be the last of our trio of riders here that are going to uh, hit this little upgrade, and then we'll have a, a good picture of what the race is going to look like for a while. And I see that even as we say that, Shane Alfreds is on another little climb. So it's just rolling terrain after, you know, and these are these are not little lumps. Like when you think about a sort of a three to six percent grade in real life, that's a that's a hill that you'll definitely feel. But these hills are not three and six percent. They're like eight and 15 percent. Hey, Brad, it's a it's a remarkable thing uh, to, to see these nasty little walls and they must when you hit something where the percentage grade goes into double digit, you know that these guys are feeling it in their legs. You don't even need one of those uh, one of those uh, load sensing trainers to all of a sudden just watch your numbers hit a wall there. And uh, I suspect these guys are all sophisticated enough that they do have the fun uh, force feedback trainers that will indeed give them the real sense of these hills. Yeah, I would say the short, steep climbs are definitely a hallmark of the riding in uh, in Arkansas. It's uh, <clears throat> it's rolling, but uh, some pretty steep rollers, I would call them. There's there's a few alpine-ish climbs. I mean, if you're looking for a really long climb, you want to be sitting on the climb for 30, 40 minutes, something like that. 
there's you can find them i guess they're not going to be as steep obviously as a true mountain climb but really i guess the uh the defining features of uh, of the climbing in arkansas would be short and punchy good way to describe these climbs today as well yeah it's kind of uh kind of like some of the gnarlier spring classics courses that end up happening in like the north of france or perhaps the eastern part of the uh, uh the netherlands netherlands is a funny place i've 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 been there once or twice uh I actually went to the highest point in the Netherlands. It's uh, quite interesting because what happens is uh, you go to the east and to the south to a degree, so somewhere in the outskirts of Maastricht um, in in the Netherlands, and you can find this not much of a climb, but uh, nonetheless it's a climb. You go up and up, and just as you reach the highest point of land in the Netherlands, the Netherlands ends. It's uh, that highest point in the Netherlands is right on the triple boundary with uh, both Germany and uh, I think it's Belgium at that point. So, uh, right. As soon as as soon as Netherlands as as those uh, as those gnarly Low Countries territories uh, get it all hilly, they just give up on being the Low Countries. Back to our race, we've got Ian Walker continuing to tap out the watts. He's on one of these little rolling slopes, and. Uh, you know, he's doing okay, but I'm not sure if he's making a uh, if he's making a uh, any sort of uh, impression on the uh, gap between himself and Alfreds. And meanwhile, Arkang is still he's still in touch with Walker, but uh, definitely not closing that gap either. So this is very. I think we're seeing this decisive moment where this is going to become a race of three time trials uh, at this point. So as we, we watch this event turn into a time trial a little bit, and we can see Shelly Navin continuing to maintain her own pace and uh, managing things, I think that Damon's got a little something for us to look at. We've been talking a lot in the last few weeks about, uh, in these last races, about Jacqueline Godby. Uh, she's a, I, we should say Dr. Jacqueline Godby. She's, uh, I believe, got a PhD and is now going for an MD, or is it the other way around? Do you remember? Uh, I think has... I don't know. I don't know. Uh, that's a that's that's an unfair pop quiz. I'll just sneak it over. Yeah, uh, she has a PhD in chemistry, and I believe uh, is uh, currently studying doing uh, her medical doctor studies. So uh, I guess when she completes those, I think the protocol is that we'll refer to her as Doctor Doctor Jacqueline Godby. But the yeah. reason that we're talking about. Uh, <laughs> God be right now is aside from being a uh, uh, a, a real force in our uh, previous events, I believe that Damon's got a little interview with uh, Jack Plin I'd like to uh, show you in a few moments. So uh, we'll keep chatting while uh, Damon cues that up. But meanwhile, we follow along with Shane Alfreds. He's just cruising along. His gap is out to about three kilometers now. Um, so he's got to be feeling quietly confident as he closes in on the 3k to go um, um, 30 kilometers to go and I think now Damon's going to show us the uh, interview with Jacqueline Godby so we commend this to you we'll be back in a moment State your name, your age, and your nationality. Hi, yeah, so I'm Jackie Godby. I am 30 years old, and I am uh, part from the United States of America, currently live in Chicago, Illinois. That's awesome, Jackie. And you've been sweeping the podiums for the last two weeks with two wins at the last two Cycling BC Virtual BC Cups. Um, now, which team are you racing for? So I am racing for Triple X, and we've also got two men over on the men's side. It's a relatively small team, but we're quite powerful, uh, particularly once you know those two male racers are my coach and my fiance, respectively. Yeah, you guys are powerhouses out there. You sweep in the women's field, and, and they're throwing it down in the men's cats as well. Um, now, regarding Saturday's race, the Criterium and Canary Wharf. It was 
let's not as exciting of a stage as the first one with a relatively flat course. Um, so did you have a pre-race plan for that day? Yeah, so going in, uh, knew it was a flat course, knew it was going to be very little up and down, so you weren't going to plan on a lot of letting the hills lead the attrition race. You know, you couldn't rely on people just deciding that this 5%, this 10% grade, this 20% grade, like we saw uh, that first week, was just going to be too much. So you really had to take advantage of the RGT physics. So going in, I knew, I think a good strategy was going to be to get that core group down as much as possible for a reduced group bunch sprint, but that we were always going to see that reduced bunch sprint at the end. And so that was what I was going into with the mentality, every lap thinking, you know, how can I make everybody else hurt while still saving myself, still saving the freshness for that final, uh, final finish line. Yeah, that's really awesome. Um, and I noticed that on the first the first stage of the race, you went for the, the solo breakaway and just rode straight off. Um, but for this race, you decided to stay within the pack and kind of and kind of toy with them rather than try and break away. So, did you have a lot of faith in your your sprint for the day? I actually, it wasn't so much of faith in my sprint for the day as much as faith that I was just going to be reeled back in on that short of a course. You know, I did not think that a breakaway that I led was really going to succeed, um, particularly in such a, such a small field where, you know, you have this small group of women who many of them are teammates um, and would be able to put together a very effective chasing pack. Okay, yeah, that, that makes sense. So you decided to play it safe with the smaller course on the flat course. Um, now talking about RGT and the courses and the physics, next weekend is going to be on the Dirty Reaver course. So there's going to be quite a bit more climbing. Than so what's your, what's your goal for the weekend, obviously? Apart from winning, is there something that you'd like to achieve? Um, I would very much love to make a breakaway. You know, I think if there is, was you know, one course out of the series that's really designed for it. It is the Dirty Reaver. I think the combination of, you know, the one, two hill sort of punch where you have that sh very short, very steep 90 second hill in the beginning, followed by that very steep longer climb on the gravel, you know, really sets you up for some exciting group dynamics. You know, now that I've said it, it's out in the open. We'll see how the field reacts. Yeah, it definitely will be. I think it'll be a little different from the last two weeks. Um, and we're excited to see you ripping up the women's field. Um, thanks a lot for taking the time to chat with me this afternoon, Dave. Yeah, thank you so much. This was a lot of fun. Well, if Godby likes long, hard courses, she's going to love this one today. This will be a course that uh, she knows well because uh, she raced with us in the virtual Joe Martin stage race. So uh, she'll have raced on this course before. This course also available on RGT, so uh, the riders could have gone and reconned it before. But you heard Jackie kind of talking about some strategy. Uh, she's one of the few riders, Ryan, that has the ability to choose how a race is going to play out. She talked about the difference between wanting a sprint or wanting a breakaway. There are very few riders that have the luxury of being able to want for a certain scenario in a race like this. Jackie Godby is absolutely incredible. I mean, we're talking about a top five in the world level virtual rider and uh, sort of new to bike racing. She was a triathlete uh, leading up to this one Chicago triathlon, but I am really, really excited to see Jackie Godby hopefully do a little bit more bike racing in uh, the future here because I think she has really uncovered a pretty impressive talent uh, from racing on RGT. Oh yeah, absolutely, Brad. I mean, I know that she's, uh, I'm sure that she's done very well in triathlon. What we've seen here, I, I hope I'm given the, the advice that uh, if she got out into the world of road racing in the, in the real world, whenever we're able to do that, uh, I think she's going to be an, an immediate force at any level of competition that she cares to step into. So she could be one of these great unsung talents where a year or two from now, uh, she's going to be almost, in, she's going to be an overnight success.
road racing and everybody will be where did she come from and the answer came from rgt i mean perhaps it'll also be she came from triathlons but her first taste of road racing has been this virtual road racing in rgt and she's certainly shown i mean that doesn't determine bike handling or a lot of other things in the real world but she's shown a tremendous tactical acumen uh, she understands fairly exactly how bike races work She's not making sort of the, the basic tactical mistakes you'd expect. She, she's wise beyond her uh, racing. And uh, I hope she can turn that into a, uh, into a result in the, uh, on the uh, real roads of the world in the near future. Well, on the virtual roads of this virtual Arkansas, we've got Schertz continuing to prosecute his lead. He's out to about a 3.3 kilometer gap over Ian Wall. Walker is meanwhile continuing to open up on third place, Stang, who is uh, sitting at 620 meters and, and expanding in terms of his gap. And then we've got uh, Shelly Navin still tapping away, literally riding her own race as well as metaphorically. And we salute that a long ways to go, but she's uh, keeping in there. So, oh, good you, Shelly. You've got, uh, we're, we're excited for you and we hope you're enjoying the ride. Ian Walker, he's got to be thinking about what can he do here. So we take a peek at Shelly Nat. She is rolling. This has got to be, uh, you know, this is a this is a good event, if nothing else. Let's put it that way. But, uh, she'll be happy, I'm sure, for the mileage. This is the kind of uh, early days riding that will pay off for these riders later in the season. And hopefully, there will be a season for all of these folks. Uh, not sure what things are like in uh, in and around the Chicago area, which leave where Shelley's from. She's racing for the Triple X Athletic Team, which is a group that we've uh, uh, seen put a couple of other riders in the upper category. So, uh, like I say, she's getting a good workout here. She's putting in a solid effort, and she is getting close to the halfway distance on her race. Triple X getting Switch their back. custom kit in the RTT game. Uh, teams can basically pay to have their uh, their design rendered into the game because Triple X had Jackie racing at uh, the highest level in the Echelon Racing League. They got their their kit in the game, and uh, same way we got the uh, Cycling BC kit in the game here. Yeah, and those those virtual kits look fantastic. It's lovely to see the the, the detail and the rendering. I, I am, uh, I'm viewing this stuff secondhand. My uh, computer's uh, graphics card could be um, best described as a potato. So I'm not sure what the what the full and most awesome power is of the uh, of the RGT platform. But uh, what I can see, it does a pretty good job of random stuff like the details in these virtual kits. It looks like a nice outfit. I I should uh, strap it on and uh, and get get into some virtual bike riding and racing myself and maybe uh, try on that uh, excellent looking uh, pink CBC kit there. Sometimes it's a little weird to see the riders uh, on their, you know, Zoom cameras. Some races will uh, will have a camera on the riders. They, I'll, let's, I'll say they're very rarely zipped up on the jersey. I think the <laughs> preferred way to race is, uh, is usually just a base layer in bibs, although some people going with the just bibs look which isn't always best uh, depending on the zoom angle i've seen some bad ones yeah well they're uh you know those looks in their pain caves they're uh they're they're built for speed not beauty that's for sure uh one of my 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 good friend Stuart lynn is one of the more prolific virtual bike racers in the world he's uh he happily rides away pain cave at the bottom of his house but uh He's expressed to me that the typical setup is first of all have as many fans as you can because fans are basically a performance a performance enhancement in virtual racing, and second he says he tends to start with a uh, with a jersey on for the warm up and the race start, and then it just slowly gets uh, less and less kit. So you can just imagine all of your virtual virtual bike racers doing kind of a uh, slow motion strip tease during the. That I've put that uh, image into your minds. I'm sure none of you will ever be able to shake it. So enjoy and hope you're having a great Saturday morning.
just like Shane Alfred's is. He, he's got about a three and a half kilometer gap as he hits another one of these little rolling hills in his race. 23 kilometers to go for him. Ian Walker is still in second place. He's got about 27 and a bit kilometers left in his event. And he's about half K behind Alfred's, but he's also put about a 600 or so meter gap on uh, Jimmy R. Kang, who is holding down third position now. So all three of our riders are kind of established in their situations. They've got to be mostly hoping that they don't have some sort of a real or virtual mechanical. We've certainly seen those network drop factor in these races, um, as well as just having a bad day. And I suppose supposedly you could manage to have a flat tire, although it'd be a real embarrassment if riders manage to have a uh, flat tire from riding on their trainer. That's just a level of not inspecting uh, your equipment that I think <laughs> I will tell you I've seen it happen there was a rider that was oh. using one of the uh, old like friction trainers that actually rubs the wheel against a drum on the back was not using a trainer tire it uh, overheated the wheel and blew the tube up inside <laughs> and yes they flatted on a trainer <laughs> during a virtual race so it is possible if uh, you're running one of the the older trainers, the non-smart trainers, I guess, non-direct drive. That's the that's the term that they use now for the ones that hook right into uh, right into the cassette. But uh, yeah, blew a tire up on the trainer, so it's possible. <laughs> okay, that's 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 got to be the. I, I, well, actually, it's probably not the most embarrassing way to lose a virtual race, but it's it's really Still close. I, I'm sure there's been one or two riders who have managed to fall off their trainers in a in a fist sprinting, but still. Uh, yeah. So, riders, if any of you want to send in your uh, your most embarrassing way that you have had a uh, had a mechanical or a, on in a virtual race or a virtual ride, let us know. We'll definitely be sharing those stories if any of you can get those in. So you can you can I'm add sure me at, uh, on Twitter at our cuisine. If you if you need to, R C O U S I N E. So uh, don't forget to like, comment, and subscribe while you're there. They're going to be lining up to share their deepest secrets, <laughs> listing every time they've fallen over, clipped in at a red light. I haven't done that for years on a club ride. <laughs> oh man. Oh boy. Well, Shane Alfreds continues to not have any troubles whatsoever. Presumably he is using a direct drive trainer and he is tapping out the miles. He's got his gap is pretty steady. I think it's showing at about 2.75 kilometers and it's just as you go down all around this virtual Arkansas, he is in fact, I think, keeping that gap pretty indeed. Uh, if you look at the course profile that that Dave is showing us at the bottom of the screen right now. You can see that we're marked on Shane Alfred's and then there's dots in the flat lines behind him. So Shane is sort of going up one of these uh, not insubstantial rolling climbs that we're facing. And you can see that he's got a real gap between himself and the two chasing riders. And there's a smaller gap between those two riders. So Walker and Arkang still have an opportunity here to uh, get together, but I fear that the clock is ticking on them that uh, regardless whether they join up or not um, Walker and Arkang are just starting to fall Far enough behind and with the race clock ticking down as it were uh, Walker seeing 25 to go Arkang now 26 kilometers from the finish uh, Those two riders no matter how much effort they can put in just may not have enough time to close this gap so they're probably both starting to think more about managing their race with each other than they are about any hope of catching back up to Alfred's. Yeah, this will be game over pretty soon. It's going to be uh, insurmountable for these guys to bring back Alfred's with a 25K to go. Alfred's sitting 2.5K, yeah. 2.6K ahead of Walker, and then... Our Kang 700 meters back from Walker. You can see that distance on the very right of uh, the list of riders' names. I'm surprised our Kang's still holding at 700. I mean, usually uh, once you go past like five, 600 meters, it, it uh, often blows up in spectacular fashion. But uh, Jimmy, our Kang hanging in there, doing a nice job today. 
I think Alfred's is watching Netflix up on the front right now. He, uh, <laughs> I'm seeing a lot of green under his name. Yeah. Alfred's is sitting in the catbird seat, so um, I'll, I'll I'll check with uh, Shane after the when he's uh, willing to text me again and find out if uh, find out if he's uh, willing to share what he's been uh, what he's been watching or uh, what is Te- preferred. Text him uh, right now. I get, he, he can look at his phone. He's got a two point three k lead. Come on, you can you can give a little interview here, Shane. I am texting him right now. Nobody can see this, but you'll have to trust me. I've I've messaged him. Book. Hey, Shane, how's the race? We'll we'll see. We'll watch and see if his. I mean, he may not have his phone nearby, but uh, if that doesn't work and if app continues to go up, I'll I'll just use the messenger phone call feature and see if we can loop in Shane for an on race interview. This is how the pros do it, right? I'm. Pretty sure I've seen video of uh, of Bradley Wiggins as a commentator leaning over and interviewing riders mid race. Uh, seems like that works out well. Yeah, this is the virtual Definitely. version of that. We'll see if uh, we'll see if his power drops out. If uh, we can spot the moment <laughs> where he gets the message. <laughs> hey Shane, how you doing? Or if he just maybe he'll wave <laughs> off the camera like they do sometimes when <laughs> you get too close and they just want to be left alone. The riders do have some. <laughs> Like emotes, I guess, is the best way to describe them. I think they can wave at will, uh, like when riders pass them or something like that, and then there's a little bit of celebration. So maybe Shane can That's wave right, us Shane, off. If you can... if, uh... Yeah. Shane, if you can hear us, you can give us a little wave and tell us how it is at the front there. Uh... <laughs> it's uh, it's very possible that Shane is doing the problem and ignoring us because turns out he actually is in a bike race and as it may be, it feels probably all too real to him at the moment because his heart rate 155 beats per minute just for the fun of it, is it? Meanwhile, Walker continues to try to chase him down. Uh, they're all sort of on a climb at the moment, so again, these gaps may be compressing a little bit, but gap is probably not compressing enough for Ian's like closed it down to about 1.8k, but as I said, I think that's a... Uh, I think that's a compression effect of these riders on the climb. And similarly, Jimmy Arkang, who's just rolled into the bottom of him, is now down to about 500 meters between him and Walker. But I don't think that represents a serious closing of those gaps. So we're seeing these sort of, these riders kind of be one, two, three. We're <laughs> Sorry. The reason for the laughter is I just got it from Shane. Um, so I, I can now see what his suffer face is. And I'm just going to say that uh, probably all of you out there are fortunate that you can't see Shane's suffer face. I'm just going to tweet this out. It's a great race, and I'm sure Shane won't mind if I just share his photo. He says he, he did give us a response. He says the race is hard. <laughs> so we salute you, Shane. Thank you for being uh, very entertaining for us. We're uh, we're glad that you're such a, willing to be such a good sport with uh, with uh, your commentators here. <laughs> he says his legs are. Bur- so th- oh, there's no wonder. You, we, uh, we... Go, ahead. Go ahead. It's no wonder this race is you, so Shane. hard. There's some guy up on the front doing three watts per kilo for the last hour. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Shane. Yeah. You may be the architect of your own pain. <laughs> the reason for the gap in commentating here is that uh, someone may be posting this photo to uh, Twitter as we speak. <laughs> Shane shares that it was not his plan to go solo in this race, so... Uh, you know, oops, accidental. Uh, we all hate it when that happens. I mean, maybe not. Yeah. This is pretty good. So what we have to do is Shane is continuing to chat to me. So we have to watch and see whether his uh, watts per kilo is uh, steady while he's doing this. I see him at about 2.1 watts per kilo, 2.2. He's maintained a lead as he does this. Uh, you know, we're, we're, we're reaching ex- new moments in... Uh, in race interview technology here. He says, it wasn't his plan to solo, but with Ian and Jimmy not working together, he went for it. So that's actually an illustration of something real, which is that 
uh, Shane is probably, we're going to interpret Shane's words there, which is he could probably see at some point that there was a gap forming between Walker and Arkang. And once he notices that from a racing perspective, he knows that he's not going to have to um, race against those two working together. And so if they're not working together, then he'll just basically know that he puts in the watts and turns it into a time trial that he'll... Uh, He'll get paid off for that uh, in the sense that uh, he will only have to race against them one on one rather than race against them doing a team time trial. So uh, that's the kind of tactical acumen that you can put into a virtual race. And that's fairly particularly a piece of information you wouldn't have in most normal bike racing. I mean, if you're very lucky and you're at a very high level, you might have the Moto Man come by to give you group compass and that sort of information. But when you're in a race, you get group composition information and gaps, at least distance, if not time, uh, all in real time and updated more than once. And so if you know what you're doing and you know what to look for in those, you can create a very, um, you can be very strategic about your racing. We go back and watch the Walker versus Alfred's gap. It's now up to 3.3 kilometers. So, pretty steady. He's inside the 20 kilometer to go mark, riding for the herd, riding out of the Lake City Cycling Club, and just tapping out the tempo. He's an hour and a half into his pain cave. I can see from his selfies, feeling just great, I'm sure. And uh, since, uh, since, bragging about it earlier i would say from this selfie that he has in fact uh shit racing jersey if he was indeed wearing one at the start of his event he's he's down to what i hope is bib shorts and uh he is continuing however to execute his event just in the way that he would want to well he says he says it was unexpected but uh nonetheless he has to be content with having taken the opportunity when it came to him uh, you know we're using an economic metaphor. He wasn't going to leave a $20 bill sitting on this sidewalk. Where he was walking quick to retrieve it. And it looks like the bill has paid off because he's got about a 3.8 kilometer lead over Walker. And Walker got not quite a kilometer on, on Jimmy R. Kang. <laughs> yeah. And I'm getting more messages from Shane. So our interview continues. He says, I was ready to... I suspect this is a typo. He says, I was ready to read up if they started gaining on me, but uh, we'll have to guess what read was supposed to be um, uh, before autocorrect got it, hold of it. But I think what he means is to speed up if they started gaining on me. So uh, is basically saying that he was very much in control of, of this here. And indeed, this looks like a rider who's very much in control of the gap. Now, I think Shane is attentive to the idea that he's probably not the best climber of these, though he did put in a pretty solid piece of power effort on the first climb. And as we roll along this flat section, if you look at the parkour at the bottom of the screen, you can get the big climb is coming. So this is not quite as big in the road as the initial climb that comes about 10 or 15k into this race. But nonetheless, this is kind of a decisive moment here. So... Uh, the key thing is that for Alfreds, he's going to have a pretty substantial lead. So I think what he'll be able to do is just sort of ride within himself and not stress too much about losing much of his lead uh, as he goes over that climb. And then in the race, we've got a climbing finish. But again, his his gap at this point is five kilometers to go. So even if you consider the finishing parkour might favor the chasers here, Walker and Artang, don't think it's going to five kilometer favor them in 20K. And indeed, Alfred seems comfortable with his effort as we see Walker just about to crest one of those last little little lumps. And still about 4.8k behind. And I have to mention it, it appears that we missed Shelly Navin, so I don't know if she had a mechanical, a lung canical, or just, uh, you know, found that maybe a solo 70k was not in the cards today, but... Uh, Nonetheless, we salute her. She gave us some good riding and some good effort. And, uh, you know, even if she's going to be a DNF today, at least we will honor her as the 
best of the Cat 4 women's category here. But we look back at our surviving riders. We've got Shane Alfred's continuing to maintain his lead um, as in between efforts of uh, giving us some insight. He's approaching the bottom of one of the last big climbs. Uh, just as we see Ian Walker uh, climbing over one of the smaller climbs on the course. So Walker continues to be about 500, sorry, 5,000 meters behind uh, Shane. And then Jimmy Arkang is still on the climb just over the crest, 300 meters behind Walker, which is about as small as that's been in a while, but I don't know if he's going to be able to close in any further than that. I suspect for Walker and Arkang that the race is really between the two of them at this point. That looks up that still may, may be manageable, whereas I don't think the 5K and Walker's in any meaningful way manageable anymore. Yeah. yeah you're going to need a little more space than that if uh, you want any race-changing races to happen. Uh, so, Walker and Arkang... Uh, this one could still change. 21K to go. That's uh, certainly enough time to swap out a 700-ish meter lead for Walker back to Arkang. But uh, I think they're out of time for Alfred's. Over 4K, 21K to go. It would take a miracle. I'll say yeah. that. We'll have to find out if uh, Shane Alfred's has a direct drive or a AI trainer and thus whether or not there's any chance of a flat tire uh, laying him low because that may be about the only hope that Walker and Arkang have at this point. Um. <laughs> I don't know if your I don't know if your bike shops are open in Canada, but I think Shane has time to flat break his trainer, go to the bike shop, get back, hook it up, and he'd still have about a one k yeah. lead. Yes, indeed, the bike shops are open there, of course. Uh, actually, I think they were open even, yeah, bringing a bit of the real world. Even uh, even at the height of the uh, of the pandemic and, and, and lockdown-type closures, I think that bike shops were quite regarded as an essential service uh, because oh, for people yeah. in Vancouver, then transportation. Um, in the urban core of the city of Vancouver, I believe the mode share for bicycles is now right around 10%, which isn't... You know, that's not Dutch numbers, but that's not bad for a major North American city. And it's certainly a, a number that has uh, gratifyingly risen over the last many years. And I think that reflects uh, improvements in infrastructure. I th think it reflects a greater interest in cycling for multiple very good reasons. I know it's just, it's fantastic to see as a guy who likes to ride and likes to ride to work and just more bicycles on the road and i think it also makes things for everyone i've been commuting to work by bicycle when when i had a commute um for nigh on to 20 years and i think that as there's been as time has gone on there's been better facilities like better bike routes and bike roads and there's also been more attention by car drivers just because there's more bikes out there honestly it's just nice to see a few more faces on bikes Looking forward to seeing the new faces on bikes as well. I know a lot of people getting uh, new bikes for the first time. If they were lucky enough to be able to find one early on. Yes, indeed. I I think that's exactly it. I've uh, I know that the local shops. It's you know, folks. If you if you are looking for a bicycle, you know, keep looking. You'll find them eventually. But it's been it's been challenging. I think for the supply has been challenged. I think the demand has been challenging. I mean, locals are doing great in the sense that they're selling whatever they can get a hold of. But uh, we're at the point where I don't know about locally, but certainly in some regions, I've heard people mutter about changes that uh, the literal, the metaphorical supply chain is having uh, trouble supplying literal chain uh, in the sense that I think there's been enough people getting back onto bikes and enough, you know, it being one of those recreational options that is still available to you when you can't go and meet with people because you can just ride around alone and be safe um, means that everybody and their dog has been bike, keeping up their bike, riding their bike. I mean, we're having this strange bike boom going on as we speak. And uh, I, I don't, you know, and it's going to stop. And I hope it doesn't, frankly. Not surprisingly, as a guy who likes to 
common terms I also like biking. <laughs> Meanwhile, we've got some bike racing going on. It, we're following Jimmy Arkang now. He's still about 880 meters speaker as he gets inside of 20 kilometers to go so he's just sort of riding within himself he's on one of these flat descents walkers not quite a kilometer out ahead of him and shane alfred sits about five kilometers ahead of arc just over just under four kilometers ahead of ian walker and alfred's is hitting the uh, slope so again you'll see the bit of that compression like you notice that shane alfred's lead is now dropping that's not because Alfred's is going slower. I guess actually it is because he's going slower. But it's not because he's doing any less. He's climbing the last big grade out here on the course before the finishing ascent. So you can see he's on a 10% grade and still getting a little steeper. I'm not sure what this particular climb peaks out at. But you'll get that natural compression. But nonetheless, uh, it doesn't really reflect that his lead is shrinking because what's going on is in the near future, Walker and Arkang will also have to do that same climb and will be similar. But uh, you can see by the wattage and the watts per kilo that's going out there that Alfred's is just basically riding within himself. So you'll notice that his numbers are still in that sort of middle two watts per kilogram, which is right around where Walker and Arkang are also riding. So they're all kind of keeping a very steady effort. It's all just steady, steady, get to the finish. I mean, Alfred's has got to be attentive. He's got 15K to go. I think we're estimating that this is something like a... Uh, something like a uh, two-hour, 15-minute race, maybe a little less than that. Meanwhile, we'll tell you a little bit about what's coming up uh, later on this morning. Uh, the two and three races are in the staging period, which means that uh, in about 15 minutes, we'll be able to see the Category 2 and Category 3 fields uh, start their races. Those will be our last races. Those folks will be doing the same course as we've seen previewed here with the Cat 4s. Um, so their races will probably be, given the Cat 2 and 3 field strength, we'll see them come in a little faster. I am at a lead finish right around the two hour mark. Um, give or take, should see a race pace of about 35 kilometers an hour, I'm thinking. Uh, whereas you can see that these guys are maintaining a steady race pace of more like 32. It's not a, not a big difference, but also there'll be larger fields for the Cat 2 and 3s, as you can see. So they will have, um, they will have a, a little more of a competitive uh, pace. And uh, certainly we'll, uh, we'll be ready to talk about them. I see I see a few familiar folks like the Cat 2s. We've got... Uh, Young Luke Hubner lined up there all the left, along with a couple of other uh, familiar riders. Maybe, maybe since. Appears that, uh, let's see, Whiting is. Huh. Off to, oh, there we go. Jonathan Whiting. Yeah, he's, uh, ah, yes. I'll have to tell you a good story about John Whiting later on, but uh, we'll 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 come to that. Shane Alfreds is continuing to tap out the tempo, um, so he will be this Cap Four race. Just to give you some of the logistics, Cap Four race will be finishing after the uh, Cat Twos and Threes start, uh, given the relative paces and all. Though. In a few minutes, we will cut away to show you the start of the Cat 2 and 3 races, and we'll talk about them a bit. But we will definitely come back to Shane, Ian, and Jimmy in order to see how their race wraps up, and we'll certainly show you the uh, the highlights from that. Um, I mean, I'm not saying this is a foregone conclusion. I think that our Kang are still settling this event on the road, but Shane Alfred's is on his parade lap at this point. It is 14 kilometers ago go so it's going to be a parade but if he can keep up anything like this kind of steady pace then he's basically going to have a triumphal roll to the finish he managed to settle matters much earlier in the race and build up an insurmountable lead at that time yeah, i saw some new names on uh, the start line we were trying to look up some of the riders for our next batch of races 
I, I hope those new names create uh, some new tactics. I mean, I hope uh, some new players in the game mix things up in uh, our 2-3 race coming up here. It'll be interesting to watch. This one certainly played out different than week three. Alfred's Walker and Arkang stuck together for a lot longer, although uh, based on the, your text with Shane, it sounds like he wouldn't have minded sticking together for a little longer, but uh, just kind of found himself off the front and kept on at it. Yes, indeed. Yeah. I mean, sometimes you find yourself racing the race that comes to you. And I think that's what Shane is kind of expressing today that uh, you know, there was a free opportunity for him and he wasn't going to, uh, he wasn't going to throw it away. And indeed he, he, he nailed it, which is he had an opportunity to put in a gap. That gap was decisive and he's been able to tread away from these other two riders. And basically he's managed to win the race when the race was winnable. Um, this is a good lesson for any rider, which is, yeah, I mean, really the most glorious way to win a race is of course, always a sprint finish. Don't let breakaway artists tell you otherwise. Sprints are the best kids, trust me. But nonetheless, sometimes if the breakaway comes to you, then you should absolutely take that opportunity. And when you've got a relatively small field, which is what we had, especially when the riders all know each other, you can really keep track of things. Alfred's to worry about getting chased down by 10 eager riders. He just had to manage two riders and two riders who knew that they were racing very directly second and third. So as soon as he was able to, you know, get himself sort of out of sight and out of mind, then Walker and Arkang very much understood that they were racing more against each other than they were uh, Alfred's. And once they had that in their minds, there, there was them to work together and work to the finish. And, and this is kind of, well, racing is a game and that's what game theory looks like sometimes. So we're watching Alfred's. He's down at the 13.3 kilometer to go mark. He is just about to crest minor major hill that he's got to face. It is a climbing finish, so there is actually one. But this is the last climb out on the road, as it were, before that final one. He's uh, held on to his gap. You can see, quote unquote, shrunk down to two kilometers. But that's in reflection of the fact that Alfred's has just finished the climb that Walker hasn't quite started yet. So the is much larger. I think it'll be continue to be more like about five kilometers when we get to the finish. And indeed, Alfred's is just rolling, rolling, rolling away. And he's got to be very happy with where he is. You can mark it in your copy book. He went over the climate, I think, about one minute 52 or sorry, one hour, 52 minutes even. So we'll see how long it takes for Walker to get to the same top of the climb. And that'll give us a time gap as well as a distance gap. Nice. Good eye. <laughs> well, one of my past lives was being the uh, Moto Man, which is, by the way, if you ever have to volunteer for a task in a local bike race and they happen to have a moto, uh, a uh, timing motorcycle, do whatever you can to be either the pilot or the passenger on that because that is basically the best view of the race possible. Your entire job is more or less to circulate at the front of the race between the breakaway and the peloton and to give those crime gaps as necess as possible. And uh, if the commissaires trust you, you'll even be assigned to the task of getting those time gaps. So I'm not saying you become a baby commissaire, but I'm saying that you'll get the best view in the house. You'll be the favorite motor. You'll be the favorite person for all of the riders to see because they always want more information about the race situation. And, uh, you know, what better day way to spend a, a bike racing day than uh, riding around on the back of a motorcycle, especially a uh, motorcycle pilot has the brief to Okay, you've given the time gap to this group. Now let's get to the other group as quickly as we can so that we can time gaps out. I imagine that uh, volunteer role fills up quickly at the beginning of the day. It's to ride on the back <laughs> of the fun, fast moto. Everyone raised their hand. I, uh, there's I actually got there's the job. There's never a line to be the announcer's assistant. The, nobody ever lines up to help us out. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, well, 
And that's why we appreciate Damon so much. Uh, he's both our uh, he's both our videographer, our streamer, and our uh, announcer's assistant here. So he's uh, he's doing a fantastic job. I and didn't I know he was our announcer's must... assistant. In that case, I could use a sandwich and a coffee, Damon, if you could <laughs> make that happen. Yeah, Damon's, Damon's like I to never agreed aesthetic. to any of this. I'm just here to stream the thing. I don't know who these guys are. I don't know how they got in the broadcast. <laughs> Later on, we're probably going to show you a, a setup photo, but I see that we're about five minutes four to go before our cat two threes. So I can tell you, I just got a direct message from Shane. He says, try dragging 115 kilometers over this course. Uh, I think that he's, uh, he's feeling the suffering, but we salute you. So first of all, Shane, that's solid. That is a solid weight. And if that's really what you entered into, uh, into uh, RGT, then I, I have to admire you. Yeah, Damon's going to show us a little photo here it takes to get one of these uh, races going. So uh, let's let's take a look at that. This is uh, Damon's setup. So he says this was from last uh, from two weeks ago, the Dirty Reaver. So you can see that I think that Damon has more more screens in his uh, in his uh, streaming zone than uh, I do in my entire household. Um, and I'm a pretty big nerd, so. Uh, chapeau but we really salute damon because uh you can hear us taking breaks and moments away but damon has to stream from pretty much beginning to end uh, we have a strict policy of um of finding out how um damon uh, his breaks which is we don't ask him we don't tell so yeah but salute to to shane alfreds because as he says he is all at rider i'm not going to make too much of his avoir de pas but clearly the guy is a mean category was always my home category and for a guy riding around and looking this strong at 115 kilograms remember that's calculated into his watts per kilo so that's why you can see here he is shane is ticking along at 2.4 watts per kilo 2.5 watts per kilo but you'll notice that's about 300 watts for any amateur rider to be holding steady in the you know high 200s low 300s that's a substantial amount of power um, you know uh 300 watts is this steady functional threshold power of some pros now the difference is those pros do not weigh 115 kilograms uh, nonetheless it's it's a real power output and if you're wondering why shane is able to ride away from these guys it's because uh hills or not he's got plenty of watts so He's been pretty strong. I think this will be, when he puts this away, I think this will be two in a row for Shane. I think that our Kang may have beat him in one of the first two races, but uh, I'm sure. <laughs> he, I, Shane is copying that he doesn't think that he's usually at a racing weight of 150. Some of that is COVID weight. So uh, respect to Shane. Trust me, you're doing a lot better than I am at uh, keeping your fitness up. I uh my bikes are looking at me mournfully at the moment. I'm pretty sure they're wondering when I'm going to actually step back onto one again. But, you know, so it goes. So we're about, uh, it looks like we're going to be about 90 seconds from the start of the Cat 2s and 3s. So we'll be cutting away shortly to see that. Um, meanwhile, we can see that Shane and Ian and Jim are kind of sorted out this race. Shane is inside the 10K to go mark, so... I say he's got a cruise to victory because he's got one more hill to climb, but we're also watching because he's going to hit the uh, top of the hill pretty soon. And I said that it was about 154 even when Shane got there, and we've still got some go for Ian. So I be believe that if I look at roughly where the mark is going to be, we're going to call it an over a five-minute lead. I think this is going to stretch out to be near enough a six minute lead uh that uh shane has over ian at this point and ian has still got a substantial gap of kang behind him so i don't know if we'll be able to take that time gap because i'm pretty sure we're gonna take a peek at the uh cat one two at the cat twos and cat three starts which are happening momentarily we've got about 25 seconds left to go so we will introduce you to some of those riders. It'll be the usual thing, which is, of course, we're going to see a big lightning quick beginning to this race. In fact, you'll probably be able to see the watts per kilo ramp up if you look at the little numbers beside our riders here. And Brad, I'll let you take the call if you're ready to do it. 
Yeah, a few of them ramping up, although I'm concerned for the ones that, that uh, aren't. I see Weaslake starting in the yellow over on the right-hand side. Meanwhile, on uh, our screen over to the left, the Cat 2 is Geisler flying out of the gate. You can already see the riders that got caught out uh, not starting hard enough. It's uh, incredibly important in the virtual world uh, because when that uh, clock hits zero, it's taking the power that you're putting in right now. So there's really, look at the power graph in the upper left corner for Geisler here. <laughs> you can see the starting power before the hammer dropped and then looks like my portfolio over the last couple of weeks after that. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, uh, Geisler we know has been an incredible factor in this is over the last few weeks. So there's no doubt that Vince Geisler is uh, a young rider. I'm not sure if he was actually attempting to create an instant break in the gun or if he just didn't want to get caught out. Um, but, but he'd be contented to let the gap come back to him. And it looks like the, uh, looks like the race is recomposing. Uh, we're not seeing a substantial gap. Like you can see from 1st through 11th, it's showing is about a 30 meter distance, but that's really just that the pack is so far. So this is Grupo Compacto right from the start. I'm not sure what our total race, what our total field size is. I think it's a little bigger than a but uh, lots of familiar names there. We can see, uh, as I said, we can see Giesler, who's been a factor in these races all along. That's uh, Tom Flower, is that right? Or if I give the wrong name once again. Um, and other, uh, we've got some other regulars. Jamie Dumper from the island of Vancouver, a former middle distance rider. And my old friend Shane Griffard, or mostly the son of my old friend Susan Griffard, Shane. So I know that uh, uh, Shane's mom, Susan, is uh, she's retired now, and she's always been a huge fan of bike racing. That was what we would talk about at work, uh, was uh, how the Tour de France was going. And I know that she's been following these events uh, avidly, so I'm sure she is out here on her son. So Shane, know for a fact that you've totally got a fan out there. And uh, I give a little hello to Susan, and I hope you're enjoying this race wherever you are. Right. And uh, Shane has actually done a pretty solid job of being an in these events he's definitely had some good finishes and been um a fact of these races and so we can see that the group i think it's going to go down to about uh, uh i'm not sure if it's 12 deep but uh i see my old buddy brian delisser is a little bit dropped so hopefully he can get back on there before he gets into too much trouble and meanwhile we're sneaking over a peek at the category three race it had a slightly less frenetic uh beginning and it looks like it's formed up into a fairly steady group. These guys may be thinking more. I don't know. Well, I see some attacking riders there. Uh, it's Mr. Israel. I think that'll be Shane Israel. Let's see. Uh, right. Simon Israel, my mistake, from the uh, Gastown Cycling Club, a good local team. Uh, he's gotten up to the front. And then there's, uh, um, I believe that is Brian Vind. He's uh, also a local boy. So you can see now this cat active. Uh, Weaslake is off the front a little bit. We followed up. There's another attack going away. I think that's Simon Israel off the front. Now Cox, keep up with it. This is the sort of early attacks where these are simultaneously, I think, to shred each other um, and to maybe get a little bit of a breakaway going. But also these attacks will have the effect that anybody is showing any weakness they will very quickly be spat out the pack and we can see already there's one rider in the cat threes who's fallen a bit behind and that'll be a problem and similarly i think we've got one rider off the back in the cat twos on i'm afraid it may be my old buddy brian delissier so brian was pretty brave i think to uh attempt in the cat twos but he's a he's a good strong guy and i hope he'll have a uh, ride out of this regardless i hate to see a race like this uh ended early i guess when you see a rider get dropped uh, it's really hard to get back into the group when a rider has a rough early start but uh it's nice to see a group this big surviving in uh in both of our categories here as you see geesler and vandergreen up at the front now these are two guys that are going to be setting 
a pretty serious pace. So uh, there will be plenty of riders in this group that are just trying to hang on today, just trying to stay in the group, and that's fine. That is a, that's a battle in itself, let's say. But the racing dynamics of this one will be significantly different than the racing dynamics that we saw in uh, our Category 4 open race. Yeah, absolutely. We're taking a peek back at the Cat 4s, and we can see that has gotten himself inside of the five kilometers to go, so I'm sure he's very happy about that. He can feel the end coming as he clocks over the two hour and five minute mark. Uh, Ian Walker is sort of riding in his own race. He's got about 10k to go, and we're looking back at threes because it looks like we've got a little breakaway. It's going to be Vandergreen Matthews getting off the front, but can they hold that? They've got about a slight gap as they go. You can see the pack going up and down. Beautiful camera work here. Here, thank you. And it looks like the pack has caught him, but a uh, brave little attack. And now I see a counterattack because it looks like Weaslake is not content with just catching them. Looks like a lot of guys are not just content with catching. I think that there's some real attacking going on here. And it's interesting to see these riders trying to establish, uh, establish breakaways even before we get to the first climb. So there's uh, uh, no patience in these fields. They've definitely decided to go out on full attack. And you can see paces. Here we are rolling around on the flat, and these two fields are going at 40, and, excuse me, almost 45 kilometers an hour for the Cat 3. So that tells you how hard it is out there. And just look at the wattage numbers these guys are putting out. Meanwhile, we peek back at the Cat 2s. They seem to be a little more group compacto at the moment, so... Keep an eye on the Cat 3s, I think, because Vandergreen is going out on another, another adventure. And these rate, they are going to approach the first climb very rapidly indeed. Uh, in fact, I think technically the Cat 3s are uh, um, coming up to a positive slope already. So they've got a little lump in the road that appears on our parkour. They're um, uh, going to be on the climb proper, which starts out pretty gently before it gets very steep near the end. So they're going to be sort of on 2 and 3% grades for quite a few kilometers before they finally get to the steepest grades, which I think on this first pitch, they're 15% peaking out. We've... Folks, I'm going to turn you over to Brad in a, for a moment because I'm going to try and deal with some technical difficulties that I've been chasing down all morning. Damon's telling me I sound a little chappy. See if I can uh, do that. You got to crank up the internet. Turn it up to 10. I had mine set right. on I got like to... three earlier today. You just have to turn on high performance mode. I was watching uh, the Category 3s earlier as uh, it seemed like they're spending a lot of time with the same riders on the front. Same thing here. I saw Graffard spending a ton of time there. Vandergreen was the guy at the front of the Cat 3s that really seemed to be driving it for a large portion of the day today. So I'm a little concerned that uh, we're seeing these riders have such a big impact on uh, the race here. Although that is definitely going to cause some splits. Here's Matthews for the Cat 3s and Bonafacci for the Cat 2s. Let's watch Matthews here for a little bit. Try and split this group. Bonafacci in almost the exact same scenario here. Trying to solo away. Although Bonafacci coming back. That one gets shut down and see if there's a counter. Meanwhile, Matthews on his own. We'll see if Vandergreen gets up to him and they can work together. These are two names that have been spending a lot of time at the front trying to set tempo at the front of the Cat 3 field. Ooh, Vandergreen actually going to bring a nice-looking group up with him. Chan, Weaslake, Staten also in here. And this is really now more dropping guys out of the back than it is sending riders off the front as this group balloons up to seven. It's about to be eight with Richards, and then nine will be Israel back there. Should make it on. Yes. And then Cox is going to be number 10 to come in. So uh, that was a big move right there, Ryan. 
Yes, indeed. It, uh, some real attacking racing going on there in the Cat 3s. And now we're we're taking a peek over, it looks like, at the Cat 2s, where Brett Boniface has uh, gone off the front. But, uh, you know, honestly, Brad, I like your pronunciation better. So he will from now on be Brett Boniface to me. Good Italian boy. I can assure you he's the only Italian ginger. So, uh, But, uh, yeah, Brett is uh, an active figure in local bike racing, as well as being an active figure here in virtual bike racing. And... He is off to the races. We know that Vince Giesler is also a real diesel, so uh, seeing his name up there as well uh, means that this is a this is an attack that may get chased down. But but Brett is putting in the wattage. He is trying to hold that group off. I go one way or the other with the last names. I either go like full pronunciation <laughs> or I just go full American. So it's either like Bonaface or Boneface. <laughs> those are the two ways I know how to read it. I, I like both of those versions, so I'll just use them alternately. But the problem is that um, I, I'm pretty sure Brett knows where I live, so I gotta gotta be kind of gentle on Brett. He's, uh, you know, he's he's a nice guy though, probably. <laughs> Please don't he's hurt not me, Brett. Nice to the field. He was not nice to the field this morning, that's for sure, because uh, he put the hammer down early on. Indeed he did, yes. Uh, you know, I guess he's one of those bike racers who's not here to make friends. We're uh, watching, yeah, we're guy. sneaking back a peek at the Cat 4s here as uh, Shane Alfreds gets within the 2K to go. Yeah, I guess that would be the double Fiam Rouge if there was such a thing, which there is not, by the way. Don't look for that when you're watching the Grand Tours uh, coming up later in this year. But Shane is at the 2K to go, Mark. He'll have a pretty... A pretty heavy-duty final two kilometers, however, because he's got a, a climb to finish off. You can see he's at three percent now. Ian Walker is still chasing it down, but he's a bit adrift. But I think that Ian has kind of locked up his uh, second place as long as again he keeps it steady, no flat tires on his uh, friction trainer. You know, doesn't fall off during the sprint, and I think Ian will be able to take care of business, as it were. So we will keep an eye on these riders as they continue to finish. But we're also peaking we'll just use all four of our eyes here brad as we watch the cat twos threes and the cat four break and chase all together seeing another little attack in the cat twos the cat threes are acting grupo compacto except for one or two unlucky riders and of course we know the composition of our cat four race we've got shane there on his parade we've got uh, ian just doing the steady work to close out his podium and we've got jimmy r king racing for honor and taking home third place as long as he can bring it home uh, in some number of minutes. I love the quad view here that we're getting. This is like uh, trying to watch all the pro racing that got rescheduled in Europe all for <laughs> the same weekends. There were some mornings where I had like four VPNs going trying to watch everything that was on. <laughs> I wish I had yeah. four eyes. It would be a lot easier. <laughs> Well, well, if you uh, choose your parents correctly, you can be like me and uh, be a lifelong glasses wearer. So. <laughs> Although I, I think that my uh, my classmates were polite enough that I never really got called four eyes. So, uh, you know, thank you to all the kids I grew up with for not being a jerk in that way. But, uh, anyways, we got some great bike racing, which you don't need four eyes to see, because as long as you've got one or two ears, you can hear this great commentary from you know, the esteemed Brad Soner founder of the Tour de Quarantine, a uh, truly fantastic YouTube series if you haven't seen it yet. I highly commend it to you. I do not want to spoil the result except to say that uh, I think it was a high point of both bike racing commentary and low comedy from uh, a, a, a shining light in the darkest days of the quarantine that Brad put together. And so uh, chapeau to him for that. And now we're lucky enough to have him here in the Cycling BC Virtual BC Cup as our lead commentator. And meanwhile, we watch Shane Alfreds pushing all of his 115 kilograms up the 15% grade. I'm sure he's regretting a lot of his life choices now, but, you know, pain fades glory is forever and soon his name will be eternally etched on whatever virtual cycling bc results web page there is so 
I imagine he's thinking about that very hard right now. So we take a peek at Brett Boniface trying to put his own mark on a bike race. He's uh, gotten about a hundred meter gap uh, over the chasing field as we hit the climbs in the category two field. So uh, Brett is a pretty lightweight rider, so I will not be surprised if he's able to uh, put a pretty killer pace up the hill here but i think that the cat twos understand that he's a danger man and indeed you can see them starting to respond lots of red numbers over there on the left this group actually riding together really well in the chase i'm impressed how close they are together on the climb it's really easy for a group like this to fall apart but uh these riders sticking together and that's exactly what they need to do because uh boniface is obviously having a good day he obviously feels good but I don't think you want to try and isolate up there with like two or three riders. So uh, this entire group of, let's see, two, four, six, I'll call it eight. I think there's two off screen right now. Pretty much staying together. It's exactly what you want to do on the climb because they're going to need all these guys to keep the uh, riders that are out of this group in like ninth, 10th, 11th place. You see on your screen right there, 12th at 600 meters back, 11th at 160 meters back on the left side of the screen. Those are the riders that this group is worried about right now. So I think uh, they're trying to ride together to make sure that they stay inside the top 10 and make yeah, sure that absolutely. they keep those leaders within sight. Yeah, indeed. I think that's they're just trying to manage the damage as they get up the hill. Meanwhile, as we look over at the Cat 3s, it's a little more Grupo Compacto, but no less torrid for it. So lots of red numbers, but nobody off the front. I believe that's Michael Matthews on the lead of the ride, but he has only a slight gap. And it is uh, we're seeing that field go about 10 deep. So there's 10 riders here from... Uh, Oh, we've got Vandergreen has taken over the... Uh, oh, no, sorry. We're looking at number two, Vandergreen. So there's now a slight gap there between Matthews and Vandergreen. But uh, this is a group of 10 who are effectively the lead of your field right now, stretching back to uh, Mr. Statton. Uh, but Matthews is starting to open up a slightly dangerous-looking gap. It will be interesting to see how this proceeds. Again, it's all well and good to open up a gap on this climb, but uh, he's then going to have to try to hold off 10 very motivated riders who can work together on the descent and are likely to get a very natural regrouping effect, just as you see even in elite races where whatever the gaps are over the climb, the descent is the great equalizer where things get caught back up. And as we take a peek at the uh, Category 2 race, we have Brett Bonifacci just cresting the hill he's still on a six or so seven percent grade but he is almost at the top now and as he rounds over the top he's got about a 150 meter gap back to the chasers so he is this is an early attack um but it is not a trivial attack uh brett is far from what we would call a no hoper he can be a real factor in this race and some of the other heavy hitters will absolutely be taking that attack very seriously because this is Brett is not a guy that you want to let get um, get away and stay away all day because he might just be willing to try it. And we're looking back here at the Category 4 field as, it, as we've got Shane Alfreds just cresting. And you can see he actually does have the Fiam Rouge, the classic red flag, which marks one kilometer to go um, at most bike races. You'll be very familiar with this if you're a Tour de France fan. They always have that lovely arch, and you can see the little triangular one kilometer to go flag. Here are our arches sponsored by our good friends Cobotics. They're a uh, manufacturing facility right here in, uh, in the greater Vancouver area. I think they're out there in Port Coquitlam. I visited their shop because they actually did some, uh, some uh, beautifully uh, um, uh, machined uh, uh, finishing or uh, winner's medals for us one year, one of our bike races. So uh, lovely work. Work by the guy. Shane Alfreds honors them by riding through the arch. He's pressing hard. He will soon be finishing. He's under nine, under a kilometer to go now. Ian Walker still chasing him down, but he's 3K away. So uh, he's got a while before he will see the Fiam Rouge. And meanwhile, our Cat 2 in three races are getting active. Looks like Matthews is off with a gap, as well as Brett Boniface. He's holding 300 meters as he continues his descent and you can see he's not letting up he's putting out about five watts per kilo on the descent and meanwhile the chasers are starting to get active and they've got to get active because they got a lot of work to do um it's not nothing to have an almost 300 meter gap uh over the top of that hill 
And as we look at the Cat 3 field, we're observing the chasers here. I think that Matthews is still out and away. And again, he's got almost 300 meters on the field. Um, and they've all crested the hill now. So we'll see if the uh, chasers can close that gap. And surely they will want to. Because I don't think that Mr. Matthews is a guy that anybody who has seen him race in this series is particularly interested in letting get away this early. It's interesting to see two solo riders in both of these categories off the front. Uh, this happened in the Category 4 race as well. Uh, both of the Category 4 races, both uh, stop number 3 and stop number 4, the two that we've been talking about a lot today, we saw solo rider go away, but uh, neither time it worked out. They were both caught, and then a new rider went away. So I guess I just caution these uh, these early <laughs> solo escape artists that uh, history is not on your side in this scenario. But sometimes you have a day like Shane Alfred's where uh, you just have the legs, the other riders don't, and uh, you can end the day with a three-kilometer lead over the next rider. Yes, indeed. I mean, it's it's easy to forget how good and how close the racing is between has been between Alfred's Walker and Arkang uh, throughout the weeks of this series. So, Chapeau to Shane, a force that does not necessarily suit him in terms of uh, having probably a few more kills than he'd really like to see. He did exactly what he needed to. He took advantage of every opportunity that he found on the road. And here he is parading to the finish congratulations to shane alfreds he's a big man in cycling and i predict that he will do very well on the road when we can get back to some real bike racing because he has shown that he's got some serious serious power and he's put his mark on this race congratulations to your cap four winner shane alfreds While we wait for the other Cat 4s to come to the finish, we look back at our Cat 2 and 3 fields. It looks like Matthews continues to hold the lead. However, uh, Barrett Boniface has been absorbed by the field. So we are back to Grupo Compacto. It appears that it's going to be a 10-strong um, leading group now. Uh, a bunch of other riders are off the back. I'm afraid Shane Griffard did not have a very good climb. And he is now is a shame because he was a very active factor in some earlier racing. So we're hoping he can get back up to uh, the, the lead group. But nonetheless, that's going to be a lot of work for him because uh, they are riding hard and fast and they are not waiting up for anybody right now. 800 meters back for Griffard right now off of this group. Not yeah, so uh, he's... hard to see how that would happen, though. The way that these guys were chasing uh boniface off the front uh, earlier they had they had to set a pretty pretty steady tempo there yes indeed they they did the work and meanwhile we've got michael matthews so let's take a look we've got the cat threes have all come off the descent and now i'm afraid matthews's um uh lead is down to what we'd call slight gap if he was in a road race they would have taken the cars out of the gap long ago because uh he's only got about uh, 20 meters in closing, he's going to be caught more or less immediately unless he basically counterattacks at this point. In fact, I'm suspicious that the one. only reason he hasn't... Go ahead. I'm suspicious the only reason he hasn't been caught already is that the uh, certain elements of the field might be content to let him cook for a little longer before they decide he's done. Yeah, why not? Guy shows some strength early on. He might as well take some watts now that uh, he won't have later on in the race so we'll see if they uh, continue to apply pressure to michael matthews looks like somebody is countering up the front here the cat threes yes indeed and matthews gets back to it to cover it <laughs> yeah matthews isn't done having making trouble i believe that's shane no simon israel we should know this by now simon israel has been fairly active in the race again he's in a, another gas town cycling rider so matthews and Israel, despite their different kits, are actually probably know each other because they race for the same team in real life. Uh, the Gastown Cycling Club, one of the larger groups in town, in fact. Uh, you know, not quite as uh, grand and glorious as my own beloved Escape Velocity Cycling Club, but uh, a force nonetheless. So we see Simon Israel off the front there, Michael Matthews holding with him, and they may be very willing to uh, 
work together. So this is definitely a pair that the rest of the uh, Cat 3 field should absolutely respect because uh, we've seen them do very well so far in this race and I'll bet you that they're very willing to work together. So we see uh, Vandegreen trying to do something about that, anything at this point. Yeah, Brian Vandegreen is uh, another local cyclist. I don't know what team he races for. He's in the uh, Glorious Cycling BC uh, team kit, so he's looking good. Not sure if he's feeling good. I mean, this has been a pretty vigorous race for both the Cat 2s and 3s. We can see as we cut back over to the Cat 2s that they are still Grupo Compacto, but it's not for lack of attacks. You can see kind of the surge and sags in the pack and, you know, just the, the pace here. I mean, the field is over 40 kilometers an hour. They are not slacking. Neither one of these is a club ride. Uh, as we look back at the threes, we can see that Matthews and Israel are currently holding a 45 kilometer an hour pace. So gentle descent, which is certainly helping their case, but even on the flats, they were around about 44K, uh, which is a solid, fast uh, tempo for a Cat 3 group. And I don't know about you, Brad, but I have noticed that the the uh, speeds that we see in RGT look very realistic. That our average speeds and our on-the-road speeds look very much like the numbers I would expect from a real race among riders of these levels. Yeah, actually, for a lot of the races that we did with uh, Echelon... Yeah, I'm not sure if uh, Brad's cut out there for the view, but if he oh, has... Sorry. Our, uh... I had my mute on. Uh, I'm still getting used to this virtual thing, you know. Sometimes it takes me a year to figure out, to figure things out. I was going to say in the Echelon Racing League that we had earlier in the year, a lot of the races we were finding that the finishing time of the virtual race was sometimes down to the minute of the winning time in the real life race. I know the uh, the tour of the Gila stage, there was like uh, down to, I think it was like a minute six of the winner's time. So, uh, yeah, the speeds wow. are incredibly accurate they've uh, they've refined that a lot you see a lot of uh, updates to rgt and 90 percent of the time it's under the hood stuff you don't really see a lot of visual changes on rgt that's not really what they're about i guess it's uh it's a platform for the riders it's a it's a racer's platform if you will and so a lot of it is built into the physics and the way that the courses roll the uh, rolling resistance on the bikes the drafting that kind of stuff but um, yeah, a lot of times you'll see alarmingly accurate finish times based on real life courses. <laughs> so the, for a, a course like this, great example of where uh, you can really use RGT as a bike racer because now you know if you know, you're know you gonna have a shot at the Joe Martin stage race. Nobody wants to go all the way to Arkansas just to get dropped on a course <laughs> that doesn't really suit them. But if you can do a course like this and you find yourself with time that's like somewhat similar to you know, let's say the front group's time of your category from a past year at Joe Martin, you might start looking at that and saying, I could do this. This is a course that, uh, you know, I could have some fun on. So I think that's another way that uh, we'll see Rogers continue to use RGT as uh, we move out of the pandemic and back to real life racing. I think that's a big place that virtual racing can still play a part in real life racing. That's a great insight as to how um, the, the racing is uh, so effective as a way of modeling what you would do in the real world. And it certainly is intriguing to me that uh, a lot of the races, a lot of the names that I am familiar with from, as I say, real road racing are also serious, serious factors uh, in these virtual races. It really reflects that, yeah, as you say, the, the model pans out that what you see in these virtual races is... Um, reflective of real ability in real bike racing dr godby are you listening to this just just asking just throwing that out there that maybe you'd be good at real bike racing just 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 hint hint meanwhile simon israel is now trying to chase down his uh, erstwhile breakaway companion companions no more teammates they may be but they're definitely not friends at the moment because Michael Matthews has put a slight gap on Simon Israel. I don't know whether that was because Simon wasn't keeping up or because Matthews decided to put in a dig. But uh, just as I say that, they have closed back. They are Grupo Compacto, and they're about 180 meters ahead of their uh, field. So we will see how that continues on as the Cat 3 race continues to be active. And now we're looking back. We've got a few more finishers for you. Uh, 
It says Ian Walker closing in on the Fiam Rouge, so he will be wrapping up his race and taking his hard-earned second place uh, uh, very shortly. Perhaps not the position he was hoping for, but uh, he has nothing to be ashamed of. You put in a solid effort today. Uh, it'll be interesting to compare what the, the uh, relative uh, wattage per kilo averages were for these three riders who did in some ways three very different races. I wonder if Walker and Arkang were working together long enough that they had at least a somewhat easier time with the shared load than Alfred's did. But certainly they were separate for a long time. And we can also see Alfred's there out on the road. He's 1.6k from the finish. And again, this will be a relatively slow finish because it's a climbing finish. And you'll see that reprised in the Cat 2 and Cat 3 fields. If anybody tries to do a breakaway from one kilometer to go on this course, they're going to find out that's the longest kilometer of their life. Yeah, as you look at 900 meters to go, and this is good for a prefiguring, Ian Walker's on a 13% uh, grade. It just peaks out there right after the Fiam Rouge. And so then you'll get a relatively, but not actually flat, but a relatively easier climb to the finish. But meanwhile, we've got some real racing going on. The Cat 2s are just attacking each other like complete and utter madmen. It's pure chaos, but you can just see from the watts per kilo numbers and from the way that the uh, field is shifting and morphing that uh, the race is not going easy. And then on the Cat 3 side, what do we have? We still have Matthews and Israel now working together again, best friends once more, as they fight their common enemy, the chasing field, which is now only about 100 meters behind them. And it looks like over on the Cat 2 territory, it's my old friend Luke Hubner. He's a fine young man from the island. Uh, he lives out on Acreage, as he explains in one of his uh, podcast stories, which I highly recommend to you. Luke Hubner is part of the Zone 2 podcast. I've listened to an episode or two myself already, and I, I commend it to you. I see great things in this young man's future, both as a, uh, both as a uh, bike racer and also as a professional gossiper which I believe is more or less how podcasts work. But uh, I, I may be unclear on a few of the details, perhaps. Uh, perhaps Luke can give me some tips and pointers. Luke, if you're hearing this on your podcast, I would totally enjoy that. It would be great. You'd get like mad views. You know, I have like over 800 um, um, uh, followers on Twitter. I think that's a lot. I'm not sure, but I think so. Meanwhile, Ian Walker comes to the finish, only 90 meters to go. He will take second place in our Category 4 field. Chapeau, hard ride, good ride, and he's going to finish it off. He's been in the saddle for over two and a half hours, a literal oh. marathon worth of time on the road. Oh. Uh, listen, anyone that can do two and a half hours on the trainer is a winner in my book. So... Uh... If we ever get to meet up in person, I'm going to buy these guys beers for today's ride in the uh, Cap 4 race for hanging in there. Two and a half <laughs> hours in the saddle. Oi, oi, oi. Oh, man. You know Shane Israel, or sorry, you know that uh, that uh, Shane actually lives close enough to me. Shane Alfred lives close enough to me that I he can make me take him up on that offer. But actually, it's true. You know what? I'm pretty cheap. I'm not going to give it to everyone. But Shane... If you can hear this, I will totally take you out for beers once you're vaccinated because uh, there's a nice brewery near us. Our old friends at Daggerad, who also, I, by the way, have a pretty sweet cycling jersey. You should totally check it out. But um, I, will, I will treat Shane to a beer because certainly he has given us an enormous amount of entertainment. And I got to say, none of these guys took a break. And I will tell you, Brad, I did not do two and a half hours of commentary without requiring a break. So uh, yeah, good on that. I can't even call these races for two and a half hours. I don't know how in the world you sit on a trainer for two and a half hours. So uh, I guess it pays to finish the distance in the virtual BC Cup. Uh, at least you get a drink waiting for you at the line. I will. Uh, I'll send you some Bitcoin to help facilitate <laughs> that uh, that beer buying for him. I, I think we can call it quits because I still owe you a Dogi coin from last week or oh, from two right. weeks ago. So <laughs> well, here we are. To that. Meanwhile. <laughs> yeah, it's all fun and games now in five years when it turns out that we were making yeah, mock of uh, you know twenty four thousand dollars worth of yeah. yeah yeah remember that time you bought a pizza with a million dollars in bitcoins uh, it's, uh, yeah the pizzeria remembers anyway julian Ar jimmy arkang jimmy 
Jimmy, he's uh, number three on the road, but he's number one in our hearts. Sorry, Shane. <laughs> Only <laughs> as we as we as we as we laud Jimmy Arcane going under the Fiam Rouge. I got one last message from Shane. I guess having dispensed with bike racing duties, he's able to uh, he's able to uh, be chatty again. He says he doesn't drink beer, but he'll take me up on a cider. And uh, not a problem, Shane. I can definitely accommodate you on that. I'll make sure that there's a uh, nice cider on tap at the brewery when we go. But uh, chapeau to you. I'd love to meet you up. You've given us a tremendous amount of entertainment in the last four weeks. And uh, certainly, it's. Uh, I hope you've had as much fun as uh, Brad and I are having these days. We watched Jimmy Arkang. He has just crossed through the Fiam Rouge. So he's got another miserable 980 meters to go in his race before he can finally call it a day, collect his honorable third place. I mean, three starters, three finishes, but don't let that tell the story. Arkang was active in all of the races in this series. He was active in today's race. He activated the race with an early breakaway and you know, he's he's put in a credible finish. He's ridden it all the way to the end. He's going to be two hours and probably not quite 40 minutes when he's done this race today. So wow. uh, full points uh, again. Oh. You know, buns of steel there, Jimmy. We salute you. Uh, hope you also have a, uh, a nice tall version of whatever your preferred post-race beverage is. Perhaps a glass of wholesome milk or some such. Jimmy's going to need a couple shots after this one. <laughs> 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 he's he's going to be doing Jaeger bombs after two and a half yeah, hours yeah. on the bike. Yeah. Uh, well, anyways, I don't know what your future virtual racing plans are, but at least for, for Jimmy, the virtual cycling BC cup will be over in a few moments. And I'm sure he'll be glad to put that behind him. Although as painful as I imagine today has been, I'm sure he's like all bike racers, which is in about 30 minutes. He'll be thinking about how much time there is until his next bike race. So, <laughs> Good on you, Jimmy. Meanwhile, it looks like we've got some Cat 2 and Cat 3 racing. I'm sure that Damon will keep us surprised and make sure that we don't miss Jimmy's uh, finish. I see he's putting in a dig, so you know, we want to we want to we want to honor him. He's been out there for a long time. He deserves a good He deserves a a good well-observed completion to his race. We're not going to let him just disappear into the darkness here. Um, and besides, it looks like the race composition in our Cat 2s and 3s is pretty straightforward. Cat 2s are still trying to attack each other like mad, but not making any effect. And meanwhile, the Cat 3s have sort of settled in where there's this 130-meter breakaway that's the same pair. Israel and Vandegreen, just far up enough the road to be tempting, but apparently not so far away the field is in any way worried about them, so... This Cat 2 race is like a cat fight up in the top left. They're just like <laughs> slapping each other over and over and over, but they're not really making any progress. Like there haven't been any KOs. They're not really moving the needle one way or the other. They're just kind of just annoying each other, just poking the bear up at the front. <laughs> yeah, wow. It's early rounds cat. of a heavyweight prize fight, right? You know, there's, yeah, exactly. there's, there's punches being thrown, but a lot of these guys are probably thinking about how they're setting up the finale which will come in later rounds as we watch jimmy arkang ride to the finish he's got 100 meters to go it's a parade for him you know he's 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 keeping the the the, the effort up actually he's doing pretty credibly he's like over two watts per kilogram his heart rate is 175 he's not in any way taking it easy at this point but he has been on the bike for a very long time and i'm sure he's going to be as happy as anyone to see this finish big finish Congratulations to Jimmy Arkang, third place in our Category 4 race. and He's closed it out. I bet you that he's ready to get off that virtual saddle and also off the real saddle that he's been on for over yeah. two and a half hours as we look back at our Category 2 and Category 3 races. And what do we see, Brad? What is happening in these events right now? Well, the Category 3s are uh, into the wrestling phase of their fight. They've gone down <laughs> onto the ground, and uh, they're just kind of... <laughs> hugging each other rolling around right now they're settling down a little bit in their fight phase the cat twos still throwing some slaps around i think they're uh they're picking <laughs> sides right now over on the left hand side of your screen a little more aggressive early on for the cat twos up at the front but uh, <laughs> things are calming down generally i would say between these two uh, two categories 
Yeah, that's right. It's uh, interesting to see what their relative paces have been. Um, our field, the categories twos have covered about 26 kilometers. The cat three chasers that we're looking at are, uh, have covered about 25. So they've got a difference of what is that about 4% in pace so far. And they're kind of on a fairly straightforward, relatively flat section of the course. We know that this is somewhat of an untroubled section except for little tiny 15 percent hills in the course as we're seeing the cat twos face right now but yeah as you say there's just there's been lots of attacks and we've definitely seen pushes to the front and we saw brett boniface uh do a genuine attack over the first climb of the day but nothing is staying away but we oh, i see i see mr giesler taking a bit of advantage over that hill but it looks like he just surged enough to get to the front again so sort of I'm not sure what Giesler was up to. It looked like a reverse sag climb. Um, in bike racing, a sag climb is a, is a tactic that a, a rider of a certain weight will use uh, where they move to the front of the field and very definitely try to take up a good, a good um, attacking position at the start of a climb so that as their naturally lower pace up the climb um, kicks in, they slowly sag through the field so that what happens is they go from being at the front of the pack to being right on the back of the pack when they get to the top of the climb instead of be going from being at the back of the climb of the back of the pack to off the back at the back of the climb uh, this is a tactic that i had to use many times in my racing days because otherwise i would just get dropped everywhere at all times so we see giesler who i know is a bit of a diesel of a rider perhaps doing the opposite of that so curious tactics but um we'll let his legs do the talking in this case good tip for the new riders if you're getting dropped on a climb if you went too hard early on and everyone's passing you just yell i'm sag climbing and you'll seem like you <laughs> knew exactly what you were doing that's right yeah luke hubner is a young rider so we'll make sure that he gets that advice luke uh keep that as a pro tip maybe you can use that on your podcast meanwhile we're looking back at the Cat 3s because the Cat 3s are pretty active. Um, the gap is slight and decreasing between them and the field, but now Matthews and Israel have separated themselves from each other. Again, it's a slight gap, nothing to write home about, but Simon Israel will not be getting much of a, uh, much of a draft effect from um, Michael Matthews, or at least not as much as he could be getting when he's that far away. It's only now telling him that he's saving a bit of wattage now that he's gotten into the draft. You can see again our graphics in the upper left corner saying exactly as we follow Simon, exactly uh, what his uh, wattage saving is relative to Michael Matthews on the front. I think at the peak you'll save like 150 maybe is the, well, we'll see how high it climbs here. I mean, yeah, I think if you can ride perfectly where you need to be in the game, like with with laser computer precision, I think you can save upwards of 100 watts at any given time from the draft. But more realistically, you're probably saving like 30 to 50, somewhere in there. Yeah, that, that sounds about right. And I think we actually saw uh, Simon's number peak at about just about 149, 150 watts as he got right onto Matthew. So it's it's telling how much lower the numbers are than that in terms of how they're working smoothly. Do you remember, Brad, do they also get a bit of a um, of a peloton effect where you'll get even stronger drafting effects if you're in a group as opposed to being two up like Matthews and Simon here? Uh, yes, that is built into the game where they'll be able to uh, to see it in the group. In fact, even the position in the group uh, in a larger group will affect it. Uh, I think it has to be like 20 plus riders before you start feeling the peloton effect if you will but uh yeah mm -hmm. the drafting position is a big part of rgt and a big part of what makes rgt rgt is that it's so uh reliant on that positioning in the race and on your ability to modulate power as opposed to a platform like zwift where you sort of have this gamification going on there's like the tron bikes there's power-ups there's all these boosts that you can use rgt said pretty early on that they really had no intention of doing any of that stuff this is a racer's platform the the goal is to as closely mimic real life racing as possible so uh uh, like I said earlier, a lot of the changes are always under the hood. It's uh, it's really about trying to make this as realistic as they can. Yeah, and I think they do a good job of that. Meanwhile, looking back at our uh, real race, 
We've got uh, Matthews and Israel again um, coming back together. They've just, they've sort of been rubber banding with each other. They're not really what I would say classically working together perfectly. So I don't know whether this is sort of the raggedness of a little bit of inexperience or whether this is just that they are kind of low key attacking each other, feeling each other out for weaknesses. Um, either way, it's it's kind of curious tactics because they've only got about 50 meters on the field. And I mean, I think about a 50 meter gap or a 60 meter gap, whatever they're maintaining now is kind of the, it's neither fish nor fowl as the saying might go, which is that it's too little to be very confident about doing any damage, but it's, um, it's enough that you're just doing work all on your own and sharing that work between two riders while you're getting chased down by 10. And these are some reasonably strong riders. Although I, I say 10, but actually they're being chased down by now it looks like five because as we look at the Cat 3 field, you can see that under um, below Chan in seventh place, the gap back Cox goes up to 1.2K. And we've actually got some real, a notable name there. Nathan Weaslake has been a uh, substantial factor in this race, both early on and I think in previous weeks. And he is now 2.3K off the back. So uh, that's a guy I did not expect to just disappear. So I don't know whether he's having a mechanical or a bad day. You know, Nathan, if you want to let us know what happened, uh, hit us up. But I'm sure right now what he's mostly thinking about is uh, time trialing his way back into contention because it's uh, still pretty early days in his race. He can hardly uh, call it quits quite yet. And now we're looking back over at the Category 2 field, which just got zesty. It appears that we've got... Uh, who is that guest? I'm not finding him on my uh, riders list, but that may be me, not him. Um, but... Uh, he's... Uh, he's desperately trying to catch back on at the moment. Uh, let's see if he can manage that. So we're down to... If we include guest, we're down to a group of nine, and they're still all Grupo Compacto, as my old friend, the late Jeremy Story, would say um, in the Cat 2 field. And in the Cat 3 field, it looks like the catch has been made. So Matthews and Simon Israel are now back in the <clears throat> loving arms of their friends, although it's not much of a friends group because it looks like it's more like a group of four here at the start, and then there's a 100-meter gap back to a group of three chasers but this is a strong group of four we've got Matthews Israel and then we've got Van de Green, who we've also seen I think do pretty good things and they're joined by V Richards I'm gonna have to look up that name it's Vaughn Richards and uh, he's a uh, he says he's good at non-technical gravity only descents well good news for you Vaughn the all the descents are not technical in um, in RGT uh, they are, they are sort of technical because there's actually an effect where in a very tight turn, RGT will turn off your power output, um, basically not count those watts in your favor if it thinks that you would basically be touching a pedal if you tried to pedal. So a sufficiently tight turn will, uh, will basically not be worth anything, and so the savvy riders will not be trying to pedal through those turns. They'll save a, save a match or two on the way. So we've got something like our race composition there. Uh, what is this? Four riders in Cat 3. And meanwhile, the Cat 2s are a larger, more clumped up group. So very different race compositions at this point. It'll be interesting to see how this plays out. Watching Gast on the left-hand side of the screen. Struggling to get back in here. Yeah, wait. I found this that name. It's like Cole Guest. Cole Guest. Okay. Yes. He's a he's a local boy. He's listed as a cycling BC rider, and I see he's wearing the rally cycling kit. So that's one of the built-in jerseys, of course, for the professional rally cycling team. But uh, I think he's made it back on. He has indeed, and he's there with Jerome Rykin at the back of that group of eight. And Giesler is off the front, and uh, Brett Bonafacci. The fine Italian rider is uh, is also trying a breakaway, and they're being joined by Riedenauer. We'll, we'll try and Nicholas Riedenauer. Um, he says he only started cycling in June of last year, so there's a new rider for us. And I see my old friend Luke Hubner put me on your podcast. He's uh, leading the chase there with, I believe that's Jeremy Dumper. 
uh, Jamie Dumper. Sorry, Jamie. But we've got kind of a, a ragged, angry breakaway. It looks like it's uh, Giesler off the front, Riedenauer in second, and then Barrett Boniface has been caught by the field. And just to let you know about the logistics, we want to keep watching this because we've got Giesler making what he hopes will be a decisive attack here in the flats. And we'll see if uh, Riedenauer can hold him, hold on to him. We're going to be starting our next event in about 10 minutes. So you will, we will have a brief cutaway at the very least to watch the start of our uh, elite women's race. It's going to be a great field. Once again, I hear that Dr. Jacqueline Godby, soon to be Dr. Dr. Godby, will be in the uh, house. And I'm sure all of the other women in the field are very excited to know that. But we, we look back at the Cat 3s here. Matthew's slight gap, but it's this group of four now that has formed up. And it's sort of half of that is Simon Israel and Michael Matthews, our two early breakaways. And then the other half is Vandergreen and Richards, who I would describe as the pack who caught them, but uh, they're all that's left of the pack, so to speak. And that group is about 120 meters away from a group of three chasers. And on the Cat 2 side. So it's all happening, folks. This is some crux stuff. I think that in both races, the Cat 2s and 3s, these have the, the possibility of being decisive attacks. So we've got Hubner and Boniface uh, working together, trying to get back on terms with, uh, with Giesler. And they have good reason to want to do so because uh, Giesler is one of our strong riders. Vince Giesler. He's a, he's a real diesel, too, so that's a guy you want to bring in a breakaway with you. If, uh, if Boniface and Hubner can catch up to him and hold on, I think that that might be a trio that has the uh, talent and the capability to work very well together. Uh, but the rest of the Cat 2 field is not going quietly. They would like to uh, get back on terms for sure. I see them being led by Jamie Dumper. But look at that. Giesler is now 150 meters ahead of his chasers. Um, we now have a group of three, Riddenauer, Boniface, and Hubner. Form group, and they're about 80 meters ahead of the breakaway. So this is, this is exciting moments, folks. This is the bike race happening. And I think that this group of uh, it's five riders has got to be thinking very hard about their future at the moment. Because if they don't hurry up i think that this that the breakaway ahead of them is too large and too powerful to let go like these guys are actually gonna have to work well and carefully in order to uh, get back on terms with those breakaway riders crucial point for diesler right now in the cat twos and the cat threes i think are about to be in a similar situation behind Richards here. The uh, Chan, Gould, Goldberg group, the three sitting in fifth, sixth, and seventh at uh, the front of the, ca or in the category three race. This is probably the next big battle to watch, whether these three can get up to the lead group of seven up, uh, or the lead group of four, sorry, up ahead of them. Gap is growing. It was 250, now they're up to 340 meters back. So Gould, Chan, and Goldberg trending the wrong way, but so we'll see if that trio can work their way up to the Richard Israel, Israel Vandergreen group. We'll uh, we'll keep an eye on that gap. Yeah, absolutely. That's uh, Albert Chan, Micah Goldberg, Micah Goldberg, and uh, Bart Gould. Uh, so three local boys. I think I'm not I'm not sure. Yeah, Micah is listed as a cycling BC rider, and I know um, I know Bart Gould very well. He rides for the. Uh, Last I checked, he rides for the local uh, Glotman Simpson team. Uh, as I say, we like to call them the Bumblebees because of their distinctive yellow and black uh, kit. Uh, close personal frenemies of mine, um, one of the big clubs in town. And, uh, I love racing against them as long as I can beat them. I don't like being beat by them. It's terrible and sad. No, no fun whatsoever. But uh, no, they're a great local club, and uh, they've been big supporters of local bike racing for a long time. But we look back at the Category 2s, and it looks like we've got Boniface, Riddenauer, and is that long, young Luke Hubner um, all together. But now, where is, repeat, where is uh, Vince Giesler? He must be on road somewhere. We'll get a peek at him soon, but uh, there he is. He's got about a 230-meter uh, lead on the chasing field, and it looks like the riders behind him are regrouping. So he's going to be one versus eight at this point. So... 
interesting situation in the cat two field that we got to take a look at. So we're gonna we're gonna follow along here. We've got Vince Giesler is uh, is on the front here, and then meanwhile, if we take a peek, the cat twos, uh, we've got a chasing field, and they've got to be pretty desperate to try to control uh, Giesler at this point. But hopefully, they'll be able to work together. And it looks like um, it looks like we uh, have sort of Grupo Compacto coming back together in the Cat 3s. Uh, what do you see there, Brad? I see that Albert Chan and Bart Gould and Micah Goldberg are still not really catching up. So I think what we've got is Group of Four off the front that we're watching right now. And then the Chasers have got to be very desperate indeed. Yeah, they lost, uh, lost about 30 meters since we last checked in with them. They were hoving around uh, 350, 360 meters back. Now they're right around 400 meters behind uh, Matthews, who is the fourth rider in that group right now. Talking about the Category 3s on the right-hand side of the screen. But yeah. uh, the wattage you see for those the, the second group seems to be averaging a little bit higher. So I think those guys are a little bit more motivated than uh, the riders up front who are kind of playing this uh, standoff game right now, trying to figure out just where they're going to settle in. Meanwhile, Chan, Goldberg, and Gould, I think, are uh, continuing to keep the effort up. Yeah. Although I don't know. Ch now, as these guys up at the front approach four watts per kilo, Vandegreen at 4.1, 4.2. This guy's killing it up on the front of the Cat 3s. <laughs> yeah, those are the kind of numbers that'll get you an upgrade to uh, the Category 2 field. And speaking of, oh, we're looking back at our Cat 3s. Yeah, Vandegreen leading them through. I, I know Bart Gould fairly well. He's a reasonably strong and breadable local Cat 3. So if he's in that field, it's not nothing. But nonetheless, um, the guys up at the front there in this Cat 3 field, they're, they're strong riders. They're names that you and I have been calling an awful lot in the last few weeks, Brad, especially Van Green and uh, Matthews. So uh, all very, very credible. Meantime, as we look back at the Cat 2s, you can see that Giesler continues to have about a 270 meter lead. So he is, I think that that is a, a credible commitment to an attempt at a solo breakaway. We'll see how that goes for him. But um, Boniface and Guest are not content to stay around. And so now there is, what is this? Is it, sorry, it's Nathan Ridenauer and Brett Boniface are a little group of two that has broken away from their breakaway partners. And we can now see Jamie Dumper trying to get up there. And it looks like he will. So there's our chasing group isn't so much working together well as they are attacking each other. And I'm not sure how that's going to go. Uh, they're they're maintaining a torrid pace, but I think that it's it's like guys like Ridenauer and Boniface are setting a message: no passengers. And they're going to go up the road and try to catch Giesler. But if you want to follow them, you'd better be able to put in the watts. So I can see that Dumper and Hubner guest Jerome Riken are all there you know they're in contact but they're all in danger of uh, they're all in danger of falling away when we look back at Giesler he's got 120 meters as he crests that last little lump in the road that we saw you know they're uh, if you take a peek here at the parkours at the bottom of the field you can see that they're at about they're actually past the halfway mark now in this Cat 2 race. So they've covered 40 kilometers in less than an hour. And they're going to be uh, so they're at 38.5 kilometers as we speak and about 58 minutes in. And they've got 33K left to go. Um, we've also got the start of the women's race coming up in about a minute and a half. So we will be cutting over to that very momentarily, even as we have some pretty exciting stuff here in our Category 2 and 3 races. We'll at least show you the start of that. Uh, just too much action, folks. We apologize for having so many interesting things going on in these virtual bike races. Uh, it was not our intention to have these races be this interesting, so we understand if we're testing your patience, but at least if you've got a short attention span, you can watch as we go to three, nay, four different screens in a few moments. There'll be something to take a peek at on all of them. So, no, it's blame, this is actually uh, fun. Blame Richards and Giesler. You can uh, <laughs> address your concerns to them. They're the ones making it interesting out here today in the two, three races. Richards up the That's front of right. the twos. Giesler at the front of the threes. And there's our first look at the starting line for the pro women down at the bottom, which we can now confirm includes Wonder Woman, Jackie Godby. 
Yes, it does. And I see a lot of other familiar names there. We're very excited to see what they're going to do. We've got Pam Troyer. She's an architect. We've got Ribs Magendi. She would rather not tell you how they, she got that nickname. I see Nadia Gontova, who's been a very credible force in these races. Holly Larson and Zoe Saccio. She's got a Canadian flag next to her name, but I can assure you she is very American. Uh, she uh, lives with her husband somewhere in the wilds of Oregon. Um, I understand that uh, she did not, in fact, die of dysentery. Uh, yeah. Oregon Trail jokes, sorry, probably too subtle. It was before your time, kids. I think Zoe was born probably about 20 years after that game came out. Now I feel so old. <laughs> Satchio away to lead the field. Troyer right on her. <laughs> Dr. Godby, perfectly content to follow wheels for the moment. This is, as we saw, the, the usual fire out of the gate attack. Um, if any of you, perhaps Dr. Godby, are not familiar firsthand with actual road racing, it never starts like that. Um, it's just an artifact of how of how virtual races begin that you can sort of get credit for all the watts immediately so all the riders sort of fire off like a rocket whereas in the real world it's um, actually difficult to have yourself at full cadence and power uh, right from the start when your uh, cranks aren't moving and I, I assure you the uh, commissaires are very strict about you not pedaling before the start of the bike race ask how I know But uh, Zoe Saccio continues to be up there. Jackie Godby is actually on the front of the race now, and Troyer is right with her. We've seen Troyer. I, we awarded her the combativity prize, I think, in the uh, in the first race of the season because she was the one who held on to Godby's wheel the longest in our first race, which was the virtual Paderberg. And we can see that one-two group, uh, Godby and Troyer. Um, and there there is a bit of method in this madness, which is that... Um, you know, Troyer's a good, strong rider, and even if she can't hold on to Godby's wheel, and, and she can for quite a long time, I suspect, uh, every moment that she spends on this wheel is basically giving her a head start over the chasing field, which we can see is led by my old friend Claire Cameron. She's only 60 meters back, but this group already knows that giving Jackie Godby a 60-meter head start is not a well-thought-out plan. Yeah. I, I don't... I think that's gone well for any of these women when they've uh, allowed that to happen in previous races. So I assure you there is considerable desperation in the living rooms all across the lower mainland as we speak. You know, as I'm sure that Claire and Nadia and Holly and Ribs Magendi and, and Zoe are all very credible, very experienced riders, and they can see exactly what's going on right now, and they know exactly how serious the situation is. All the credit in the world to Troyer here, hanging on to the wheel. She's in the red zone a lot, though. I am a little bit concerned that she's doing too much work trying to hold on to Godby here and maybe not focusing enough on uh, just trying to settle in and make sure that she's riding within herself and uh, within her limits here. Because Godby doesn't seem to be going into the red zone. I'm not sure uh, what the difference is here, is, or, but uh, Godby... Seems to be staying in yellow and Troyer staying in red here. This is a long time in the red zone for Pam Troyer. Pamela, don't listen to him. Go big or go home. Explode just, in glory. Just stay on Leave it. it all on the road. <laughs> oh, I'm gonna get in so much trouble from Pam later, I'm sure. Well, I'm not i I'm not saying let off the wheel here in this scenario, but I was just noting that uh, Troyer seems <laughs> to be averaging a higher workload than Godby up here in this front group. See how the power levels are different? I'm not sure what, why that would be. It seems like that's a pretty l large difference between the work Godby's oh, doing and the work Troyer's doing. Oh yeah, I see what you're, I, I see what you're getting at, which is right. Yeah, that, uh, that Troyer seems to be putting out a lot more watts per kilo. I mean, uh, they're on a relatively flat, very slightly climby section there might be some big weight deltas that i'm that i'm not thinking about i doubt that either of these uh of I, these riders would be anything I, I think they'd be actually in a pretty similar weight class frankly 
Yeah, I'm going to make a guess and say that this has to do with uh, the riders, hot, their maximum FTP. Uh, basically, that's going right. to skew the scale. So Godby's highest score uh, would mean that she has a lot higher to go before she gets into the orange, yellow, red zone. I think that's probably the situation here is that Godby's maximum FTP is significantly higher than Troyer's. And so while they're both doing 4.1, 4.2 watts per kilo for Godby based on her theoretical max. Maximum, that's still in the yeah. yellow orange zone for Troyer based on her theoretical maximum. That's a little closer to the max. Of course, I, I think you've nailed it there, Brad. Yeah, uh, Pam Troyer is a is a is a great local rider. She's a credible threat in all of our races. She's fun to watch race, and I know that she's done high level racing like uh, Super Week every year. But um, you know, there's being a good bike racer, and then there's what we've come to be tier right which is when you do what jackie godby did and just sort of ride away from other riders at will <laughs> and you can see that that gap is forming almost as soon as there's a little lump in the road doing it right now yep yeah and she's actually putting it in dig you can see that she's gone into the red numbers she's actually producing like what 450 watts per uh right now which is taking her into like the five and six watts per kilo territory she just for god be it's an act of will to drop people more than it is a, a, a physical effort i think yeah look at the and nice little spike wrote... in the power meter up at the top yeah. left you can see exactly where she dropped the hammer <laughs> on troyer and 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 we know that god be has a shall we say a somewhat uh experimental or even creative approach to her bike races right that we saw very much that i think at the crit that she kind of wanted to you know work in the field and and see how that felt rather than going for a breakaway victory but here i think that she sort of she was at a certain pace she was using that pace to drop everybody but troyer and then for whatever reason she decided that the little lump in the road was time to go and away she's gone she's 100 meters up the road i mean all credit to all the other riders in this in this field, but we've seen this story before, haven't we, Brad? Uh, Jackie Godby gets separation, and Jackie Godby stays away. Yeah, this is the crack in the foundation that you're seeing right now. Uh, as a structural engineer would say, ignore that at your own risk in a scenario like this, because uh, typically it just gets bigger and bigger, and it's going to lead to catastrophic results as uh, Jackie Godby will continue to put time into this group. To be honest, there's nothing that you can do in this scenario. I mean, uh, all the teamwork in the world, if Troyer, Larson, Magendi, Cameron can all link up and ride a perfect pace line for the next 67K, I don't even know if that's enough. I mean, Godby is a once-in-a-lifetime rider, and these riders should know that. Uh, you know, this is not uh, just consistently losing a race to one rider. This is consistently racing against a God-tier rider, God-B-tier <laughs> rider, as you said. That's right. Yeah, so if there's any uh, Pro Conti or uh, World Tour uh, women's teams uh, DSs out there, uh, if you don't already have... Uh, Dr. Jacqueline Godby's uh, phone number in your Rolodex. Yeah, you kind of need to get that. Cause, uh, oh, I yeah. I, li listen, I guarantee you there are multiple teams that have been in contact with Godby as she whipped their well-paid professional riders in their virtual <laughs> racing early on in the season. When, uh, when you're paying someone five figures to race their bike for a living and uh, they get beat by someone who's in the middle of their PhD MD studies uh, as an amateur, <laughs> it definitely puts that rider on, uh, on your radar. And Godby, on multiple occasions, beat out Continental and Pro Continental riders on the platform here. So... Yeah, they are, uh, they are well aware of uh, Godby here. The question is really just how much time Godby has in her day. I mean, this is literally like there are so many people that want a piece of Jackie Godby, and me included. Like, I want to see Jackie Godby race every <laughs> single race on the real-life circuit, but I also want to see Jackie finish her PhD and make sure that, you know, she has a real job and can save lives with her radiology degree which is i'm sure much needed uh, around the world so uh you know as much as i want to see godby pursue a professional racing career professional virtual career professional real life career she's got to 
got bills to pay at the same time. Yeah. So yeah. student loans don't pay themselves. That's right. She's got student loans, and she's got, I'm sure, an excellent future as a uh, medical doctor coming coming at her pretty quickly. I'm not as much as uh, she'd make an impact as a uh, as a professional bike racer. I, I'm skeptical, and then sad to say, but I don't think she could take the pay cut. Uh, but uh, meanwhile, she's uh, putting her mark on this uh, on this uh, elite women's race, and it looks like uh, Pam Troyer is still no woman's land. She's about 150 meters uh, ahead of the chasing field. So I have a suspicion that Troyer will at some point get absorbed. And it looks like the group of uh, four behind her are working acceptably well together. Although I see Magendi falling off a bit. But we've also got um, some pretty active Cat 2 and Cat 3 races. Let's see if we can figure out what's been going on there. It looks like Vince Giesler in Cat 2 has been... Uh, continuing to uh, tap out the laps. He's now got a group of three up the road with Radenauer and Boniface, and it appears that poor Luke Hubner, podcasting can't save him now. He's about 300 meters off the back of that group of three, and he's only about 70 meters ahead of the group of four chasers. So we kind of have uh, three fields on the road, and I have a strong suspicion that is about to become two fields because I think that Hubner will be gratefully absorbed by that group of four and will uh, revisit his attack on the front three riders um, as part of a group of five. So we've got three up the road. We've got four and soon to be five chasing together. Uh, and it's about to be a very interesting race because I think we've got the Cat Twos are pretty far into their race now. They've got about 45 kilometers covered. They've gone over the big hill, but they got a couple big hills in their future. And meanwhile, we're looking over at the Category 3s, and it's uh, we've been calling uh, Simon Israel and Michael Matthews' names quite a bit, but they've got their friends Vandegreen and Richards with them. And that is a sort of a, a, a ragged group of four, but that ragged group of four now has over a kilometer of gap to the remaining group of three. So... Excuse me, this group of four looks like it's basically going to provide your podium barring catastrophe. Just these riders have been too strong, their gap has been rising, and there's not enough chasers to really put a dent in them. So we take a peek back at the uh, category two field again here. Yeah, I'm with you. I think like the cat three is uh, pretty well sorted in this group. The cat twos, though, I think have the opportunity to drastically change this scenario because Geisler is slowly but surely losing his gap back yeah. to uh, Boniface and Ridenauer here. So we may see a new leader at the front of the Cat 2s pretty soon, which is significant because Geisler has been solo out here for, uh, well, let's see, the better part of, I want to say, 30-plus minutes. They're an hour 12 <laughs> into this one right now, maybe even more than that. Geisler had a, a pretty early break out of this group. Yeah, I mean, he's, he's kind of following a game plan he has a lot, which is he, he puts in the big attacks, he's willing to go solo, he doesn't mind riding alone, but now what's working him against him here in the Cat 2 race, as opposed to what we're seeing in the threes, is that uh, the numbers behind him. So Boniface and Ridenauer, I don't know Ridenauer well, but Boniface is no slouch. We saw him do an early attack as well. He's sitting there only 70 meters behind. Um, it'll be interesting to see if he's decided to close that down, but... There's also a pretty credible group of four that's only 300 meters behind these guys. And, I mean, if if Ridenauer, Boniface, and Giesler get together, that's a credible trio. But, on the other hand, if they don't work together, um, I think there's a real prospect of this group of four chasing them down. Um, I guess what I'm... Or a group of five, rather. Sorry, Mr. Guest, I shouldn't uh, dismiss you quite that quickly. I think that the... The difference is that maybe rightly or wrongly, I trust the names that I'm seeing in this group of five. It's both a little bit bigger than the compositions we're seeing in the threes, and it's riders like Jerome Riken who are definitely no slouch on the road. So they have the ability to work well together. They have the ability to put out the watts, and they have the ability to TTT back up to this leading group or groups, really, because I guess what are we looking at now? It's still Giesler being chased by Boniface and Ridenauer. And, and Giesler still has a lead. He's about 200 meters ahead of his lead chasers, who are Boniface and Ridenauer. And, you know, they're riding over this rolling terrain. We're going to see these gaps uh, compress down because 
Giesler is on a climb. Boniface and Ridenauer are kind of on a false flat, and the chasers are just starting the climb. So uh, it's a confusing race situation, which is fun because that means we don't know what's going to happen next. And uh, the only way for us to find out, Brad, uh, is going to be to uh, keep watching this bike race, isn't it? Like it or not. <laughs> We're looking back at the uh, Cat 3s as well. Uh, there we can see that uh, Vandegreen, Matthews, Israel, and Richards continue to maintain their one kilometer lead over a group of chaser, three chasers. Actually, it looks like it's more like a group of two chasers because I think we can call Bart Gould somewhat dropped from that group of three. So we can call it the category threes we're going to see the the short real road bike podium come from this group of four up front almost certainly barring some sort of mishap you know network drop mechanical failure flat tire um so it'll be yeah it's it's hard to say for sure what's going to happen now we take a peek back at our uh at our cat ones jacqueline godby is out in front shock but Almost as interesting, Pam Troyer is kind of holding on in no man's land. Look at that, Brad. She's got 380 meters um, between her and the chasing field, which is uh, four riders now. It looks like it's going to be uh, um, uh, Cameron Larson, Ribs Magendi, and uh, Nadia Gontova. Um, the name that we're missing from that group is Zoe Saccio. Uh, she's gone off the back. She's about 4.3K down, so... I am not sure what happened. She was with that group earlier, so perhaps she had a mechanical. Perhaps she's having a bad day. Uh, it's hard to say for sure, but uh, we wish her well, but I don't know that there's much coming back from that. So we're now sort of looking at a composition of three groups on the road. We've got Godby off the front. We've got uh, Pamela Troyer stuck in the middle, and then we've got this group of four. Uh, I don't want to say they're riding leisurely, but this does not work. They're attacking or sort of, you know, riding perfectly together when you when you see them riding fast and well together you'll see them form into a line we've talked about how even in virtual racing you can see an effect you also see on the road which is that when a group is stretched out in a long thin line it means they're working hard and when a group is all sort of clumped together it means they're taking a pretty relaxed pace so that's what i see in this group of four in the elite women as we look back at the Category 3 race, and it looks like we've got uh, Mr. Richards taking a small gap over Matthews, Vandegreen, and Israel. So we talked about this being our group of four, but Matthews is trying to get back to Richards. It might become a group of two. So we see Matthews now on Richards, and then we've got about a 40-meter gap between this duo to Vandegreen and Israel, who we're looking at now. So Vandergreen and Israel have to be worried because that could be the race riding away from them. Um, they're not necessarily strong enough to just bring that back. Uh, wouldn't that wouldn't that be something if that was all that Richards needed was uh, just one other rider and once he gets matched, they take off again. This will be uh, <laughs> a telling next 20 kilometers or so now that Richards has a little bit of company up at the front. Meanwhile, Geisler about to get some company as well with Ridenauer joining at the front of the Cat 2 race for the first time. Yes, indeed. It, uh, yeah, that's actually impressive because uh, geisler has been out there for a pretty long time now. And so we've got Ridenauer joining him. Brett Boniface is now the man in the middle. He's uh, about 130 meters back from this group. So... Uh, I wonder if he can catch up. He's, as we've said before, he's a strong rider. Um, he's on a descent, so he's got a chance. But uh, Giesler's a big, strong boy as well, and I suspect that he will get credit for his weight on the descent. Uh, not, not really a euphemism. I think he'll actually get credit for his weight on the descent, and that means he'll have an easier descent. So it's possible that Giesler and Ridenauer will have a pretty down um and boniface is going to have some trouble chasing them so he may be waiting for uh the roads to turn flat again so he can start to make a dent in that pair and they're still being chased by a group of four and then we've got our our cat threes which is still sort of two and two we can see vandergreen and simon israel clawing their way back to richards and matthews so it looks like vandergreen i think is about to catch richards and matthews so they're going to make this a group of four again and as we watch our Cat 1 women, our pro women, uh, things are starting to get nasty. 
because uh, we can see Troyer still out in the middle. Gontova has got a slight lead on this climb. She's not dropping Cameron, but she's gapping her. And then Cameron and Ribs Magendi and Holly Larson are all there. It's uh, Fiona Magendi. Uh, she got the uh, nickname Ribs for the number of times that she broke her ribs. I'm sure she uh, really appreciates uh, us mentioning that. Um, but um, we don't care. We're, we're mean people. Sorry, Fiona. Um, <laughs> right, so we see Pam Troyer there. She's still about... She's actually kind of... She's managing the damage. Uh, she's not just disappearing into the arms of the chasers. She's still only about 550 meters behind uh, Godby. Um, and, you know, she's got about 150-odd meters between her and the first of this group of four that's coming after her. So, uh, just just a hard, hard race for Troyer. She's got to see if she can stick it out and stay away from these four chasers for... What is going to be how much longer? She's got... The, the Chasers have 62 to go. Troyer has 62 to go. She's not that far ahead. So that is a long, long solo ride for her. We're taking a peek now at the Category 2s. It looks like we've still got Gisler and Ridenauer about 400 meters ahead of Boniface. And another group of five chasers that we said were a credible group but that group of five credible chasers grupo hubner we'll call them because he's the only one of them that has a podcast as far as i know grupo hubner is uh is a group of five and they are almost a kilometer behind brett boniface and that is not the right way for them to be going now might be an effect of them just coming up and over that climb but now they've got this descent and they've got to work together and keep the pressure on or else this race is going to disappear in front of them and these guys will be very quickly racing for nothing more glorious than the extended fifth fourth and fifth place of the mountain bike podium uh, none of these guys strike me as mountain bikers so i'm sure they're not very happy about that yeah these guys one step away from racing for socks if they don't get it together and try and get organized here they're gonna be holding a two small pair of socks on the podium pretty soon here it'll look uh, it'll look good with your cargo shorts and flip-flops with your jersey on top though goldberg and chan on the climb here on the right side of the screen let's move in with them five and six in the cap threes here and gould is really the only one that uh this duo would be worried about immediately right now. And there's a nice view of what he's looking at up the road. Gould, by the way, is wearing the uh, Canyon Esports kit. This is another pro kit available uh, in the game for the riders. Canyon actually launching uh, uh, their own amateur team, kind of like the Herd, I guess. They now have a thing called the Coalition, where they're inviting uh, any racer that, they, that uh, wants to participate to come join the uh, Canyon Esports team. That comes with the kit as well. I think they have one of the cooler kits in the virtual world. They did a nice job with this jersey. So uh, looks like Gould has selected the Canyon Esports kit when logging into RGT this morning. Yeah, it's a fine looking kit. It's uh, reminiscent of a thing of my youth. Uh, the 90s were a fine, fine time, uh, Brad. Uh, and you should read it up on them. They were pretty great. Ah, uh, yeah, and meanwhile, we're looking back here at our Category 2 field, and it continues to be the Giesler and Ridenauer show uh, with Brett Bonifaci, our fine Italian rider, um, sitting in no man's land in third place. And then uh, he's still holding off the group uh, about a kilometer behind him, McCall, Hubner, Guest, and Dumper. And let's not forget uh, Jerome Reichen. So... Yeah, it's a it's an interesting and challenging composition here. I'm not really sure why. Excuse me, this group is not making an impact on the lead three riders. I mean, we know those riders up front are all strong. Um, uh, Giesler has been a credible threat in all kinds of races in this series, and there's no reason he wouldn't be a threat here. Boniface is a good rider both on and off the trainer, and uh, you know, but. But this group of five is is not a weak group. So, but they're also only 17k to go. So I don't think this is a, a case of 
this group of five leaving their uh, opponents out to cook. I think this is a group of five that just isn't making the catch today. So problem for them. So come on, Luke, find a better group. Time to break away and uh, and drop these guys. They're no good for you. <laughs> they're, they're bad friends. And they're keeping yeah, you right with the fast guys. What are you doing back <laughs> here? You should be up at the front of the race. Speaking of bad friends, as we peek at the Cat 3s, it looks like we've got Richards and Matthews going hammer and tongs. And they're also only 20 kilometers from the finish. They've got about a 300-meter gap back to Vandegrind and Simon Israel. So that's kind of one, two, three, four. And then it's a big two kilometers, an insurmountable two kilometers back to Goldberg, Chan, Gould, and, and so on. It looks like actually Staten has been dropped out of that group as well as Weaslake and Cox. And it's just... The Cat 3 field is shredded, but the only ones that matter are these first two positions. It's going to be Richards and Matthews, and if they don't get their act together pretty quick, Vandegreen and Israel will be fighting for nothing more than third place. Still an honorable position, but certainly not the one they were planning on getting. And now let's take a peek and see how our Cat 1 Pro women are doing. And we've got Gontova and Cameron riding together and looking very credible. Um... They still haven't caught Troyer, although I think that gap is down quite a bit. They're down to about 130 meters on her. And that looks like a number that they can close in on. So whether she likes it or not, Pam Troyer may have some friends very soon. And Godby is almost having a normal one. Um, just taking it over. She's one and a half kilometers ahead of these riders. Almost a, And we can see Pam Troyer's name pop up on our screen here. So... Uh, Gontova and Cameron are getting closer with every moment, and they're working well together. You can see them sort of trading pace and riding steady up and down. And uh, they've also they've also got a substantial gap on the next two riders in line, which would be Ribs, Magendi, and Holly Larson. So uh, this race is kind of starting to define itself. Like Larson and Magendi really need to clean their teeth because. Uh, yeah, you can't leave Guntova and Cameron to just ride away from you. They will, especially when they join Troyer. That's going to be a group of three that can go away and stay away. So I, I know that uh, Larson and Magenda have got to be thinking pretty hard about it being time to go or not. So, so we see Guntova and Cameron continuing to work on making the catch. This is still early days in this race. We're only 14 kilometers into the women's race. They've just come over the first hill. Um, in their event and so we're seeing them I think we're going to call it that in this descent they're definitely going to catch Pam Troyer unless Pam puts in a heroic effort and as I watch that number come down I think that's exactly what we're going to see here so you know Godby continues to ride away at the front she's about a kilometer and a half away and now we're going to have a group of three that will be chasing her with second third and fourth in hand on the road so Troyer, Cameron, and Gontova. I, I don't know Gontova well, but I know Cameron and Troyer well, and I know they know each other well. So they'll be very, there'll be a lot of respect in this trio. They'll know that they can work well together. They'll know what they can accomplish, and they'll know that it's worthwhile to work for a while in order to put some space between themselves and Magendi and Larson, right? Um, those are those are two riders behind them that are, uh, well, let's just say, well worth dropping. Uh, in the sense that those are, <laughs> yeah, that's a duo that uh, uh, that has strong enough legs that if you can eliminate them from the race, that might be a good plan. And here we go. We can see the catch. Troyer, Gontava, and Cameron. This is your peloton. And uh, as we look at these riders, I think this might be a, uh, I think this might be a good opportunity to talk about one of them. We've got. Uh, Damon's got an interview with Nadia Gontova that he's going to show you in a few moments. Uh, maybe we can learn a little more about the rider than I know the least about as we watch these three riders continue to prosecute their chase of uh, Jackie Godby. Um, and so I think we're going to cut over to the interview with Nadia now. I'll just start with uh, introduce yourself, your name, age, and nationality. Um, 
My name's Nadia Gontova. I'm 20 and I'm Canadian. And Nadia, which team were you racing for on RGT last weekend? Um, I was just going solo. I was not on a team. Nice. Right, so um, that must have made the dynamics of, of racing against some other teams on on the course a little bit more interesting. Did you have a pre-race plan? Um, no, I'm not very experienced with e-racing and all the other races I've done. I did a few races in a Zwift League in a men's like in the men's category. So coming into this one, I didn't really have a strategy other than trying to hold on and see what happens. Amazing. And and how did the the plan work out for you? I see you you got some pretty good results with a with a podium in there. So so how did the race end up playing out? Um, yeah, so this was my first RGT race, um, and I got two pieces of advice from my friend Laura, who's a big e-racer, and she told me to not get dropped at the start and practice on RGT, and I didn't practice on RGT, and I got dropped at the start. Um, so then it definitely took a pretty big effort to catch back up to the pack, um, but I was super happy about that. Um, and then I guess from there, I was just holding on to wheels for as long as I could. Um, and so I guess that ended up pretty working out well. So I was definitely happy. Um, I was even happy just to finish. Like I told myself I'd be happy just to finish with somebody else. So I was definitely super happy with making the podium. That's amazing. Um, now you say this is your first real experience on RGT. So what's the, the one key thing that surprised you the most about it? Um, I think drafting was a lot harder than I expected um, and definitely different than Zwift. The first two laps of the race, I couldn't stop kind of surging off like the front and the back, just trying to get into the draft. Um, so that was really different, but I think um, like once you get used to it, it's pretty manageable. Right, so it's, it's all about the, the in-game dynamics that you have to get used to. Um, yeah. Now last quick question, you must have some ideas of what you'd like to improve for the up and coming next three races. So what's one goal that you've got for next Saturday? Um, I think my goal is just to like ride a bit smarter, not waste watts where I don't need to. Um, and also maybe think about trying to make some moves or like play, I don't know, race the race instead of just sitting on wheels and hoping I do okay. So you got to get yourself out there and then try some new tactics to see. Yeah. Awesome. Um, thanks a lot for quickly chatting to us this afternoon, Nadia. We uh, hope to see you up there on the courses. Yeah, thank you. I love it. She's like, oh. I got two pieces of advice for my first e-race on RGT, and I didn't listen to either one of them. That is, I think, the story for a lot of riders on RGT. You can uh, study it as much as you want, but you heard her talking about uh, trying to overcome the sort of washing machine effect, as we call it, where riders will surge up to the front and then try to modulate that power. And then, of course, the all-important start as well, where uh, you have to ratchet the power up. But uh, looks like she got it figured out this week. Yeah, it's uh, she's a she's apparently a quick learner because here she is in the uh, in the decisive group at the moment, uh, the group Ogontova, I guess we'll have to call it now, uh, along with uh, Troyer and Cameron. So, so we revisit the race situation for the uh, for the elite women. They're doing about they're about twenty kilometers into their race at this point, and meanwhile we're looking at the uh, Cat Threes and Cat Twos, and they are starting to get down to brass tacks. It appears that uh, Mr. Riddenauer has uh, ridden away from Vince Giesler. So he's got a 275 meter gap. They were riding pretty well together, I think, for a while. And now we can see that the one, two, three on the road are one, two, and three separated by about 250 or more meters each. So Brett Boniface, our fine Italian rider, local boy is sitting there about 500 meters behind Vince Giesler, and Giesler is about 250 behind Riddenauer. And then we've got our group Hubner about uh, two kilometers behind Boniface. So uh, what we're seeing is, uh, yeah, well, I can't say that the podium is settled. This is a group of four. They've got a descent, so they're going to close up on Boniface pretty quickly. 
Um, but I'm not sure if they're going to close up two kilometers quickly. And they've only got 12 kilometers of racing left. Uh, as we well know, those last 12 kilometers are quite the dilly because uh, there's a big climb at the finish. But right now, we're sort of seeing a fully shredded field in the twos. And so we take a peek here at the Cat 3s, who are not far behind. They've, we've got Michael Matthews here leading your race, and he has dropped Richards, it appears. Um, which is kind of a big deal. I believe that's Vaughn Richards. Uh, he is a, a good British Columbia boy, but I'm not sure I know that name. But uh, he's shown that his legs work anyways. Uh, he's still only about 70 meters behind Matthews, but uh, he's got some work to do if he's going to catch up with his erstwhile drafting partner and make this race go. Um, just giving you a reset on, on what our race situation is. For quite a while, we had uh, Matthews and Israel riding off the front. Then they got joined by their friends Richards and Vandergreend. And for a while, we had a group of four but you can see that the attacks have come and gone, and now we've got uh, Israel and Vandegreen riding well together for third and fourth place, but they're about 300 meters behind Richards, and they're about 330 meters behind Matthews, so that 330 meters probably covers your podium at this point, because it's another kilometer behind Israel before you see uh, any other riders. That's Micah Goldberg in the Grupo, Goldberg, Chan, Gould, and Staten. But uh, I'm afraid that those guys are out of contention except for the mountain bike podium. And so we're, we're seeing it sort of all come apart at the seams, especially in the men's races. And in the women's race, it's kind of, well, uh, there's a clinic being put on by Dr. Godby. And uh, her eager students are the uh, rest of the field. We've got, uh, we're all professionals here. We've got Troyer and Cameron and uh, Gontova. Um, working well together, riding hard. Um, again, as I say, probably A-OK -okay at the moment if they can just keep Magendi and Larson out of this race. But um, there's also a lot of racing to go left because, uh, look, this group, Gontova, is went out, what, 50 kilometers from the finish? They've been riding for 36 minutes. The race has already kind of defined itself and now what they've got to do is Troyer, Gontova, and Cameron know may feel that they're racing for second place but regardless uh, there's a lot of racing left for these three to do. Well racing is the key verb here because Gontova and Troyer are going at it on this uh, brief little uphill section on the course certainly not taking it easy on Cameron although uh, it looks like she will be able to make it back in but uh yeah, Larson and Magendi not out of this one yet. They're certainly in a tough spot. But uh, 52 kilometers is a long way to race. Yeah, it absolutely is. Uh, <clears throat> you know, and I mean, I think Larson and Magendi, if they're not the most desperate riders in this race right now, they certainly should be because... Yeah, if it's a long race for second, it's an even longer race when you're racing for fifth. And... I think that Larson and Magendi are pretty classy riders. They will certainly know that on the road, they are competitive with this group of three ahead of them, but they've got 400 meters in rising that they've got to clean up, uh, that they've got to close down if they want to be part of that conversation about the minor placings on the podium. So away they go, and we're watching them, and they're working okay together. Again, you know, this is not perfect drafting. I don't know if it maybe reflects relative inexperience with the um, with the system or not. But meanwhile, <clears throat> the parade at the front of the field continues. It's Jacqueline Godby now, destroying all comers as she has. I mean, this has been a, uh, this four week series has been a coronation for Godby. And you know, it's, what can you say? She's just a super impressive rider, eh? Enemy. Yeah, very. Take a I was going to say, it's tough to expand on uh, on Jackie Gabby's ability. One, because it's hard to diagnose on these virtual platforms, right? Like what that power means uh, until you see it in a race against names that you know. It's tough to measure that effort. But 
it's important to understand that Jackie Gaudi is putting out world tour level numbers on a raw basis. Uh, the, the wattage that she can create uh, is absolutely world tour level wattage. In fact, <clears throat> her coach, uh, Chris Navin, was saying that the numbers that she does in these virtual races would uh, position her perfectly for an hour record attempt uh, because so often she is just in time trial mode. That's her background. That's where she's comfortable riding. So she likes these sustained efforts. And uh, Naven was saying if she was able to do these numbers on a track in real life, it would be our record pace. So uh, that gives you wow. an idea of just how good Jackie Godby is in the world of bike racing. So, Jackie Godby, if you need uh, Dr. Robert Chung's um, uh, phone number, I can uh, I can connect you. I know a guy, but uh, I think we can I think we can find you some resources if you're interested in uh, taking on the most prestigious record in cycling. Uh, so, I mean, you know, what a problem we'll to have for Jackie Godby that she's just <laughs> too good at too many things, and everyone wants her to, you know, go for the highest level of these various <laughs> endeavors, whether it's, you know, the medical field or bike racing, pulled in a thousand different directions when you have talent like that. Oh, absolutely. You know, it's a funny thing to say, but the hour record might almost be a, a credible thing for her to attack because the, the about it is you don't have to do uh, quite so much long, slow distance uh, work in your workout regime when you're actually training for just a one hour effort it uh it actually would constrain your training program in some ways to what should potentially be shorter efforts uh than you would if you were say trying to become a pro tour rider so you know maybe maybe uh maybe godby has it in her to just uh you know if she if she just gives up on that annoying triathlon thing she could become a uh she could uh, break the world hour record in her spare time. That's what I'm saying. So there's a there's a thought that we can we can put into the good doctor's head here. Uh, see if she wants to make a hobby of you know destroying one of the most important and prestigious records in cycling. Just you know you might you yeah. might want to consider that. But we didn't even mention all the work that she's put into her triathlon career. A multi-time winner of the Chicago Triathlon. Uh, uh, you know, that involves some pretty significant training off the bike as well in the pool and running. So uh, I don't know if she wants to give up all that work to, <laughs> just, to just to appease us, us cyclists. <laughs> Nothing but respect One for my triathlon us. friends. So, yeah, I, maybe the, the two weirdest groups in endurance sports, cyclists and triathletes <laughs> and Jackie Gobby is <laughs> right in the middle. We're fighting over her. It's a tug of war. That's right. <laughs> and the well, doctors what throw a, the what... doctors in there too, trying to get a piece. <laughs> not not a problem I've ever had in my life, Brad. I, I can't say that uh, doctors, triathletes, and professional cycling teams have fought over my uh, my body. So, uh, right. but you know, we see we definitely see a great future in front of this young woman, and uh, as we watch her ride away once again from the competition. Uh, competition in this case being our uh, friends uh, Troyer Cameron and Gontova with uh, Ribs Magendi and Holly Larson still trying to get in contact. I think they're about 400 meters behind uh, the Grupo Gontova, so that's a uh, that's still an active race and 49 kilometers to go. But meanwhile, we got to pay some attention because look at this: our Cat Twos are only three kilometers from the finish, four kilometers, I guess. That's uh, Nathan Ridenauer, I believe who is uh, leading that field. Sorry, Nicholas Ridenauer. My apologies. I'll just make up any name for these guys. Nicholas Ridenauer has now decisively dropped um, Vince Giesler and uh, Giant Hill that he may be about to ride up or not. I am confident that will be a decisive gap. All he has to do is basically sustain his effort and he will tell him away with victory. Vince Giesler may not be happy with second place, but he's uh, got that pretty locked up as well. He's sitting about... 600 meters behind Ridenauer, but he's also about 400 meters ahead of Brett Boniface. So Brett has been kind of riding on his own for a very long time, and I'm pretty sure he wanted to catch Giesler and Ridenauer, but I don't think he's going to catch either of them. And then we've got our group of four. I had great hopes for the Grupo Hubner, but they did not. Uh, they did not fulfill their promise. Come on, Luke. I I I, I thought you were cool, man thought like the podcast wasn't all there was but anyway maybe next race right luke sorry 
I can't. I can't be too mean to Luke. He's a he's a great young kid, and he's got a great attitude, and I've seen him do very good things.、Uh, and also, he's 17 years old, so he's going to get better.、Um, and when he does, I think that a lot of these guys who are about to、uh, finish on the podium will have bigger problems. But、uh, Hubner is still riding it out, and he'll probably be pretty happy with a sprint at the finish because he's a sprinty guy. But、uh, right now, he's riding together with this group of four, which is going to be Jamie Dumper,、uh, McCall, and Jerome Ryken、uh, coming to the finish. But at the moment, with 2.7 to go, we are watching Mr. Ridenour, Nicholas Ridenour. He.、Uh, Is apparently riding for the Full Greens Cycling Club, which I cannot say I know much about. And he says he started riding a bike in June of last year, but oh, turns out he was formerly a competitive rider. So it's possible that he's moved some of his arm watts into leg watts, and I guess that plan worked out. <laughs> he, he says about today's race, I'm not sure what will happen, but I hope I will have a good time. Well. <laughs> I、Story、bet you Nicholas life, is having a pretty. Yeah. <laughs> are you having a good time there, Nicholas? Because it sure looks like you're having a good time, and I know that your opponents are having a very, very bad time indeed. This was an awesome attack from Ridenour today.、Uh, I mean, just a perfect timing. He obviously like knows himself pretty well. He has a a pretty good tune on what was left in the tank when he left Geisler、uh, to open up 650, 700 meters. Uh, and just kind of hold it right here where he needs to be. He's not to, he's not overcompensating now that he's got away from Geisler. He knows as long as that sits at 650, he doesn't need to do any more work than that. He can save that in case、uh, Geisler redoubles his efforts back behind. But I think Ridenour's got this. I think he's going to solo to a win today at 2K on the way uphill. Welcome to bike racing. I hope you stick around and <laughs> do some more of it because、uh, you're pretty good at it, my friend. I think this is a name we may be calling more than once in the future. So yeah, he's got a bit of a parade. I guess、uh, two kilometers, fairly steep climb. He's going to be more than five minutes, I think, before he finishes. And we're taking a peek at the Cat Threes, who are also having quite the race.、Oh, uh, yeah, yeah. <clears throat> Looks like Vaughn Richards is、uh, finally put a gap on Michael Matthews. So. Uh, Richards is away to the races. He's only got 170 meters, but man, how is Matthews going to find it in himself to close this down again? Unless he's just a angelic climber by comparison. So that is kind of the race, and both Matthews and Richards have to know it that they've got 5.3k to go. It's going to be a long 5.3k because it's all uphill from here. You're seeing them on a descent now, but it's Soon as that descent wraps up,、uh, they're basically on a climb to the finish. And in third and fourth, we've got Vandergreen and Israel. So Simon Israel and Michael Matthews made up our first breakaway group of the day. But now Matthews is stuck in the middle, not quite caught up to the lead. And Israel and Vandergreen are sort of chasing each other for the third place position. And I can pretty confidently say that. These guys are not going to be able to get back up to Matthews, barring catastrophe. So this is going to be a race for third, and they are well clear of the、uh, Grupo Goldberg behind them. So that's this is、right、the、there. race for third and fourth. What's that? <laughs> Vandergreen just went. They're starting to starting to、yeah. attack each other at them at、uh, that group. Yeah, I I don't think there's any point, and they must understand this by now. There's no point in Vandergreen and Israel doing an ounce of work with each other for the rest of this race. They may slow down, they may take a relaxed pace, but there will be no cooperative work between them because they they can see very clearly from the race situation that their only competition is each other now. They are racing for third and nothing else. They're not going to catch second, and they're not going to get caught by fifth. Good eye here in the pro women's race as Troyer finally gets caught by Cameron and Gontova. This is the group that has been chasing Troyer ever since she came unglued from Jackie Godby, <laughs> the only rider that was able to go with Godby、uh, in her initial breakaway 46 minutes ago. 46 minutes into this 48-minute race. And then back to Ridenour on his way into the finish for a Category Two win as、uh, he's about to come up on 1K to go here. Geisler not going to be able to do it, so、uh, I think he's got this one. 
Yeah, he'll be very happy to see that Fiam Rouge. And as we know, there's a little tiny kick up just as they get past that 1K to go mark. But after that, he's going to be over the worst of this climb. And then he's got a relatively easy parade for the, the next 900 odd meters before he will see the finish. So, Shpo Ridden Hour, that is the peak of the climb right there that you're about to ride over. And from here, you've got a pretty steady cruise. And you've got a 500 meter lead, and there's only 800 meters left of racing. So uh, hopefully your internet connection stays up for another 30 odd seconds. That you're going to need to finish this race out. And indeed, we follow him in. So congratulations, Nicholas Ridenauer says he was going to have fun in this race no matter what happened, but. Uh, I think he's about to learn that there is nothing more fun than winning a bike race. Look at him. He's yeah. still doing five watts per kilo at, uh, yeah, he's... at 500 meters to go. There's uh, there's no relaxing for ridden hour here. <laughs> well, chapeau to that man. And Giesler is chasing him down, but he will not chase him away. But uh, Giesler actually still has to do a little bit of work because there's one kilometer left and he's not really clear of Boniface in, in you know, we talked about Boniface being a pretty good climber, and Giesler is the opposite of a pretty good climber. He's a strong diesel rider, but he's also pretty heavy. And so as we watch Ridenauer in his final 150 meters, he can almost see the finish line. You can see those beautiful 100 meter to go banners. As he passes all of our sponsors, including 7-Eleven and Cobotics, and he's going to take the finish. Congratulations to Nicholas Ridenauer. 25 years old and he has won the virtual joe martin stage race and oh, meanwhile we've this. got vince giesler i thought this was going to be He's a safe second place caught. for giesler but i thought this was over this too. is not safe this is awesome Giesler has got only 30 meters on boniface he's come over the crest of the hill so maybe he can diesel away but boniface is an attacking rider He's got that Italian racing spirit, of course. Let's see what he can uh, what he can manage. But oh, Giesler is starting to pull away. Giesler just Scott. looked in the rearview mirror for the first time. He's like, "What is this?" <laughs> this this finishes trouble for both of these riders. We can see Giesler. He's got seventy meters, six hundred to go. I think he can hold this off, but it is by no means going to be trivial. He's digging in. Let's watch the numbers. Boniface still at about 85 meters. He's not. He's not making any. He's not doing any damage. I think that maybe Brett managed to pull the trigger on his big effort on the climb, knowing that that's where he had to make the catch. And because he hasn't made the catch, I think that's all it. So he was. He put, he put Giesler in some danger of losing his second place, but with 200 meters to go, I think that Giesler's going to be able to hold off a charging Brett. Well, I say that, but the numbers keep coming down. Brett is not going quietly, is he? Come on, Brett. Come on. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, Vince. No. <laughs> yeah, we, it's not that we hate Vince Giesler. It's just that we love a good finish. Yeah, exactly. But... With a 60 meter gap and 50 meters to go, I think we can award this one. Congratulations to Vince Giesler. He holds off a hard, hard charging Brett Boniface. And that is your category two podium in a time of one minute and 52 seconds. That is a fast average speed over a very non-trivial course. That finish had all the makings of a guy celebrating early, zipping up the jersey <laughs> and then getting passed on the line. <laughs> I mean, we, we celebrated early on Vince's behalf, and then he got to the top of the yeah, climb, and we're like, wait, uh, um. <laughs> so now we're watching as our uh, elite women, they're still not even at the halfway mark of their race, so they've got everything to ride for. And it's Troyer, Gontova, and Cameron fighting over her second, third, and fourth as we see Jack Godby continue to tap out the pedals. Her lead is now up to about three kilometers, and it's kind of looking like her template. But now we're peeking back at the category threes, and what do we have here, Brad Soner? It appears that we've got Mr. Richards 
with only a not very substantial gap over Matthews on that final climb. He's got one and a half K to go. These guys been going at it all day. Richards and Matthews up at the front. Yeah. And in the Cat 2s, meanwhile, we're going to get a sprint finish. So thank you, Luke Hubner. He's going to give us a he's going to give us an aggressive attacking finish because they're only 500 meters from the end. So they've come up on over top of that hill all together. And now it's going to be a straight 500 meter, ugly, slightly uphill drag race finish. Uh, I just wish that the Cat 2s and Cat 3s had spaced out their exciting finishes a bit more. We're going to have to, like, double commentate on uh, the the events as they rapidly proceed to us. But I think we're going to get the uh, Cat 2 sprints here first as Jamie Dumper takes a run. Guest on his on his wheel. Luke Hubner still there. Uh, I'm afraid they've dropped McCall more or less. McCall's about 50 meters back, but there's only about... Uh, there's not much distance left. We've uh, we've converted the race briefly to Imperial, so don't let that phase you. We're about two tenths of a mile away. I believe that's uh, uh, I don't know. That's about a thousand feet, which would be about three hundred meters in the uh, in the new metric in the new uh, units. We can see actually the side of the road signs. We just went past the two hundred meter line, and there's Luke Hubner. Come on, I did call this. Hubner is a good sprinter. I've seen him on the track, and away he goes. But is Guess going to catch him? Oh. Is he? You're not. Oh, Luke, come on. <laughs> How did that get scored? Guest takes it. Guest by, got oh, it. Oh, my goodness. Oh, he got him. By nothing. Hubner, Luke, man, that was that was for fourth place. That's like extended mountain bike podium. Oh, Luke. Oh, I, I believed in you, man. Oh, that's got to be a heartbreaker for Luke wow. Hubner. He's uh, he's going to be thinking about that one for a week and a half. I'm pretty confident. So, uh, Luke, tell us all about that one on the uh, next uh, edition of the Zone 2 podcast, which I'm sure Luke would like you to know is the name of his uh, podcast, which he does with a couple of his uh, other uh, young racing buddies. And it's just super fun to listen to. Uh, it's got a loose and casual feel. And um, what, they, what they lack in... Um, in professionalism they more than make up for an enthusiasm and it is in my podcast subscriptions as we speak meanwhile we're taking a peek as damon shows us that very soon in about three and a half minutes we will be beginning the cat one race as we watch the cat three race finish up this is the lead rider richards mr richards will be 600 meters from the finish vaughn richards He's, he's a true descender, he says. And uh, he is a former soccer player who turned to cycling after he hurt himself. The classic entryway into cycling, get hurt doing another sport. Right. Well, this was a great one at the front between these two today. Richards and Matthews going at it. I think Matthews was maybe a little more aggressive, so he gets the uh, most combative award for the day. But uh, Richards, I guess it's three k to go ish. I think was uh, clear enough to call it a gap, and going to end the day right around a hundred meters up on Matthews. <laughs> yeah, it's a nice ride for Richards. Another one of these riders who's sort of relatively new to the sport, and chapeau to him. I hope that we will see him on the road soon nice. so uh good job to vaughn richards your winner today and i'm sure michael Matthew much rather have won this race than settle for second but there is no shame he rode as you say in a very aggressive race today we'll give him the combativity prize the red numbers as you would get in the tour de france uh so nicely ridden and it looks like we're gonna have a bit of a a sprint to the finish in the third place Cat 2 ride because we've still got, uh, I think it's uh, Vandegreen and, uh, or sorry, the Cat 3 racers. But we're we're looking at all the actions all at once here. We're about 90 seconds away from the pro men starting. We're about, uh, we're only seconds away from the Cat 3 third place finish, which is a contested finish. I think we've still got, uh, who's that? Vandegreen and one other rider who are 
riding pretty closely. Now it looks like Vandegrind has dropped Simon Israel, so he's got a bit of a parade to the finish now, unless Israel has a uh, a magic trick in his bag. So chapeau to Mr. Vandegrind. He's going to take that third place. Well earned. Brian Vandegrind, another rider who's just put a big put out some big efforts today to activate this race. Uh, it was a it was a good exciting race. The reason the cat twos both. And I think we can safely say Israel will uh, hold on for a fourth place finish here, and then even Chan and Goldberg look like they got a pretty good gap between them. Maybe uh, Cox and Staten at 4K back will be the next closest battle here as we're wrapping up the Cat Threes. Yeah, I think um, if I'm if I'm remembering correctly, I think Israel and Vandegreen may have been. Well, yeah, this is our. Uh, it's been a long race, but uh, as you say, Vandegreen is gonna is gonna parade home for uh, third place here, and uh, then we're gonna we're gonna see uh, Simon Israel collect fourth. But I, I don't know if Chan and Goldberg have a sprint in them. It looks like, as you say, that Chan has probably managed enough gap there for holding on to fifth place as the uh, the Cat Three field just went hard. It turned into an attack and chase, and then it shredded itself. It was just it was a classically a field that just pulled itself apart from both ends, didn't it, Brad? It just like the riders went off the front, the riders went off the back, and before you knew it, there was hardly anything you could call a peloton left, was there? Yeah, the, the elastic snapped pretty early on, and then just a few pieces coming back together as uh, the fragmented group makes their way up to the finish. Again, racing on the Mount Sequoia course today based on uh, the Joe Martin stage race, real life course. I think this is stage three normally out there, but a very uh, a four day stage race out in uh, Arkansas. They hosted a virtual race earlier in the year and uh, as part of that had their course loaded into our GT. And we're using that today in the virtual BC Cup because uh, it seemed like the most popular format to uh, watch. Meanwhile, Category 1 and Pro Men underway, our last group of the day. And look at these guys, old veterans. <laughs> Just get, It looks like they've, uh, they've struck an agreement that they're going to take it easy here in the first minute 22, but uh, AFM didn't get the memo. Ah, yes, that's uh, Alex Fraser Moran. He likes to go by AFM, and uh, we'll have to figure out a much ruder nickname for him. I've got to look at some of my research notes, but strong young rider, totally credible, very, very well known to these, to the Cat 2, uh, to the local Cat 1 2 field. And we're seeing a lot of other familiar names, yeah. Nobody here is getting uh, casually dropped. We can see we've got a field of it looks like 10 riders strong. Everybody's still there, AFM off the front, and I can see young Campbell Parrish pushing the pace there. <laughs> Looks like he does not want to let uh, Moran go up uh, up the road. Not without a fight anyway, so. Campbell Parrish, a former teammate of mine, he used to race for the Escape Velocity Cycling Club, and now he's, uh, I think in this event, he's uh, racing in a familiar jersey, the Above and Beyond team. That, of course, is... Uh, Shepherded by uh, Matt Usborne, who is also here in our race today. And I'm sure he'll be a factor because we've seen Matt be kind of a big deal in these races, haven't we? But, uh, as we're, we're taking a look, this is Bruce Bird. Uh, Bruce Bird is another guy who's been a big deal in these bike races, right? And there he is right with uh, AFM. So you can see we've got this long, stretched out line, definitely... Indicative of the level of power output going on here. Um, this is this is serious bike racing, Brad. This is some serious, serious bike racing going on. Lots of attacks. Guys, They're trying to I, establish the early breakaway. I think they must have heard me say that they were going easy early on because AFM came <laughs> rocketing through to lift the tempo up the front of the Cat 1 Pro Men's Field. Maybe I can try and help Gontova and Cameron around with uh, a little bit of that energy. See if we can 
yeah. uh, get them up to Jackie Godby here. It is, uh, it's only 3K, you know, you never know. They, they got it in them. They can do this. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, the big news, though, for the women, though, is that what Cameron and Gontova have done is they put a gap between themselves and Pam Troyer. So Troyer is now sitting about 150 meters behind uh, Gontova and Cameron, um, even as they continue to chase down Godby. So as we watch Gontova and Cameron cross through that halfway barrier, 36 kilometers down, 36 to go. Um, they've got to be happy because that means that they're at least closing up the second and third place uh, positions. And Troyer's got to be very, very unhappy about this because after she did a ton of work, held on to Godby for a long time at the start of the race, uh, she's getting dropped. And that is no bueno because this might just sort of stick her with... Uh, fourth place or worse she'll end up uh, getting caught by the the chasing riders and we bruce bird sneak now. a peek back here yeah yep bruce bird and look who's joining him that's we oh, matt husband right. these are like two of my favorite virtual racers to watch because uh these guys bury themselves on the trainer. We had uh, rider cams in the Echelon Racing League, so I got to watch the suffer faces of both of these riders, uh, and definitely guys that like a good race. I mean, they are, uh, you know, they're willing to make things interesting if they can. So they're going to be joined by Alex Frazier Moran here, or hopefully be joined by AFM, because this would be a brutal trio up on the front. There's John Cooper. That is the other half of Jackie Godby in the Triple X racing kit. One of the uh, few Triple X riders that you'll see out on the virtual platform, at least. Triple X is a massive club up in Chicago, but uh, you know, I have a few focusing on the virtual racing here. And then Sands adding a little international flavor to the front of the race. <laughs> <laughs> I believe we're supposed to refer to him as Biggie Sands for his love of gold necklaces. Uh, that's what we've been informed by his uh, quote-unquote friend, Matt Osborne. But uh, yeah, we're, we're definitely seeing some attacking races here. Uh, attacking racing here. Uh, and that's young Manu Moore. Manu is only 16 years old. He's racing for the Red Truck Racing Team here, uh, a local force in amateur racing. Um, and uh, he's putting on a good show for us as he tries to uh, catch up to Jude Sands, who our current leader. So he's got a small gap between himself and the chasing pack. Um, and there we see Bruce Bird leading that chasing pack, and he's got Weber on his wheel and then the whole group. So lots of interesting attacking work. Uh, definitely, these guys are not sitting around and waiting for this race to activate uh it's, we've got 11 riders in this race who are all very keen to make the race happen as it were so kind of an interesting scenario out. here spread out across the road you see the gap that they're looking at up ahead and it's only 75 yeah, it's, it's meters 70... up to manu more green shot here yeah, I, I don't know Sands quite that well, but Manu Moore, is, he'll, he'll be a credible threat, but it might be that some of these big boys in the field are thinking that Manu Moore is not going to be so dangerous that they can't let him hang out to dry for a little while. So this may be a tactical decision by the field to not chase Moore and Sands so hard. So good news, boys. You've been given a little bit of leash. Bad news, boys. This means that the field doesn't believe in you. So, Manu and Jude, I'm, uh, I'm exhorting you. Prove the field wrong. Attack them and make them pay for their lackadaisical attitude. Because there's, there's no greater motivation in bike racing than spite and vengeance. Uh, never mind, they got caught. <laughs> Maybe it wasn't their day. It's uh, Tom Tarblanche, another 17-year-old rider. So, uh... There's a lot of youth and exuberance coming to the front of this field today, and you got to love it. You know, I, I just like the thought of uh, these guys letting uh, letting some of the uh, more senior riders in the field uh, feel every day of their years. Uh, so yeah, for guys sure. like Tom Terblanche have nothing but their future ahead of them. 
So go on, wee Tom Tarblanche. Let's see what you've got. What he's got right now is a 40-meter gap over the chasing field. Passing the torch to Terre Blanche here. I saw, uh, we, well, <laughs> we had some interviews from Tom uh, earlier in the race. We've been running interviews all day that uh, Tom has been conducting, catching up with some of our riders. It's been cool to hear from them. And uh, I think Tom is a budding announcer himself. We got to get him on the mic sometime. Sounds like I think he'd be good at it. Yeah, absolutely, Tom. Uh Give me a call. We've got a few races happening uh, later this year, we hope, and uh, we've uh, we've we'll, we'll get you on the microphone at the uh, Friday night races out at the Burnaby Velodrome in the fall, if, there you go. assuming we can have those races. So we're taking a peek here at the um, at the elite women. Uh, Jackie Godby is only thirty kilometers from her finish now, and Cameron and Gontover are expanding their lead as they chase second and third. So. We've got Godby about 5K, 4.5K up the road. Cameron and Gontova are her chasers, and they are about 300 meters ahead of Troyer. And Troyer is about 400 meters ahead of Ribs Magendi and Holly Larson. So the numbers to watch are whether or not Troyer gets absorbed back into that group of three and whether they start doing any damage. But my best guess is that Cameron and Gontova are your podium right now, that they will be strong enough to ride away and stay away here. Um, and that uh, I, I'm going to guess that Troyer will eventually get caught by Magendi and Larson. It's just, there's 30 kilometers to go. That's too much racing um, for her to stay out solo. Um, and she burned a pretty big match holding on to Godby's wheel as long as she did. So that is my prediction for this race. We'll see if Pam proves yeah, me I'm, wrong. I think I'm, I think I'm with you here. Troyer, uh, had a great start. I mean, just being able to hold on to that wheel of Godby for, uh, you know, for the first, let's say, 10K puts you above 99% of other racers with Jackie Godby. I would say one of her extreme talents is the ability to split the group incredibly early on and uh, just to be able to hold on to that wheel for the first 15 minutes of racing. Pretty impressive. Now, how much she used holding on to that wheel? We're going to find out over uh, over the next 33K here. <laughs> yeah, for sure. But uh, we've done it before, and I think we have to do it again. Is um, On the evidence right now, the combativity prize in the women's race goes to Pam Troyer because she was she was the activating force. And I mean, maybe the problem is we, we've just started to regard Jacqueline Godby as a force of nature. It's not, You can't reason with her. You can't rationalize her. All you can do is basically be on the ride for a brief time of what we might now call the uh, Jacqueline Godby experience. And uh, Pam Troyer experienced that full force, but, you know, all things considered, that's that's pretty admirable. She she showed attacking spirit, and I, I love that in a bike racer. So chapeau to you, Pam. Uh, get up on there. Make, uh, make Gontova and Cameron pay for, for trying to drop you. But uh, as it stands, we're about roughly 30 kilometers from the finish of the women's race so that's a distance that they'll cover in a little under an hour so we're going to uh see a finish for them probably shortly after 1 p.m if my math is right but uh math is hard i might be a little off on that close As enough we take it close enough and we take a peek at the uh we take a peek at the cat one men, uh, men's race and it looks like young manu moore is still out front nicely done manu You'll have to pardon me. You may hear a bit of whining in the background. I'm afraid that my uh, co-commentator here in Vancouver is uh, Pinter, a small dog who has zero chill. So I'm going to mute my microphone for a moment while I try and uh, ask him to uh, behave. We must appease the great Pinter. Don't blame me. It's tough. Moore uh, holding on to a 60-meter gap. Back to Weber, Usborne, Bird, the three guys leading the chase up at the front of uh, what is an at least 10 rider group. I'm not sure how many riders behind Terre Blanche are in there. Ivani slipping in. So I'm going to say that's probably like 12, maybe 13 guys back in the chase group behind Moore. Moore's not going too hard here. 
Green, uh, green and yellow power zones for the most part, hovering right around four and a half, four point seven watts per kilo, which is a tough effort. I mean, you, you can't do four point six for the entire race. You can't do four for the entire race. For the most part, riders are going to have average watts per kilogram around uh, somewhere below three and a half. I would say is what we usually see in these uh, these RGT races. So for a level of racing like the Virtual BC Cup or uh, the Echelon Racing League earlier in the year, these are going to be somewhere around 3.2 to 3.5, let's say. So uh, more right now riding in the 4 to 5 watt per kilo zone. He can do this, but not for 63 kilometers. So at some point, he'll have to let up on that. And you can see the difference in the power for these guys back in the group. Usborn, Weber, Ivani, Casper up here doing like 3 to 3.2. Moore is occasionally tipping five up at the front. I don't think I've seen anybody in this group do five in the chase. So that's why Moore is just sort of maintaining this gap. He's not gaining time because uh, the riders are a little more efficient in the group. So that difference of one watt per kilo isn't really manifesting itself in a big time gap here. Moore's in a tough spot. He either needs to make up significant time to the point where he's in a scenario where uh, they kind of let the line out a little bit, if you will, just let him run. Or you just pull the plug, go back into the group if it becomes overwhelmingly clear that nobody is going to be joining you. And uh, it doesn't look like anyone's trying to go across the gap <laughs> here. So that leaves Moore in a pretty tough spot here. He's uh, He really only has two choices. The third choice of waiting for someone that's coming across the gap has been taken off the table because there's no one coming across the gap. So I think his two choices are uh, either try and get this like over 300 meters on the gap or pull the plug. Well, he's got a bit of a moment of truth here because they're on the first big climb of the, uh, of the parkour, the one that we've seen many times. He'll be getting up and I think this is a, this climb turns into a real wall. But as we say that, the... The truth of the matter is that the climb has completely broken more, and uh, he gets instantly absorbed back into the group once the uh, once the uh, steep slopes slip in. So, Chapeau, I'm sure he's got a few more matches to burn, and I'm sure that won't be the last time that we're calling Manu's name in this race. But right now, it's Bruce Bird leading the field up the up the climb. It's Matt Osborne doing what he does best: sit on wheels, be at the front of the race. And meanwhile, we can see the you know. Basically, everybody's sort of lying astern. This is a a moment. So we've got a group of 11. I believe this is... <laughs> yes, I'd like to like to thank our other commentator on today's race. That would be uh, Pinter, the Wonder Dog. Um, he has his own opinions about bicycles, and uh, they, 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 don't, they ought not to be shared in a, in a public venue. Because, uh, they mostly involve his uh, langu love language of barking and biting, so... We'll, uh, we'll we'll be sure to tweet out some photos of Pinter later when there's a yeah. low in the race. But right. as it is, we've got AFM in full effect in stereo at the front of the race. Alex Fraser Moran climbing the hills, trying to establish a little bit of a gap. He's got a field of 10 chasers going all the way back to uh, Tom Tarblanche. And the question is whether any of those chasing riders will get dropped off the back here. Oh my. Pinter is a valued member of the broadcast team. More yeah, happy he, to have he him. He provides a. <laughs> yeah, his, his, his job is light comic relief, and he's, uh, he's uh, doing that capably. I mean, I know none of you can see me out there in video land, but uh, trust me, the Pinter is sitting on my lap right now, staring out the window, and he's. Uh, very keen to make sure that the world is policed and safe from any effects. Thank you, dog. Yes, I know. I know. Yes, he has opinions. He certainly has opinions. Folks, if you're thinking about adopting a Jack Russell Terrier, my advice to you as the owner of three of them um, out in various times is, is don't. Please don't. Um, you know, they're Terriers. And the one rule you have to remember is we do not negotiate with Terriers. <laughs> Meanwhile, actual bike racing continues. On. 
who looks like oh, Terra no. Blanche what happened to is Blanche? off the back. Oh, no. Terra Blanche, also a valued member of the broadcast team. He did the interviews we were talking about earlier. Yes, indeed he did. And we're also looking at Manu Moore, who's also come a bit unglued from the field. He's back even behind Terra Blanche. So we've got these two young riders who are in a spot of difficulty. There's lots of time for them to catch back up. I'll let uh, Brad take over for a moment while I have a conversation with Pinter. Well, Pinter's saying there's not enough time for them to catch up. So maybe we should heed the great wisdom of Pinter here. For these guys in the gap, nice group forming up at the front, though. These are um, all familiar names, I will say, in um, my year of virtual racing. Pretty much everyone yeah. up in that front group would be considered a contender in my world. Yeah, we've got uh, one of the names we can see here is Aiden Oliphant. He's uh, got more experience as a mountain biker than a road racer, but uh, so I'm not sure how good his mad skills are likely to be uh, uh, in RGT, but nonetheless, it appears he has the legs to do his talking for him. And off the front, I think, well, actually, what we're seeing now is sort of the shredding of the race because we're looking at Karsten Avani in fifth place, a little bit ahead of this group of three. Some names we already called, like Jude Sands, um, my old friend Campbell Parrish, another one of the young riders. It's actually really exciting because there's a lot of these names in today's race that have been both active and are very young. So Campbell Parrish is 16. We called Tom Terblanche's name and we talked about his interviews. He's 17. And Manu Moore is another 16-year-old who uh, is in this race. So um, not all of the riders are juniors, but uh, the juniors have been acquitting themselves very well. And it's great to see them because we know these riders are the future of our sport after well. And right now we're watching a couple of them along with some more senior riders like Karsten Avani. Uh, try to uh, unbreak this broken up field because this group, we'll call it Group Parish, just for my old buddy Campbell, uh, is about uh, 60 meters behind the uh, Group Usborne, which is more or less the front four riders. And we're looking at them right now. It's Alex Fraser Moran, Bruce Bird, I believe that's Aiden Oliphant, our mountain biker, and we of course know him, Matt Usborne. Um, the guy who was in many ways instrumental in even organizing this four race uh, cycling BC series. So, uh, chapeau to Matt. He's also been a huge factor in the races themselves, not only making them happen, but also winning a couple and being a big, uh, a big activating influence even in the races that he didn't win, like the uh, Canary Wharf uh, crit criterium. Yeah, pretty impressive to see uh, guys like Usborne up in this front group not just in the front group, but animating the races. I know you were talking about the impressive riding of the juniors earlier, but uh, got to give some of the older gentlemen some credit in the virtual racing here. I'm pretty sure when Usborne started racing, the wheels were different sizes. <laughs> so uh, <laughs> to see him come this far into virtual racing is a, a feat in itself. Oh, I, why'd you I, have to I, do math so dirty? I'm just impressed if he was able to connect the jitterbug to uh, to <laughs> RGT. I didn't even realize they had an app for the jitterbug. <laughs> There's about uh, 57 kilometers remaining in this uh, bicycle race. They've covered about 14 and a half, and even this early into the event, they've definitely managed to activate the the race but we're sort of seeing a closing back together so just as we've been talking away here we've got a group of eight forming back at the front and that's good news for some of those people in that group of eight it's probably not so good news for the couple of riders they've left behind so we've seen Weber out the back now Tom Terblanche and Manu Moore we've already called their names um have also gone out the back and we've got uh and that might be pretty decisive and now we're seeing another split on the road as we talk an attack of four has gone away, and we've got Sands, Cooper, and Parrish uh, getting gapped again. And those are the those are the same riders that uh, those are the same riders that we saw sort of get gapped a little bit on the last uh, climb. And indeed, I think the profile is such that there was a little a little hill that put them on their back foot again. 
So I'm going to go out on a limb and say this group of five is going to be your decisive group that eventually one of these uh, little climbs is going to be too much for them. Yeah, I think that group so, of three is on the ropes for sure. They have uh, they fallen victim to that pace a couple times already today. And typically once you see that starting to happen with a consistent group, eventually they'll, uh, they'll stretch the elastic just a little too far and won't be able to get back on. So... Parrish, Cooper, and Sands. Three guys to keep an eye on. Sands maybe the uh, doing the most work out of this group, chasing back on. Meanwhile, we take a peek at the Cat 1 Pro women's field, and we can see sort of the same composition we've seen for quite a while. We've got uh, Jacqueline Godby, 20 kilometers from the finish. And then her chasers, her nearest chasers, are still Cameron and Gontova, four and a half kilometers back, nearly enough. But um, they're still only about 200 meters ahead of Pam Troyer. So it's interesting to see that Troyer hasn't gotten back with that group, but she is closer to Cameron and Gontova than she is to Magendi and Larson. So at this point, um, I can only assume that Troyer's in a big dig and hoping against hope that she can close that 150 meter gap and get back in contact with Gontova and Cameron, which is basically the sprint for second place. But you get right there now, first. the number that's the trouble. And then how much do you have yeah. left if <laughs> and when you get there? Well, yes, indeed. Uh, the thing that's working in her favor is there's still 25 kilometers to go in this race. So, I mean, if I was Pam Troyer, you know, which is to say fit and capable of bike racing, then I would probably be thinking pretty hard about putting in my big win or die effort right now. Because essentially, the race is coming down to. If you don't do a big dig and get back on terms with Gontova and Cameron immediately, then you're racing for fourth place at best. And there's two reasonably motivated riders only 750 meters behind you who would probably very much like to team trial, team time trial up to you and then beat you out for fourth place. So you might blow up in the effort to catch back on to Cameron and Gontova, but I'm not sure that'll cost you very much. Whereas that's where the prizes are, literally and metaphorically second and third place today. Troyer sitting nice and steady here. Troyer wearing the Velocity Vixen kit. I know uh, this team doing a lot of virtual racing. Strength and numbers in the uh, orange and purple. I know uh, Angie Bonacici, big part of Cycling BC, was repping that team in the Echelon Racing League earlier this year. So uh, I've seen a lot of these Velocity Vixen kits. That might just partially be because it's cool. It has uh, the cool fox on the back. I think a lot of people just pick the kit because, <laughs> well, they like it. Uh, who can deny it? Uh, I know of more than one bike racer. I know of one bike racer locally who was strongly encouraged by his also a bike racer girlfriend to change teams because the other team had a pretty cool uh had a pretty cool dog design on their kit and honestly i've seen it it was the hugh dog racing team and uh that dog design actually was pretty cool so uh i don't think he changed teams as a result but nonetheless maybe he should have troyer continues to tap out the pedals we'll keep we'll get back in touch with her soon as we take a peek at the cat one and pro men now and it appears we are looking over at Jude Sands. Jude is catching up with Mr. Cooper here. And uh, they are, well, I don't want to say they're in trouble, but they are down the road. Uh, the Grupo Parish is ahead of them. So that's, uh, this is seventh and eighth place. But um, the problem that they've got is they're getting dropped off of the field ahead of them. So there's about 150 meters between these two and the lead riders. So now what we have is a group of four four, five riders at the front. Nope, six riders at the front. Uh, math is hard, uh, Brad Soner. I'm uh, having a little trouble counting to six. That requires two hands at the moment. But uh, that group of six is Alex Frazer-Moran, Bruce Bird, Matt Usborne, uh, Aiden Oliphant, Campbell Parrish, Karsten Evani, the giant Karsten Evani. He would like you to know that. Very clever boy. He decided to put his sponsoring team's name into his name, so we must always refer to him as Karsten Avani Giant. Um, 
because you know he did he deserves to be teased for this for sure i'm with you <laughs> i respect the hustle karsten Ivani, <laughs> giant well done <laughs> yeah we, we want to see a birth certificate if you legally change your name to Ivani giant then we will absolutely respect it promise <laughs> sands and cooper in their own private hell they'd probably rather you didn't know about who their uh, team sponsors were at the moment because right now they just want to get back on terms with this leading group they're in uh, 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 seventh and eighth position and they will stay there unless they can get back in touch pretty quick they're about a uh, 130 meters down but that gap isn't growing much but it's also not shrinking at all and they are chasing too many strong riders for them to just leave this be yeah i hate to say it but i think we might be watching the tides turn in uh, the chase group back in seventh and eighth remember that was that group of three one made it across two left behind sands gonna try and leave Cooper behind now. <laughs> and That's probably the right move. I think. Across the gap. Yeah. It's kind of a walking. It's kind of a zombie group at this point. There's only two of them. I. I. They don't seem to be working that well together anymore. So it might be just a case of you know. This is the time for one of the other of them to start doing some work and try to catch up. Uh, we're taking a peek back at the Cat 1 Pro women now. So the women's field looks like Cameron and Gontova. There's a bit of rubber banding going on there. They're still together. And they're still about 250 meters ahead of Troyer. But so now we're down at 22 kilometers to go. There's five kilometers between them and Godby. I mean, you know, you hate to call it early, but uh, barring catastrophe, Godby is going to literally and metaphorically roll away with this race. Cameron and Gontova are racing for second and third. And with the way the gap has been going it's gone up to now about 300 meters they aren't you know there's there may be some rubber band effects but i think that that means that troyer is fading into the distance so she's gonna have to dig deep and this, this climb is probably her last good chance of getting back on terms uh and chasing for second but godby is just in a race of her own and i mean we she has done so much and done it so well that the problem is that you just go ho-hum Jacqueline Godby is off the front again and she's making it look easy when it is not I know how strong the riders are behind her and for her to be riding away this cleanly and confidently and easily so often is just a testament we keep telling you folks you know world-class athlete um, you know she's in her own tier of performance she may be uh, a future hour record holder. She certainly has that potential. It's just, uh, you do not use these kind of superlatives casually. She actually is as good as she looks. Um, and the problem is it's almost hard to find a benchmark and when, against which she can be properly measured. You know, so. We'll just keep saying nice things thing about should... Jacqueline. <laughs> I was going to say, the other thing we should talk about with Godby is that these numbers have been verified. If you've ever done any amateur racing on Zwift, RGT, whatever, the first few times you get on, there's always that rider in your race, right? Where you're like, there is no way this person is doing these numbers legit. Or I know this person in real life. I crush them every time. How am I getting just manhandled by this rider? A lot of times the weight or power isn't accurate. It's... uh an honor system a lot of times on the weight that you enter into the game. So uh, there are questionable performances often on these platforms. But Jackie Gobby has been verified, re-verified, triple verified, checked and rechecked by multiple organizations, every league she's ever raced in, multiple <laughs> platforms, multiple methods. Uh, there's different calibrations that they have to do on the trainer. It's all legit. I mean, the numbers are there. And so uh, there's no question that the, this is, you know, a, an inaccurate number in any way. These are uh, absolutely legit numbers at the highest level of racing, whether it's in Swift or uh, on RGT. The riders have to submit uh, these videos that show them weighing themselves, both with uh, a, a current event, sort of like a proof of life video in a weird way. They have to, like, hold up a newspaper <laughs> to show that it's today 
Uh, and then they have to weigh themselves with an object of known weight. So like a barbell, uh, something that has the weight on it. And then they have to weigh themselves without it, all while keeping themselves in the frame the entire time so that you can't, you know, edit yourself in some way. There's no way to trick the system. You have to keep yourself uh, within the shot the entire time to make sure that uh, there's no funny business going on with the way in videos either and then they have to submit to power files at the end of the race and those uh, have to align you have to submit two different power files it's called dual recording at the highest level this is uh, kind of just something that you have to do where you have to record your power file from two individual devices those have to match up perfectly because if one of them doesn't that would imply that you are doing some sort of computer magic to uh, your numbers to try to artificially inflate them, you know, using some sort of software. So the secondary power file uh, allows officials to uh, make sure that that's not happening. So it's all been checked. It's all been verified. <laughs> and uh, Jackie Godby is the real deal. It's pretty incredible. Yeah, I mean, she's just a fantastic athlete, absolutely. And I mean, even beyond all that, we know that she's got real and, and, and substantial pomaris in her her non-virtual sport of triathlon. And again, that's something you simply cannot fake. So, you know, it's, it's just really exciting, even when you're watching a virtual bike race, to see an athlete of this caliber and performance roll away. And she was rolling away indeed. She's got about 14 and a half kilometers left in her race so we will certainly revisit that and as we say that cameron and gontova continue to tap out the watts they haven't dropped each other but they are they have raised the gap between themselves and troyer to uh, a kilometer now and it looks like troyer is just coming over the top of the hill so that'll compress very slightly but i think that reflects that gontova and cameron are riding away from the race right now so that is second and third place but we take a peek back at our cat one pro men and we've got uh, the uh, indefeatable Bruce Bird, a guy that we've definitely seen uh, active and powerful in a lot of races. But right now he's got a problem, and his problem is he's about 100 meters behind the top five riders. And that is certainly not where he intended to be. Bruce Bird has some of my favorite Palmars in the world. There are not many people that can say they are a two-time Fondo world champion. Or getting two Masters Fondo World Championship titles over uh, the last 10 years or so, I'll generously say, in his time as a Master. And he's been killing it on these virtual platforms. I really likes these long, sustained efforts. Both of his uh, Fondo wins, Fondo World Championship wins, were out of breakaways. So uh, that's his style of riding. I'm sure he would like to be up in that group of five, but... Uh, Bruce Bird not panicking just yet. He uh, can absolutely come back into this group and then still have enough to hang with them on the day. I've seen him do it before. He can absolutely do it again. And uh, we'll keep an eye on this at 47K to go. I think this is where experience really shines because someone like Bruce Bird, uh, this is a lesson that you learn on the road in real life for sure. And I think he applied it to virtual racing really well. You don't need to panic. You got plenty of time to get back into the group. You don't need to blow yourself up to get in there. He comes in nice and smooth, nice and easy. And just like that, Bruce Bird back in the mix up the front of the Cat 1 Pro Men's Field. Yeah, that's that's some classy riding, as you said, not panicking, just riding your way back into the field, being steady, steady. And we've got this great group of six. I mean, they're starting to do some real damage, and we can see kind of that the when you look down the charts, you can see sort of the debris behind them. We've got, you know, this is your top six, and then there's a 300-meter and growing gap to Sands and Cooper. I mean, uh, good on them. They're still clearly trying to make a credible shot at getting back on terms, but they're just not making ground. Um, we said this was a strong group at the front and that if they worked well, that they would stay away. And they've just, I don't even know if they're working well, but they're keeping up a killer pace. And this group of six is going to be, I don't want to call it too early, but unless something changes a lot, this is almost certainly going to be our group of six at the finish. And it's all names that we've talked about before, right? Uh, I'm impressed to see young Campbell Parrish hanging on in this group as we watch. We've got, we talked about Bruce Bird and his championships. We've seen Matt Ors, Usborn, Bruce Beat, a monster in this entire series. Uh, you know, we've got AFM. He's so cool, he doesn't even need a full name, just a couple of initials. It's pretty great, honestly. Uh, we've got, you know, Karsten Avani Giant, who's so cool that he has like 
extra names that he's added for sponsor reasons. It's jokes aside though, these are six strong, strong riders and you can see them kind of go on hammer and tongs. They're, they're on another one of these little uh, tiny lumps that barely appears on our parkour at the bottom of your screen right now. But nonetheless, pretty sure they're all feeling that 15% as they crawl up it. And, you know, they're all trying to maintain contact. You can see Bruce Bird. We talked about sag climbing earlier in the day. And here's Bruce doing sort of a textbook sag climb. You know, he'll come over the, he'll come away from the group, but now he's going to catch back on on the descent. You know, again, we know he's cool as a cucumber. We know he just closes these gaps. And we're back to a group of six as soon as he catches on. And these guys have covered about 26 kilometers of their race. They've got about 45 kilometers to go. So they're well past the one third mark. They felt each other out. In a way, it's got to be pretty satisfying because these are the six riders who have pushed away the other five riders in this race. There's, you know, seventh through 11th. They're no longer a big threat to these guys. But uh, there's going to be some of them that will want to winnow down the field further. And I mean, my guesses are that of this group, I'll bet you that both um, Bird and Usborne would be very keen to use one of these little lumps in the road to sort of roll up an attack and maybe see if they can get some separation from the rest of the field and try for a small group breakaway from this group of six. Does sound yeah. right, about right to you, Brad? Yeah, I'm with you. I think someone tries to split this group of six for sure. These guys, if uh, nothing else, they'll just get bored. They just don't have the attention span to ride in a group of six <laughs> for 45 kilometers left here. So, yeah, expect to see an attack. Expect to see another at least attempt at a split here. And yeah. uh, another one, I would say, when they get to that big hill. But there'll probably be something uh, before they get there. These these guys like a, a spicy race, let's call it. Yeah. And, and you can see it right now. They're on a gentle descent, and Bruce Bird is not content. He'll just push the pace a little bit. Uh, I think he's he's digging enough to make it hurt, but probably not enough to burn a match. You know, just seeing if anybody's feeling tired and seeing who rubber bands away a little bit and who just stays right back on. And all these little attacks are just... They're keeping the pace up, which is good for this group of six. They're making sure that nobody is going to come back to them because you've got a nice group of six. The one thing you don't want to do is get complacent at this point in the race and watch like Cooper and Sands just casually ride themselves back into contention because you were being lazy. Uh, that would be embarrassing for these guys. And the, the whole point of these early selections is to get rid of riders so you stop having to think about them. You don't want to drag along the sprinters in the group and find out that they were in fact strong enough to get up that last hill and then out sprint you for glory. So if you're a breakaway artist and we know a bunch of these guys are, you want to winnow that group down and you want to keep winnowing until there's nobody left. And I think those are the effects we're seeing right now. And they're going up a little hill and once again we see sort of Bruce Bird kind of doing that climb move. He, he drops back and he sort of claws his way back. You know, he's, he's obviously more comfortable on the flats and the descents than he is on these climbs. So it'll be oh, something to watch for. Might be a little attack going on mentions. in the women's race. Ooh. Sorry, good call here, Damon. Picking up uh, Gontova attacking Cameron in the red zone here. On what looks like up and over a little bit of rise in the course. Gontova stepping on the gas here, taking it to Claire Cameron. Only has 25 meters right now, but uh, we're starting to see the first signs of some aggression in this group from Gontova. Yes, indeed. And look at this. She's attacking into the bottom of the hill. So she's created a little bit of separation, about 20 meters right now. And if she can keep this effort up, she's about to enter into the penultimate climb on the course, uh, the big one, and at least the second to last really big climb. So Maybe she's just seen a little bit of weakness, and if so, this is a place where she can really put the boots to Claire Cameron. And I know Cameron's not going to go easy. She's a strong, experienced rider. She, she hates to lose. I know she's going to be digging pretty deep right now to try and hang with Gontova. And she recognizes, she's a savvy enough racer that she recognizes exactly what is being done to her right now. So I predict that that uh, Claire Cameron is going to dig into her suitcase of courage. This is going to be the absolute moment of truth. And this is a very, very interesting attack. So 
Let's just wait and see how this plays out. The, the gap is holding at 30 meters as they hit the lower slopes. They're at about 7% grade, and it's going to keep getting steeper and steeper for quite some time here. I love watching racing like this. Gantova, it's so hard to do what Gantova did because you just have to go at some point, right? Like there's there's no clear indicator of like now's the time to go. So it's sort of this just like, okay, here we go. I'm going to go from three watts per kilo up to four and a half or try and push five, <laughs> which is uh, pretty much what Gantova did. Now, I think you're right, Ryan. I think she was trying to do it right at the base of the climb. I think she was trying to get a little bit of a jump on Claire uh, just before they got to the bottom so that uh, she didn't have to shake Claire on the way up. So I think that was really smart riding from Gantova here. We saw in uh, her interview earlier talking about how she was just learning how to race on RGT, how much she had learned from her first two races on RGT. I would say we're watching exponential growth from uh, Gantova in terms of learning and racing and using the RGT platform. It really seems like she's getting comfortable. Yes, indeed. Uh, as you say, it was just a textbook attack at the bottom of a hill. That's paid. She's she's holding her attack and she's holding that gap, but it's up to about 40 meters, which I don't think Gontova would consider a safe a safe number. That's not that's not the kind of number that you want when you're fit, when you're coming over the top and know that you've got an angry and chasing uh, opponent behind you. So. Uh, Gontova's got to keep the keep the dig going, and meanwhile, Claire is not giving up at all. And if there's any consolation for both of these riders, it's that whatever else they're doing, they're just they're digging the graves of all the riders behind them. So uh, Larson and Magendi are still back there. It looks like Pam Troyer has disappeared from our readout, so uh, she's either had a mechanical or she's dropped. Um, sorry to see her go. Like I say, she's a real attacking rider, but right now we've got a huge attack, which is Gontova putting the boots to Cameron. And let's see what she does. They're about halfway up this slope. It gets gentler from here, so um, the time for catch-up begins. But it doesn't actually flatten out meaningfully for another kilometer or so. Such a good job by Cam uh, Cameron here, holding on to the wheel. Usually when you see an attack like this, it is so tough to get back on to that, uh, that move. But Cameron... Holding this one steady at 36 meters on the gap, which is nothing in the RGT world. So uh, bravo, Claire Cameron. Way to hold on to this move. Gontova made it the first move, but uh, Cameron holding on. And oh, no, Frazier Moran looks like with a dropout here. Yeah, sad to see that. Come on, AFM. He's gotten oh. passed by Cooper and Stans. Not sure what's Maybe going on there. But... homage to, to the Campbell Parish <laughs> sign on the road. He's just getting a <laughs> selfie with Campbell. He's just a fan. <laughs> wow, we're sorry no, to see that cuz AFM was a, was a big factor in this race today. So hopefully oh. he can get back on there and maybe regroup with Sands and uh, Cooper and uh, salvage something out of this. But uh, we'll keep an eye on that and see if AFM keeps ticking down or if we uh, Alex if you've got a uh, if you've got a answer you want to share in the DMs, uh, let us know what happened. But uh, meanwhile, the race goes on without him. It'll be then a group of uh, five at the front of the Cat 1 Pro men. And meanwhile, we're taking a peek back at the uh, Pro Women's race. And Gontova has prosecuted her gap. It looks like she is at 60 meters ahead of Cameron. So she's over, she's more or less over the top. She's got one more little tiny ramp. This is kind of a false flat she's on. And then... Uh, Uh, yeah, so uh, <laughs> Gontova is just coming over the crest of the hill now. So she'll she's on about a 5% grade. It's going to flatten out any moment. And then we'll sort of get a true picture on the descent of whether or not Cameron has managed this. Cameron is, Cameron is a real cool cucumber. She won't, she won't freak out just because she's losing a few meters on a climb. She'll manage the damage and and do the right thing and you can see her she's closed within 30 meters she's now within the realm where the uh where uh rgt is showing her the drafting uh the drafting graphic which is a a way of hinting that she's within reach of gontova so just perfect 
managed effort climbing. She didn't go, she didn't lose lose her mind when she saw Gontova go up the road. She just trusted her own performance and just rode a steady, steady race. And if she keeps that up, she'll probably ride right back onto Gontova. And that will be that. And we can see the numbers. The effort. Sorry, go ahead. Absolutely. Yeah, it's just, it's just smart riding. You can see the gap is now coming down. So as they crest over the top, it's gone from 40s to 30s to 20 meters, 29, 27. Just keep watching that clock tick over. Gontova will escape a little bit as she comes over the top, but then we'll see if Cameron can get back on her wheel. So let's watch for that. This descent is absolutely crucial to the, uh, to the fortunes of both of these riders. Meanwhile, Jacqueline Godby, 5.9 kilometers from the finish. Her distance from the finish is now uh, greater, is now less than the distance to Nadia Gontova on the road. So she's got about a 7K gap to Gontova, and she's got about 5.7K to the finish line. So you may begin the victory parade for Jacqueline Godby, although we should learn the lesson of Alex Fraser Moran, which is. She could stand a pretty yeah. long technical difficulty, but, uh, you know, she could still have her network connection drop and that would be her day, so. Although Meanwhile, she's got, we're taking... Uh, she's got a pretty, pretty good gap going there. I, she might even have enough time to wait on hold with the cable company. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, she could actually go through the tech support tree and still be back in time to uh, not have lost her gap. The, um, the one thing world she cannot numbers. do is turn it off and then turn it back on. If you lose connection with RGT, there's no getting back into it. So uh, if Ooh, you do lose know. the connection, e even if you get it back, once you're out of the race, you can't rejoin. So uh, if you completely lose the connection with the game, it removes your character. Once a race has started, you can no longer join that race. So uh, that would be it. Oh, thank you, Brad. There's a cursed thought to put into Jacqueline Godby's head now. No, oh, no, I <laughs> Oh, no. <laughs> so real world distances and times. She's got uh, near enough a six and a half kilometer distance. These riders are well over 30 kilometers an hour average rolling speed. So that is something like a 10 minute gap on the road, uh, give or take. Um, that gives you an idea of how much time she's opened up in a one hour and 51 minute effort that she's been uh, out there so far. And it does indeed appear to be a yet another coronation for Dr. Dr. Jacqueline Godby, the uh, queen of the virtual, of the Cycling BC virtual uh, BC Cup. And meanwhile, though, as we look back at second place, it appears that Nadia Gontova has put paid to the efforts of Claire Cameron. She's expanding her gap. She's out to 140 meters plus over uh, Cameron and still digging. So they have both just come off the descent so that's kind of a fairly credible number in terms of real world over the road gap and there's still plenty of racing to do there's 10 kilometers and only 150 meters between them but cameron's gonna have to dig deep action on both fronts beautiful riding from gontova that's how you do it you not only have to put in that initial effort but you gotta keep going you gotta keep uh, keep putting some pressure on the dagger as uh, you go to battle so she's doing that this is her like third fourth effort it's not just one and gontova knows that meanwhile in front of the pro men's race bruce bird mixing things up and he has dropped these three usborn oliphant and ivani giants i'll get at least two of the names in there for him <laughs> back in the chase effort so uh bruce bird went from struggling on the climbs to now animating at the front oh how the fortunes can turn in virtual racing yeah and he's brought we campbell parish with him uh, campbell parish as i said a very young rider but by no means inexperienced he's product of the uh of the excellent local devo program which i'm very proud of being a, a peripheral part of and I think that Bruce Bird may or may not, we know he likes solo breakaways, but if you have to bring someone along, Campbell Parish is not a bad pair of legs to have. He'll be, um, he'll be a solid contributor, I'm sure, to this breakaway. Um, they've got their work cut out for them trying to keep away from those uh, three chasers, but I can't wait to see what they do. 
Um, meanwhile, a technical note, it looks like, in fact, Alex Fraser Moran has dropped out of the race. So we will not be seeing any catch up from him. And that leaves our group composition at the front, basically. Bird and Parrish here that we're watching one, two. They are being chased by a group of three, which is Oliphant, Usborne, and the Giant Among Men, as well as the Giant Among Sponsors, Karsten Evanni Giant. And then they have left for dead Cooper and Sands, who are about 1.3 kilometers behind this group. So Cooper and Sands are still chasing. They're still contesting sixth and seventh, and I'm sure they've still got everything to play for in terms of honor. And then we look back down the field, we've got uh, Weber, who is 1.3 kilometers behind Cooper and Sands. And then we've got Tom Terblanche. He was active early on, but uh, he got himself in trouble and he's about 1.6K behind. So these are racers and oops, good on you, Manu Moore. Hope you ride this out for the training. He, he put in a good show early on in this race and we admire him for it. And he's got lots of great bike racing ahead of him. Uh, Manu Moore is, again, I think he's uh, 16 years old. So uh, not bad. Not bad at all for that age. But speaking of teenagers, we've got the unruly Campbell Parrish. He's right up at the front with Bruce Bird, not at all a teenager. They're kind of coming at this bike racing from different ends of the age spectrum. And they are going to be joined, whether they like it or not, by the Matt <laughs> Usborne. Uh, the average age of this group just tripled. <laughs> <laughs> So I have a question for Matt Usborne, which is I uh, he's wearing the team same team jersey as Campbell Parish, and uh, I assume they are in fact teammates, and yet he just rode by Campbell Parish like he was dead meat rather than pick him up on the way. So uh, sure, the uh, team chat will be pretty zesty right now. <laughs> they, they call that the uh, tough love methodology in the teaching world. <laughs> I think uh, you know you sort of throw them to the wolves and have them learn that way. I was born uh, maybe trying to teach Parrish a lesson today. Campbell, if you want to drop a dime on uh, on Usborne, um, you know you know where to find me, and uh, it will be made anonymous in order to protect the guilty. <laughs> <laughs> Meanwhile, let's take a look at Jacqueline Godby. She is only 2.3 kilometers from the end of this uh long long day in the saddle and she must be pretty glad about that so she's gonna wrap things up in right around the two hour mark but don't forget these last two kilometers are a doozy she's got a pretty dicey climb that begins more or less now and doesn't end for another kilometer so she'll hit some pretty peak hills but nothing that's going to cause her any trouble as we said this is all but a ceremonial process at this point she has a five kilometer lead over her, the nearest rider Nadia Gontova and we take a peek back at the cat one race and the giant Karsten Avani is riding away from Campbell Parrish so Parrish has been right dropped he's just seen Ivani go by him and I'm sure he wanted to pick up that wheel on the way but so I think we can officially call Parrish in difficulty he's 20 meters behind Ivani he's got Oliphant behind him um, 100 meters back so this front group is now shredding. It's sort of group Usborne and Bird up front. And then as we go down, we've got Ivani, Parrish, and now we're looking at uh, Oliphant, Aiden Oliphant, also racing for the giant cycling team, but didn't see fit to immortalize his sponsor in his last name. So it's, it's all happening. Bird and Usborne are working well together as the field blows up behind them. Godby is working well with the only teammate that she needs, Jacqueline Godby. And Nadia Gontova is now trying to prosecute a solo effort. And Claire Cameron is like the shadow that just won't go away. It's like the, you know, it's like one of those zombies that isn't actually fast, but that you can't quite outrun because she's still hanging out there 70 meters away from God Gontova. Definitely not out of it yet. And Ribs Magendi is there. She's only 2.2 uh, kilometers behind these leading riders. It's a, it's a bit of a thing, but she's also dropped Holly Larson, and I think that's the real news here. So Larson is now 450 meters behind Magendi. So that's a pretty decisive break, uh, and it means that Magendi has got fourth place kind of sort of locked up. Um, I think given distance to finish and all that, she's not going to catch either Cameron or Gontova. But... We're watching Godby is about halfway up this long final climb. 
She's got about uh, 500 meters before the road flattens out for her. But she'll have a 15% grade that she's hitting on the way. And meanwhile, we take a peek at Gontova and Cameron. The gap is now 50 meters. So Cameron is closing. This is this is desperate times. This is Cameron not panicking. I'm not saying Gontova is panicking, but boy, I sure would not want to be in her position right now where you've done all this work to get a gap, and now that gap is shrinking, shrinking. So we're going to have a very exciting finale to this race for second and third. As we watch Godby, she's finally crested her final hill, more or less. One more little lump in the road. Doesn't really wrap up until about 900 meters to go. Watch Once Godby again, rider way in. One thing I will say about Godby, she's very uh, efficient with her riding. So uh, if she finds herself in a scenario like this where she's already got a race one, she'll still do her training. She'll kind of default back to a training plan and still try and kind of execute whatever she was hoping was going to happen that day. So. Uh, no surprise to see her staying in the yellow zone here on the way up, right around five watts per kilo as she goes inside 1K to go. Yeah. No, it's just... Godby does what Godby does. And, you know, it's... Uh, we're we're just lucky to be able to watch these uh, beautiful performances go off. Oh. <laughs> Speaking of beautiful performances, Cameron, just about to get back in. Gontova having one of those dreams where you're running and you just can't make any progress. You're not going anywhere. And Claire Cameron is <laughs> haunting her from 22 meters back right now. Cameron is chasing her down like she knows what Gontova did last summer. <laughs> it's a horror show playing out right here in some living room where Gontova is currently holed up, sweating like crazy, fans blowing on her. And her worst nightmare is rolling up 20 meters away. Claire Cameron. You know that Cameron will be seeing the draftomatic graphics telling her, you know what, you're actually saving some watts already because you're kind of within the draft cone of Gontova. And these two riders are basically about to roll into the lower slopes of this final climb. So this is where it all gets decided. Cameron has made the catch, we're going to call it. And now it's basically all out hammer and Kongs. There's five kilometers to go. It's almost entirely uphill from here. Wait, and Cameron's... I saw Cameron uh, stop pedaling. I'm a little worried. Yeah, I think she was just taking the opportunity to uh, get a little bit of rest. I think she was completely gassed and uh, just wanted that <laughs> couple seconds of not having to pedal. I don't blame her. Bravo, Claire Cameron chasing down the gap up to Gontova. We'll keep an eye on them. Meanwhile, Jackie Godby on the way into the finish, going four for four here in the virtual BC Cup as she does it again to pick up the final stop of the virtual BC Cup presented by Kabotics here at the Mount Sequoia Road Race. Of course, that she's already won a stage of the Echelon Racing League on, and now she can add a stage of the virtual BC Cup or a stop of the virtual BC Cup, I should say. Not quite to stage race scoring yet. Meanwhile, the battle of the day here in my book, Cameron and Gontova sorting out second and third. Yeah, this is going to be beautiful. So both of these riders, I'm certain that Cameron understands this, and I know that Gontova, as inexperienced as she is, will understand the race situation completely. They're about to enter into a climb that starts out gentle and then gets worse. All they've got to do is ride four kilometers and it's basically going to be a watts per kilo effort, a sort of a what uh, what some what some um, bike racing nerds would recognize as a VAM effort, uh, virtual altitude something or other. It's a good way of distinguishing uh, quality of riders, especially when you care about things like Grand Tour performances. And so we saw Cameron never lose her cool, even when she had a pretty big gap developed between her and Gontova. We saw her just close that gap. And now Cameron has to do only one more thing to close out this race, which is she has to be a little bit stronger than Nadia Gontova for the rest of this climb. And the challenge is we know that Gontova prosecuted her previous attack on a climb. So she's got climbing legs and she's not afraid to use them. And Cameron understands that as well. So all Cameron has to do is basically open up the old suitcase of courage, dig in there, rummage around, find out how many matches she can burn, 
and see if she can get to the finish ahead of Gontova before literally or metaphorically exploding. As we take a, as we wait to see how that race turns out, we can see that Fiona Magendi ribs herself is uh, soloing in fourth place. So we will we will follow up with her, but she's kind of managed to do the separation from Holly Larson that she wanted to. And we take a peek back at the Cat One men's race, the pro men's, and once again it is us born and bird at the front. This is not a repeat from previous weeks. This is just what these two do. And they are being chased down by the giant Kirsten Ivani and the wee Campbell Parrish. Uh, those two are riding one and two, and they're about 750 meters behind. <laughs> Look at Cameron and Gontova, bottom left. <laughs> oh, my goodness. Are Red they going at it? Oh, passes. There goes yeah, and then she lets up. What they're doing now is uh, the churn that Gontova was talking about <laughs> in her interview, where uh, you kind of overcompensate when you see an attack. That's exactly what that was. But there were like four of them where Cameron and Gatova went from red to zero to red to zero to red to zero. I think they're calming down a little bit now. But uh, see Gantova just trying to lift the tempo there a little bit, but smoothing it out a little this time through. Yeah. And they're just, they're feeling each other out, seeing if there's any weakness because part of it is that neither one of them wants to go too early, um, maybe fire their their best shot before they get to the steepest climbs and find that they've given the other rider a chance to play catch up. I, I think Gontova is probably very acutely sensitive to that because she just fired a very, very powerful shot and uh, got a very substantial looking gap over Cameron and then saw Cameron with incredible patience ride back to her over the course of some, you know, over so many tens of kilometers and just doing it cool as a cube member. You just don't see that kind of comeback in these races, right? It's the class of thing is you get 150, 200 meters down the road when you're one-on-one -on -one with a rider and that's enough to break their will. And Cameron was just never gone. She just came back. And so now Gantova and Cameron have, have found the nature and, and, and the realm of each other's spirits. And now it's just pure final rounds of the boxing match as it were <laughs> Here goes and Kontova. here's Kontova Kontova attacks and Cameron watch Cameron encounters. go over the top of her here look at that effort level oh Ooh. she's nice job she's content to just ride to the wheel and then away Ooh. but Guntova's digging now you're just seeing all of uh, this in numbers right yeah, I mean, they're hurting right now. When you see numbers vary this widely, they are like on the last legs of their energy <laughs> reserves at this point. To get this trainer into the red zone right now, you are uh, approaching tunnel vision at this point. They're, you'll start seeing spots here pretty soon. Uh, the riding that they're doing right now is like just textbook, uh, borderline bonk riding for both of them. So uh, this is going to be a really interesting ending here. Gontova now yeah. shoveling more coal into the engine. <laughs> you can just, oh, this is glorious. I mean, it's nothing we can add here, right? There 2.2K to go. The hills are going to wrap up at about the 900 meter mark to go. So they'll go through... They're going to hit the Fiam Rouge, and that's just before the climb ends. And they're going to get the steepest parts of it coming up in the next kilometer, give or take. And they're just banging at hammer and tongs. We're looking at Gontova's heart rate in the upper left, and it's 186 beats per minute. Brutal. Just brutal. She's she's fully redlined. Like that's, and it's not going up or down right now. She's just at 186, 187 beats per minute. She's just all out for this whole effort. You know, this nothing else even matters. Uh, this is the part of boxing match where they are both just barely standing, wobbling, <laughs> throwing wayward loose punches at each other while they this both struggle to maintain confidence in the ninth round. <laughs> That's uh, pretty much where Cameron and Kontova are here, and any either one of them could hit the deck at any time. All right, you, you, couldn't, you can't write a, a little bit, but... Yeah, I mean, this is like watching two prize fighters that have gone the distance of a nine-round boxing match, and uh, now it's going to come down to this last <laughs> climb up to the finish at 1.6K. 
Here we go. Sound the bell for the final round of Cameron versus Gontova. So they've got 700 meters more climbing. That's the number that you want to keep an eye on. They're at 1.6 to go. And basically the road flattens out at 900. And I don't know if they, if these two riders are aware of that parkour, but that's going to be the defining factor. And they're just, they're not giving an inch. Both of them are right there. I don't know who I'd pick in a sprint, but Cameron at least has, knows her way around a sprint. Again, another one of these riders with lots and lots of track experience, whereas we know Gontova cops to being fairly new to bike racing altogether. So... What we have to see is whether Cameron can manage her efforts such that she can be, she can draw even with Gontova at the top of this hill. And I think if she can, and it looks like she can, she's, she's matched everything Gontova's got so far. And there's only about 500 meters of climbing left. I gotta be honest, for the effort that they're doing here, I don't know that you're gonna have much left in the tank to execute any sort of sprinting prowess in this scenario. I think this is sort of a survival situation for Cameron and Gontova. I, I suspect, just looking at the numbers and the way that they're racing against each other, how often they're going into the red zone, I don't suspect that uh, there's going to be a whole lot of thinking going on at the finish. The, the oxygen in these two bodies is all spoken for, and it's not going to the brain right now. This is just madness. We haven't seen a finish like this. This sort of hammer and tongs attacking and they're still even with each other nobody's managed to break away on this climb you know cameron's making a little effort and she's got all of 10 meters and guntova is redlining and catching her again oh, this is magic folks i understand i hope you understand what you're watching and how beautiful this is it's just a perfect attacking race and every one of those little red lines represents one of these two riders just blowing themselves up on their trainer these two riders when they're done this race are both gonna fall off their trainer onto their onto their floors and not move for 10 minutes one kilometer to go a hundred meters remaining in the climb so once it flattens out there's going to be basically the world's most awful sprint finish and i mean awful for them not awful for us we're gonna love it uh just fantastic to see I mean, all bike racing is suffering, and this is the most suffering we've seen all day in terms of just these riders can't let up because it's like the metaphorical fight with a gorilla. You aren't done when you're tired. You're done when the gorilla is tired. And right now, well, each after, of these riders is the end. <laughs> after two hours and ten minutes of racing here, locked together in the red zone, I don't know how uh, fast this sprint is going to be. It might be like watching King Kong and Godzilla fighting here <laughs> underwater in slow motion. 700 meters to go. We saw Gontova do a little dig. She's come up on terms with Cameron. They're riding side by side. So I think what's going to happen here is we're going to see, well, it looks like Gontova's doing a bit of a dig. Maybe she's decided to try and get separation. Perhaps a little early, oh, Nadia. Now. They are letting up here. You saw both of them go into the blue zone there where they were kind of looking at each other. It's a standoff. Who's going to be the first one to draw here at 500 meters to go? Gontova into the red zone, but right back to green quickly. Just defending position here on the front. This will just come down to a two-up sprint. No one's going to try and get away here. I don't think they're going to try and launch an attack. I think they just watch each other until like 150 meters to go, and then you see them both rocket think, into the red zone here. I think Cameron's going to go basically now. She's a she's a tracky at heart, and she's very used to this idea of going with about 200 meters to go. There you go. It's a bit of a long drag to the finish. There's this little secret slope here. Gontova holding the wheel, though. Oh. Just six meters back, but Cameron with a nice surge at 50 meters to go. That's going to be enough to zip up the win here in the virtual BC Cup presented by Kabotics. Claire Cameron takes silver in an awesome battle with Gontova Full. today. What a race in the pro women's field. Full value from these two riders. There were no losers in that finish. That was monster racing it was beautiful to watch and uh we'll give a we'll give a salute uh holly larson's gonna come in i think or sorry um uh 
Not Harley. Ribs, Ribs Magendi is going to come in for fourth in a little while, but we'll watch that later. Meanwhile, Usborn and Bird are activating their own race. Looks like Usborn has achieved slight gap on Bruce Bird as they go up one of these later climbs in the relatively flat part of this road race. And Bird we can see Campbell Perry. little gap open up, though. He's good at uh, yeah. recovering from those gaps, as we've talked about. So when you see uh, Matt Usborn open up, let's say, 20, 30 meters over Bruce Bird, it doesn't mean as much than uh, it would with a lot of other riders because Bird can make up a gap like that pretty easily, either on a, a flat or a descent. So uh, he's got some room to work with here. He's, uh, he's like a seasoned Bitcoin trader. He's seen this go up and down. He doesn't panic. <laughs> He knows it's coming back. Yes, indeed. And meanwhile, behind them, as they continue to prosecute their race, we've got uh, the giant Karsten Avani. But we're taking a peek back at the uh, at the uh, elite women's race because uh, Ribs Magendi, Fiona Magendi, is only uh, 1.1 kilometers from the finish. So this will be the fourth place result for her. Um, she's another. She races virtually for the Pickle Juice Racing Team, and. Uh, and she's uh, done lots of other sports in her time, but uh, I think at this point she'll be just glad to see that red, f that red flag, which represents one kilometer to the finish and also represents the worst of the climbing being almost over. Uh, we saw it in that previous finish, which is the course flattens out in about uh, at about the 900 meter mark. Although there is a bit of a mini ramp as you do those last two or 300 meters. And she's ridden a long, long day in the saddle, most of it with Holly Larson before she finally pulled the classic bike racer move of stabbing Holly in the back and leaving her for dead. I mean, it wasn't a very big gap. It still amounts to about 500 meters after all of this racing, but it was enough to secure fourth place for Fiona Magendi over Holly Larson, who will cruise home to fifth. And as we take a quick peek at the elite men, it appears that Karsten Havani has gapped um, Campbell Parrish, but we're looking at Osborne and Bird at the front. So Bird is clawing his way back onto Osborne's wheel. He's about 25 meters behind and closing, I would say. They made a great call selecting this course. This was, uh, I think, the perfect course to determine our winner on the last stop of the Virtual BC Cup. Long, yes, but uh, it made for interesting racing in uh, all of our races today. I was a little worried that the length would sort of mellow things out too much for the riders, but uh, this has been the best racing of the series, I think. It has. I would say that in terms of the great length of this race, it's the commentators who were hardest hit, uh, Brad. That's right. That's right. <laughs> I mean, never, forget the, uh, <laughs> never forget the commentators. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. <laughs> we... We also serve who heckle, Brad. That is our motto. Bruce Bird and Usborn are back together again. Karsten Ivani, the giant among men, is uh, 1.8 kilometers in arrears. He's got a lot of work to catch up to them, but he has more or less left the others for dead. We're looking at uh, Fiona Magendi's finish here because she's on the final 150 meters. So she will get her honorable parade home. A well-earned fourth place. No sin or shame in this strong strong group with collecting that position um so some good riding by ribs and chapeau to her uh, but she'll be ready to step off the trainer now and in a moment we're going to see holly larson complete the race she's got fifth place but uh again she's ridden a great race all day she was right there with Fiona Magendi for most of the event and Fiona just put in a good sharply calculated attack and managed to get away from Larson uh in the second half of the race yeah Larson so hung Larson. in there that's a tough day and uh, it's a tough course to hold on to as well but yeah. uh, she'll hold on to a fifth place finish today adding another velocity She's vixen jersey to the podium She's going to be almost two hours, 20 minutes on her trainer when she's done this race today. Uh, you know, all these riders today, I think, I think the most important, uh, I think the most important uh, sponsor and equipment relationship that they've got is their chamois cream because uh, it got to work out today for sure. And uh, Larson gets going two hours, 18 minutes on the clock, 460 meters to go. 
she at about the 200 meter mark is going to see a little tiny ramp so this is still a fairly annoying final k but she represented the velocity vixens very well today she rode a good hard race she um, put some of her competition in the shade you know there was a, there was riders who dropped out uh because Hart larson just rode away from them so well-earned fifth place you know good job and congratulations to Holly Larson as she comes through. She's got 150 meters to go. Last little lumpy climb. Bravo, Holly. Well done. <laughs> yeah, it was, a, it was an entertaining... Go ahead. Oh, it's an entertaining women's race all around. We saw good events up, up and down the, the, uh, the results. Yeah, this course, uh, a good one today. Uh, our thanks to Joe Martin Stage Race for loaning one of their courses today. Again, this is uh, called the Mount Sequoia Road Race Stage, and they're going to be doing this one in person this summer. They are on for uh, their in-real-life dates over there in Fayetteville. So uh, these riders, uh, if they want, will have the opportunity to race this one in real life all right down to uh, our final race of the day pro men the last ones left out on course here in the virtual bc cup this is the last of four stops on uh, our series presented by kabotics here we've been uh, racing on some of rgt's real roads which are uh, uh, courses based on uh, real life locations that also have the graphics built around them. The course that they're racing on right now is uh, just the GPX file of that uh, real life course in Arkansas that's laid into one of these regenerating worlds. Uh, you see the sort of generic um, scenery on the side, if you will. This is uh, actually pretty close to what a part of the course of the Mount Sequoia Road Race looks like. They go through this deciduous forest section and uh, I guess the scenery is uh, pretty pretty similar here at this part. That part only goes for maybe 20 miles of the uh, roughly 75 mile course. Might even be more than that in real life but uh, there is a section that looks very similar to this. Uh, riders that want to continue racing on RGT, there is uh, another race coming up on May 23rd. The uh, Indiana University Student Foundation is running a virtual little 500. I'm not sure if you've ever seen uh, the movie oh. Breaking Away. It's based on the little 500 at Indiana University where typically the fraternities have their battle on Schwinn single speeds on the dirt track while they're not, uh, not able to do that in real life. So they're taking it to RGT this year and anyone can race. They're opening it up to the public for a, a, a men's and women's race. Uh, scheduled for May 23rd. You can sign up on the Echelon Racing League website and uh, join them as well three days later on Wednesday, May 26th uh, for the virtual race with the collegiate participants. It's going to be a lot of fun. This is, uh, this is a cool one. I love the little 500. It's such a, a classic but unique bike race that uh, they have over at IU and of course, if anyone's seen Breaking Away, I think that adds a special element to it. So pretty cool to see that uh, they're going to be taking that one virtual. Now, they're not doing the little 500 course. It's going to be uh, a road race on uh, the May 23rd race. So uh, I don't think they're going to be building the IU Stadium to go in circles. <laughs> but uh, that's Oh, that's fantastic. If uh, if anybody out there isn't familiar with the Little 500, you definitely owe it to yourself to watch Breaking Away. It's a, it's a classic bike racing movie, but it's also the event that it covers in that race is a real race, and it's just ridiculous. Uh, you know, they... For those of you who don't know, the actual event happens on a, on a cinder track, like a cinder running track, and they use single speed, not fixed gear bicycles, I believe. And the participants are basically all students at the race. And it's just, it's got this, it's this crazy one-off event that doesn't exist in any form like that anywhere else in the world that the students at Indiana University just go nuts for. And I just love the whole thing. I've, I've been able to see coverage of some of the actual races as well. It's pretty fun to watch. So, uh. 
think I might have to sign up for that one, Brad. Yeah. Yeah, your but, chance uh, to compete without, without having to go to <laughs> IU or join one of the uh, one of the fraternities, or I guess join one of the teams because that was the point of the cutters, right? They're not part <laughs> of the system, man. <laughs> do you have a yeah, uh, do you have a favorite that. breaking away line? We have fourteen point K before these guys finish, so uh, why not do some breaking away lines or trivia? Uh, do you have a, a favorite refund? Line refund. <laughs> Mine comes from the same character. He's in there shaving. Well, that's normal for boys of his age. His damn legs. <laughs> yeah, the, the the father character in that uh, movie does get an awful lot of the truly great lines. It's uh, <laughs> folks, rather than yeah, we commend it to you. It's a classic of the genre. It's even a. It's actually even a good movie if you don't like bike racing. It's just a lot of fun. Um, it is. And the there's bike a, racing there's scenes. There's a love are... story. There's a triumph <laughs> story. There's a, there's some for everyone. Friendship. <laughs> there's a there's a used car deal gone wrong. That's what I remember. <laughs> yeah. It's, really, it's got it all. <laughs> no, it's a yeah. It's a it's fantastic fun and yeah. It's a great event and yeah. I kind of want to see what the virtual little five hundred looks like. But as, as we contemplate the wonders of the little 500, we see Matt Usborne trying to uh, make a little gap, and it's about 44 meters. And if there was any rider but Bruce Bird on the other end of that gap, we might call that decisive. But in this case, we know that Bruce will just let that gap form, remain calm, and then ride back to Matt whenever he decides to. So uh matt cannot feel safe or comfortable with that little gap forming he knows that you know once he gets over this hill that he's climbing right now uh bruce is just going to take whatever that distance is and methodically work it into his calculations and make sure that he's back with matt usborne before the race is over now i will say they are on uh, the the longest climb left until the finish so if Bird was going to crack at some point, it would be here. It would be on this climb. If Usborne was going to successfully get rid of Bird and tip that formula, tip the scale the other way to the point where Bird wouldn't be able to catch back on on the descent. And that's another thing to talk about is what the other side of the climb looks like. You can <laughs> see the elevation profile on the bottom of the screen. That matters for Bruce Bird, doesn't it, Ryan? Because uh, a lot of his methodology is based on making up that time on the other side so if it's a uh, too gradual on the way down that wouldn't be good for bruce bird he wants a really fast descent on the way to uh, catch up to matt osborne he sure does and i think he's going to get a descent that will be suited to him but this is absolutely the test that bruce has to manage this gap as he goes up the hill and then he has to close this gap before he goes down the hill and I think a, a, the the even bigger challenge for Bruce is I, I kind of trust that he has it in him to close this gap back if he just basically puts in the effort at this point. Um, the challenge is there's another climb before this race is over. And so I think that given his climbing skills and knowing what we know about both Bird and Usborne, that uh, Bird is not going to be very comfortable in how his race will turn out unless he can actually get away from Usborne before the bottom of that next climb. So lots to play for here. And we're not quite at the point of writing off uh, Karsten Avani or Aiden Oliphant or even perhaps Campbell Parish quite yet. There's still 13 kilometers to go. It'll be it touch and go for those last three riders to get in touch. But nonetheless, they're out there. Ivani is still established in third place, but Oliphant is hardly left for dead. Um, and Campbell Parish has just caught up with the Oliphant, so it's possible that uh, Aiden Oliphant, another fairly young rider, he's in his 20s, and uh, Campbell Parish can get together and maybe do some work and maybe catch up to Ivani for third place. As we go further down well, the remember, list, we're looking at... Mm -hmm. I was just going to say, Campbell Parish has to finish in the top five today because uh, AFM sacrificed his race to stop and take a picture with his name on the road so <laughs> he's he's got to do afm proud here in this scenario because he gave up a lot to get that picture that's right that's right campbell you've got to get fourth place for the honor of afm okay we need we need this to happen afm demands it 
But at the front of the race, we've got Osborne. He's established now a 200 meter gap over Bird. Uh, again, some of that is an artifact that Bird has just crested the hill, but nonetheless, that is Bruce Bird's work. And Bruce Bird's work has been, as they say, cut out for him. Make up two kilometers in 12, and not a flat 12 either. So we're gonna go down the hill. We're gonna go along the relatively, but not truly flat section. And then we're gonna go up another hill again. Yeah, so this needs to uh, start slowly coming back pretty soon because uh, they're gonna run out of descent here. It looks like it's gonna top out right around 270. It's been growing which is not what Bruce Bird wants to see. I don't think this is inflated because they are both well on to the descent. You can see up in the uh, top right corner, there's a sort of recent elevation profile and then the full elevation profile at the bottom of the screen. They've been on this descent long enough that I think this gap has equalized and uh, it looks like Bird is going to be trying to bring back Approaching 300 meters to Matt Osborne. I think this is different than the other times Bird has come off. Yes, indeed. That's that's a long gap, and there's a short bit of road ahead of him. I mean, we're talking about, as we said, making up 200 meters in 12 kilometers. Um, that's everything. And, I mean, we're just we're speculating to a degree, but Bruce Bird's natural terrain is this flat section of almost 10 kilometers, more like nine, I think, before we get to the bottom of the hill again, um, that he's going to experience right now. That nine kilometers is Bird's race. If he doesn't get on terms with Usborne, and realistically, if he doesn't get ahead of Usborne before that final climb, that's the race. We'll be able to call it. Usborne will ride up the finish. He'll take his well-earned victory, and Bird will have to settle for second and I don't get the impression that Bruce Bird is a guy who likes to settle for second from the way he races. But we will find out. Current gap is down to about 170 meters, so he's already put some pretty big bites into Osborne's lead. The question will be whether he can continue to make the number go down. That is his sole mission in life for the next 20 minutes or so. Just a man trying to make a number go below 150. <laughs> yeah, he got he to gotta get it to zero, and then he's got to get it out to about plus 150 in his favor, I think, right. before, uh, right. before the, uh, the bottom of the climb. Um, anything less than that, and he's got some real trouble. That's just, I think that's just the race composition. And these are two guys who have both, you know, had huge results in this event. Um, they've done, both done fantastic so far can't remember if Bruce has won one of these things. I know that Matt certainly has, but uh, of our of our four race series, but right. it's coming down to this, and I'm pretty sure both of these guys absolutely want to win, so there's no doubt about that. I'm just The number, if you're wondering, is down to about 150 meters, so it's still moving in the direction I think that uh, Bird needs it to move, but needs to keep moving yeah as it should they're doing a little bit more work than Usborne here as uh, Usborne's been averaging like four and a half bird was routinely hitting five like he is right now so bruce has been putting in the work or was putting in the work it looks like he's taking a little bit of a breather now and he's paying for it as the gap goes back up to 180 meters mm-hmm yeah, and I mean, both of these riders, they're strong, they know each other, and they know exactly what's at stake here. So this is just two riders managing their effort. And this is kind of one of the interesting things that you're going to see here, which is, uh, you know, heart rate is sitting at 140 beats per minute. You know, wattage is sort of hovering around the 400 watt mark for Bird. You know, he's putting out about five watts per kilogram. Both of these guys, because they're so well trained, will have a very good idea of what all of those numbers mean. The heart rate will be very meaningful to Bird in terms of, is this an effort that I can sustain for the next 20 minutes? Is this a power output that I can sustain for the next 20 minutes? Will I have enough to, you know, hold on and make any attacks or prosecute a sprint finish if necessary? 
And Usborne is asking the same thing. He knows what his heart rate is. He knows what his wattage output is. He knows what he can do. And there's a classic phrasing I once heard about how you manage a time trial effort, which is really what these guys are in right now. Uh, the answer to the question, can I sustain this performance for the entire rest of this race, should always be for the ideal effort, maybe. <laughs> it can't be no. These guys are too smart for that. They're both racing right on their aerobic thresholds. They're, they're in the maybe zone. 20 minutes is sort of, even after a hard race like this, it's sort of where they can flirt with their thresholds. And they both understand that, you know, if they do a little too much work here, they'll explode and either go sub aerobic threshold or just have nothing left in the sprint. And they also both understand if they go a little too easy, they won't finish out their race. Usborne will get caught or Bird won't catch Usborne. So they're just basically riding the time trial of their lives right now. And the number is 120 meters. So Bird continues to close that gap painfully slowly. Seven and a half kilometers left in this race. Well, as one of the great riders of the modern canon once wrote, get rich or die trying. That's what Bird and Usborne <laughs> are doing here. All in. It's a maybe performance today. I love that. What a great way to put it. Can I do it? Maybe. But if you ride <laughs> something that you know you can do, you're not going hard enough. And and these riders probably know each other well enough that they can even look at each other's watts and understand exactly how maybe their opponent is. So we're looking backwards from Matt towards Brad or Bruce, and you can see the number is now 100 meters. And Matt can see that number. He's even more acutely aware of it than we are. It's now 90 meters. It was 88 meters. It keeps going in the <sighs> wrong direction for Matt Osborne and in the right direction for Bruce Bird. And they're both gonna be very attentive to that. But the number that does favor Matt is the one that says 6.6 .6 kilometers to go, because no matter what they do, that number keeps going down. And when that number gets to zero, then Matt Osborne may have won the race, as long as the other number has not gotten to zero. So Matt needs the big number to go to zero before the little number gets to zero. And oh. that's pretty much the mathematics of this race. <laughs> Meanwhile, Bruce Bird needs the little number to get to zero before the big number does so that he has some hope here. And currently the little number is at 90 meters to go. And the big number is at 6.2 kilometers. So he's got enough time, but the question is whether he's got enough power. Well, I'm going to dig up the lifeless corpse of our joke from earlier and uh, say that Bruce Bird's dividends are starting to pay off here. I mean, <laughs> just slowly paying this off from 150 down to 75 in the last 6K that he's been holding here, but never panicking, unwavering diamond hands for Bruce Bird here, as it's now down to 60 meters. He trusted the plan here, and uh, I think he's gonna get Usborne. Remember how we saw Claire Cameron prosecute a very similar get rich slowly strategy in the uh, women's elite yes. race? Yes, yeah, exactly. so we're, we're, we're seeing something remarkably similar. Cameron made her catch after getting gapped by Gontova a lot earlier in the event, but Bruce doesn't have to catch Matt Osborne any sooner than that. He just has to be confident that he can execute on a race strategy once he does make that catch. The number's 50 meters now. It's just, it's gloriously agonizing. So many bike racers, if they got the number down to 50 meters, they would just... They would put in that little dig, burn a match just to get back onto the wheel. Bird is just being, as far as I can see, completely confident of his ability to make this catch. He's just going to make it at whatever time he chooses and with as little effort as possible. I it's love just, it. He's got, he, he's got the, he's got the patience of a value investor is what he has. <laughs> Well, Bird is, uh, let's see, at 4.8K to go. I'd say he's about 2K away from making his tax leverage withdrawal that he's been waiting <laughs> for from, uh, from this account here. Because uh, like you said, there's no rush 
to make the catch on Usborne. I, I guess he would want some of the drafting of being able to sit in here, but at this point, he's been soloing for the last 15 minutes. I mean, he's comfortable. He can just sit in his zone, do his thing, just slowly but surely try to reel Usborne in under 40 meters now as he gets into the high 30s. <laughs> And he, as he crosses the 40 meter threshold, you can see that now he's getting the draftometer up here in the upper left corner of his screen. And just as we're seeing it, he's also seeing it. And that's telling him that he's any moment now, he's gonna start getting measurable wattage savings from the RGT system. Uh, he'll be in the draft, he'll start being paid off free watts, basically, that's what drafting is. And as the number goes down, he's at 30 meters. So you're going to see that that's the last 30 meters. The catch will be a little easier, or at least Matt's going to have to do even more watts at this point if he wants to hold Bird off. So the big number is at 3.9 kilometers. The little number is under 30 meters. Everything to play for. The, the only challenge here is I don't... Bruce Bird will be like my dog Pinter, because... <laughs> Pinter likes to chase cars, but I often wonder, once he catches it, what's he going to do? And <laughs> Bird has the same problem, which is he can catch Matt Osborne, but can he beat him in the remaining bit of this course? So we're at 3.6k to go. We're going to hit the gentle slopes right now. The last two kilometers turns into a real hard climb. Bird's been dropped by Osborne already on the climbs. I'm not sure that Bird is a natural sprinter either, so... Bird's biggest challenge now is not only to find a way to catch Osborne, he's got to find a way to win this race. Because the, the point wasn't to get on even terms and make it a good finish. Bird's here to win. Yeah. I think Bird sits on here. I think the play is uh, just sit on Osborne as long as you can. You count on Matt having lost his snap in uh, this epic battle that's been unfolding for the last 20 kilometers between these two. And uh, I think Bruce Bird just has to trust his legs here and hang on to Osborne as long as he can. And then if he thinks he got it, Bruce Bird might even be able to attack at like uh, seven, 800 meters out. I think that would be the sweet spot for Bruce. And this might even be enough time. Remember, I don't think Bruce Bird is like super gassed right now because he was very methodical about the way that he came back to Osborne. So I think he uh, was looking ahead and he made sure that he wasn't red zoned when he got here. He made sure that it was, you know, a slow burn so that when he got there, he was comfortable, calm, still had something left in the tank. So I actually think Bruce Bird is in a really good situation. Initially, my thought was like, you know, as soon as you get into a breakaway, you're gassed, right? And going again is the last thing you want to do. But I think Bruce Bird is smarter than me. And he was a couple <laughs> steps ahead of that. You, you might be right here. I'm, I'm interested because Osborne has been content to let Bird sit on his wheel ever since they made the catch. Now, they're not doing no pace, but on the other hand, well, they, they've just hit the slope, so drafting is going to be, shall we say, greatly attenuated. And it might be that Matt figures, bring Bird to the hill, don't bring Bird to the hill. Point being, all he has to do now is ride two kilometers up a hill better than Bruce Bird can. And I think that's a challenge that Matt Osborne might be happy to embrace. Uh, the problem is for him whether or not Bruce, who's attacking as we speak, can turn this into a time trial and we know Bruce Bird likes uh, likes to time trial we're just starting to watch the numbers so now the numbers are going to like there's Bruce's little attack digs to over 7 watts per kilo seeing if he can bait Matt seeing if he can get away and it looks like Bird's going for a dig this looks like it's a serious attack now but Osborne right with him. They're still in this rolling approach to the slope. They're hitting another little hill. I think this is where the climbing begins in earnest. We're on a 6% grade. It might flatten out a little bit up ahead, but they're basically into the meat of the climb from now at the 2K mark until they get to 900 meters to go. And then it flattens out. And then at about 250 meters to go, there's another little tiny ramp, not quite as substantial as this one. So all we got to do now is watch the bike race.
Wow, matching each other, stroke for stroke. The other thing uh, to watch for here is heart rate. That's, uh, I, I guess, an underappreciated number that we probably haven't talked about enough. We talked about the power zones for each rider and the, how uh, they all kind of know their zone. Same goes for heart rate. I mean, these riders definitely know where their maximum heart rate is, and they will uh, try and approach that as delicately as possible as Usborne goes on the attack here on the front, both going into the red zone. Now, they can't hold the red zone for the last 1.6K here. They're going to have to let up at some point. So there's Usborne dropping back down into orange. But I'm also going to be watching his heart rate, which uh, is pretty steady at uh, the low 150s here. I didn't really see it spike on that attack. So, again, it's different for each rider. I don't know what Matt Usborne's high-end heart rate is. So uh, I can't tell you where 150 what is now 157 uh this for bruce bird sorry we've switched over uh, running a little higher heart rate but again that really just depends on the individual rider and uh, it doesn't really associate with anything else uh, bigger riders smaller riders uh climber sprinter they don't really have a profile i guess for uh or sort of where your heart rate is in the zone, I guess is what I'm saying here. So uh, different for each rider, but uh, relatively for Usborne, we're sitting at mid 150s now, which I think is still pretty comfortable for him, if I had to guess. Well, I, I've been watching, I was peeping his heart rate earlier in the race, and it looks to me like Usborne, when he's riding within himself, was sort of parked around 148, 147 beats per minute. So I'm going to go out on a limb and say that anything above 150 is a deadly serious effort for Usborne. And you're quite right, Bird has a little bit of a higher heart rate, so his 157 here is probably more like 5 or 10 beats lower for Usborne in terms of marking relative effort. And as we talk about this, Usborne is put a little gap in. He's got 30 meters away. We know he's digging deep. We can see his heart rate. We can see his watts per kilo. He's hit the Fiam Rouge, and he's only got about 200 meters of hard climbing left. And But he's got a 20-meter gap. Can Bruce close that gap now? The race flattens out. It has a little bit of a kick right at the end, but they've got about 700 meters of, well, I don't want to say easy, but Usborne has just hit basically the flattening out section. He got over that little 13-kilometer wall. I think he might have enough gap. 50 meters over Bird. Bird not notoriously a great sprinter. Uh, I think that's probably all that Matt needed to do here. Uh, there's one more little climb to make life difficult. Yeah, Usborne really used that uh, kick up right at 1K to go. Used it to his advantage very well. The other thing I want you to look at is the cadence between these two riders. Up in the upper left, uh, Bird running a much lower cadence than Matt Usborne, which probably means a harder gear to pedal. He's just, uh, he likes the lower cadence, harder gear setup. It's a uh, really personal preference. See how Usborne's up in the like 90s, 100s on his cadence, whereas uh, Bruce Bird is down around 70 or 80 as his average. So uh, he's a big power guy, which means he likes to push that big gear on the way up the hill probably a lot of standing you'll see riders like that uh you know try and leverage their their legs over their anaerobic ability or as matt Usborne, you see pushing 110 rotations here at 100 meters to go that's going to be enough though to hold off bruce bird and matt Usborne will take stop number four on the virtual bc cup presented by kabotics for the above and beyond cancer team after a brutal battle with Bruce Bird from draft racing all day today. Bird going to end the day at uh, right around 10 seconds down on the line. And then well behind this duo of two will be the final battle for the third spot on the podium with Giants best ever field marketing representative. <laughs> Oh, yes, sitting indeed. in third now. It's Karsten Ivani, the giant among men. He's uh, He's got about a 1.3 kilometer gap to his uh, one-time breakaway companion, Campbell Parrish. You know, he, he showed no mercy to the young man. He dropped him for dead when he decided he was done. And that's exactly what the race situation is now. So Karsten Ivani will roll it home. He's got two kilometers left. But uh, Parrish cannot be quite as uh, complacent because 
Campbell Parish has Aiden Oliphant still only 40 meters behind him. So neither of these riders has dropped the other. 3.2 kilometers to go. Um, Parrish, I think, has a pretty good set of climbing legs on him, but he's also not a small rider. So uh, this is going to be a pretty telling final climb for him. He's at the 3.1 kilometer mark. We know the climbing really kicks in at about 2K to go. So I think what we're going to see is Karsten and Vanny have a relatively easy parade, whereas Parrish and Oliphant are going to be fighting this one out to the... And indeed, we can see Parrish is continuing to move it along. Ivani may be taking it fairly easy, but he's got enough distance already that he doesn't have to go any harder than that. Uh, I think he's riding well within himself at this point. He's not taking it easy. He knows there's only 1.6k to go. A mile in the old units, but uh, away he goes. Karsten is just finishing out the work. But Campbell Parrish has to work hard because he's his map gap is still only 150 meters. That's better than it was, so he's got to be happy about that. He's managed to put a little bit of distance into into Oliphant before he gets to the bottom of the seal. But let's see what he can do. Yeah, I think uh, we saw Bruce Bird prove that 150 meters is nothing with 2.5k <laughs> to go. You can make that That's up over 2.4k easy. Yeah, absolutely. And, uh, you know, Aiden Oliphant, I don't know if he's got a sprint or not, but uh, if I was Campbell Parrish, I do not think I would want to uh, bring any riders with me to the finish line at this point. Uh, getting fourth place is hard enough without having a friend to come along. And meanwhile, Oliphant has his own problems, which is that <laughs> Cooper has managed to catch up after being away from this pair all wow. day. John Cooper has wow. somehow managed to gap out Jude, uh, Jude Sands and is catching Oliphant. In fact, I'm going to call it right now, at this rate of closure, he is going to pass Oliphant. So in not a very large amount of time, Campbell Parrish may have to be thinking about Cooper, not Oliphant. Meanwhile, we look at Sands, credible seventh place against uh, strong opposition. Uh, the fact that there's only eight riders left doesn't tell the whole story. I think it was a group of 12 or so began this race and we had AFM drop out due to, uh, due to some difficulty or another. And I think the other riders were just kind of beat to death. They had a long and fast first half of the race and eventually it took its toll, its toll on all but these eight riders. So we look back at Ivani, he's just about to hit the Fiam Rouge, the glorious one kilometer to go, red flag. As we said, the, the road flattens out at about 900 meters to go, which you'll be, I'm sure, very relieved to see. And once that does indeed happen, he can be pretty comfortable. He's still got 640 meters um, gap between himself and Parrish, so no problems for Ivani except for making it to the end here. Yeah, the, uh, the Parrish-Cooper battle is going to be the exciting one at the line. I feel like a, a boxing promoter. You know, sometimes <laughs> you're just you're just lining these two up battles up, one after another. But that's kind of how it works in uh, in virtual racing a lot of times, especially on RGT, on these, these real roads courses. You see the separation and then uh, the, the natural dynamics of racing. We'll see groups of just two or three linking up. So... Get a good bang for your buck in virtual racing. <laughs> indeed, indeed, yeah. And certainly head-to-head -head matchups have been the order of the day today. Uh, as we're watching Campbell Parrish, he's still got 140 meters gap between himself and uh, Cooper, but I would not call that safe because it is. he's got 1.4K to go, and there's about 500 meters of pretty hard climbing between him and the false flat at the top. But we're watching here as Karsten Avani is going to Roll it home. He's at 450 meters to go. So just that one little ramp at 200 meters stands in his way. He's got a plenty of gap. He's got an easy cruise to victory here. Well, not victory to third place, but uh, it's probably going to seem like a small victory after the long, long ride home for him. And his little virtual avatar sits up a bit, hits that last wall at the 200 meter mark 
And he's got a relatively easy, slightly climbing finish here. And once again, our congratulations to the giant Karsten of Annie. He loves his sponsor so much, he changed his name, if only virtually. And he will be third place on today's long, long 72 kilometer Joe Martin stage race. And now watch. Parrish. Gonna go inside, 1K to go. Gap to Cooper, back up. Cooper had gotten close within uh, like 150 meters, but it's back up to 270 now. So Campbell Parrish doing a nice job on this last little climb of the day. And then remember this Cooper and Oliphant battle. Cooper fighting almost the exact same battle on two different fronts uh, in <laughs> front of him and behind him to Parrish and Oliphant on his six. And I'm yeah, sure that Cooper would have been very happy to catch Campbell Parrish, but he's got to feel like there's a small victory here and that he was riding with Jude Sands for so long while Oliphant and Parrish were together, and now he's caught Oliphant at the end to get fifth place, the final spot on the extended mountain bike podium. Um, but definitely better than I would have predicted given where he was at the halfway point in this race when I thought that he and Sands were way too far behind to have any chance of catching either Oliphant or um, or Parrish. And so Oliphant's had a rough rough finish to this long race, but still putting in a credible result. So no sin or shame there. You know, it's, it's a hard race. He's going to, I think by the time he's done, it will clock near enough two hours. We're watching as Campbell Parrish is coming into his last 325 meters. He's a great kid. I've known him since he was the juniorest of juniors. Him and his family are, are great contributors to the sport too. His, his, I don't know if he'll be embarrassed by this, but his mom was a was a great force in um, in uh, safety at management at our bike races for many years within the Escape Velocity oh. Club. So, chapeau to a, a family that has given back. And now Campbell Parrish will take fourth place. Well earned, hard fought, and he's got a great future ahead of him. Only 17 years old, so nicely done. And he can Robert finally park Campbell. it and step off the trainer. See John Cooper in behind him, and then Alexander Oliphant in for sixth place. So Cooper going to do triple X proud, put another triple X rider on the podium after his fiance Jackie Godby took a win <laughs> in the pro women's race. Cooper going to take fifth place in our pro men's field to wrap up our wide angle mountain bike podium. Not I bad, not bad at all. And chapeau yeah. to John Cooper. But behind him, we've got a bit of a battle developing because, uh, you know, after saying that Sands and Oliphant had locked up positions, I feel like Oliphant has, in fact, flagged worse than he expected. He's uh, now fallen behind Sands as well. So Sands is going to sneak Whoa. his way into sixth place because it doesn't look like he's... Uh, I don't think Oliphant is coming back from that one. No. Uh, I think is, uh... Oliphant just sort of cracked on those final on those final miles on the road. And I mean, he had a good hard ride all day, but he was riding up there with uh, he was riding up there with fourth place rider Campbell Parrish for a lot of the day, and now he is very much not paying for that now. As uh, we watch that gap continue to grow, so Sand's going to take sixth. Oliphant will hold on for seventh, no problem. And then uh, I think Weber going to be good for eighth. Man, last kilometer here for Sands made a difference. Nice job. Way <laughs> to finish strong. Way to bide your time out there, right? Oliphant had such a great ride all day. And uh, we didn't talk about Sands a whole lot out there today, but he's going to ride his way into sixth place. Nice job. Yeah, he's got to be... He's got to be pretty satisfied with how that last half of the race came to him um and i guess it just shows you know don't give up you know don't despair the race will come to you and so good job on a surprise sixth place by jude sands the irishman and oliphant will hold on i mean 
He said he, he, he's lost some places here, but it just it represents the fact that it's been a hard ride all day. And, yeah. you know, the only way that he gets to this position is because he's just ridden his heart and soul out until he didn't have anything left in the tank. So way to go to uh, Aiden Oliphant for her leaving it all on the road. And we do mean everything. Because he's got to have had nothing left in the tank. But he does get to finish, and in less than two hours, so good job and we've got one more rider out on the course we've got uh that's uh, ashley weber still out uh the full gas rider we haven't talked about him much but he's kept his head about him and he's gonna roll it home he'll be the final classified racer 1.6 kilometers left just this unpleasant 15 percent grade stands between him and the finish line Right on our fourth and final stop of the virtual PC Cup presented by Kabotics here. It's been a lot of fun watching these riders progress on RGT, even over uh, the four stops of the racing that we've had here in the virtual BC Cup. I feel like I've uh, come to know a lot of these BC based riders really well. So uh, I hope to see them out on the road in real life. As it sounds like uh, things slowly getting better, and uh, we are hoping to be back to some in real life racing soon i know for almost all of these riders that's got to be the goal to get back to it but uh, it's been fun having the virtual racing to fill the gap in the meantime and uh, i hope these riders have enjoyed the uh, the silver lining of the last year or so to uh, to get in some virtual racing here and stay connected i know uh, you were you're see seeing a lot of familiar names on these start lists over the last uh, what has been six weeks of racing in the virtual bc cup so a nice way to stay connected to our cycling family yeah for sure brad it's uh it's been gratifying both for i think the sport as a whole in the province of british columbia and to me personally i mean i i have a lot of love for for bike racing and putting on these events and i can tell all these riders that uh you know it seems like these these days not a day goes by when there isn't uh, some communique going back and forth between the powers that be about you know how can we go racing when can we go racing we're we're just excited you know Plans are being made. We know that, as you say, things are going to get better, and they're going to get better pretty soon. Like we, as soon as we can go racing safely again, we will be going racing. And I've been very excited to be part of plans that aren't quite ready to be announced, but certainly we are hopeful at this point that if there's an opportunity in July or August, I think those are the kind of dates where we might be able to look forward to first race of the season here in bc and uh certainly folks watch the signs we will keep you posted um everybody involved in bike racing is very eager to get the high sign that we can finally fire things off and start doing some bike racing again and um, i'm hopeful that we'll have a little bit of a road season and a lot of a cyclocross season and of course my personal favorite a track season because it's a winter sport for us here in in vancouver because we have a lovely little 200 meter indoor velodrome it's a it's a nasty terrible bowl with plywood on the boards instead of hardwood up in the upper half but we love it and it's created some great bike racers some some olympic medal winning bike racers have raced and trained there and uh, we're very hopeful that by the time it gets around to uh, track season that we'll have something resembling normal bike racing again return to the province all right well fingers crossed for everyone if uh we don't see you on the uh, rgt platform we hope to see you in real life i know you guys are going to keep the website updated cyclingbc.net uh, as uh, as things get back to it and if you're interested in taking up racing cyclingbc.net has uh, some great resources to kind of get you directed to where you need to go to uh, to get back into it i know that's been a big part of this learning about a lot of the local racers but uh, hopefully also encouraging more people to participate so uh ryan i think we can wrap it up there as uh, our final rider of the four race bc cup series presented by kabotics wraps it up we're going to say a goodbye from the virtual world of rgt for ryan kuzno my name is brad soner along with zms live streams presenting the uh, live stream productions today uh, on behalf of cycling bc thanks for watching today and congratulations to all of our riders keep on riding keep training and we'll see you at the start line real soon <laughs>